Welcome everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome board members, foundation staff, and guests to the 479th meeting of the National Science Board. I will chair this meeting today and Ellen will join us tomorrow. This meeting is now convened. This meeting is now convened at 10:30 a.m. Eastern on May 5th, 2022. I like to remind everyone that this meeting is a hybrid meeting, meaning that some members and guests will attend via Zoom and all open sessions are live streamed on the board's YouTube channel. Due to continued health and safety precautions, please listen up on this. The public can attend this meeting via the board's YouTube channel. We anticipate being able to open our meetings again to include in-person attendance by the public in future meetings. As of yesterday, members attending via Zoom are include Heather Wilson, Suresh Babu, Emilio Moran, Artie Bienstock, Alan Stern, and Roger Beachy, and Steve Leave. For those of us attending in person, a few of the precautions have been taken to make this meeting as safe and comfortable as possible, including adding space between seats at the board table, leaving room as open as possible for better ventilation, and limiting the number of people in the boardroom to only those who need to be there. And of course, anyone who wants to wear a mask should feel free to do so. For those members in person, please be sure you're logged into Zoom for today. You'll need to keep your laptop speaker, Zoom microphone, and Zoom video off. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're in the Zoom meeting, but you're hitting those two or lower left buttons off because you're there available for the chat. That's why we have this set up and during the meeting. Doing this will prevent feedback and will still allow you to access your Zoom features such as chat. Please also be sure to turn on your table microphone while you're speaking, because if you don't, as you can hear me now, to ensure that everybody in the room and on the Zoom can hear you. I'd ask that those of you joining virtually to keep your video on as much as possible and your audio off unless you're speaking. Please use the hand raise function if you'd like to speak. We'll have plenty of IT folks. Bruce and his team are great and, and they're here to help us if we're needed. So please raise your hand if you need assistance. Also, some more uh, housekeeping to take care of. I'd like to say how great it is to meet everybody in person again. And, and after more than two years, let's uh, come on. So um, I'm glad that you all, all are here. This is gonna be a productive meeting. And I'm not just talking about my colleagues here on the board, though it warms my heart to see some of you again and to meet some of you in person for the first time. I'm also talking about NSF staff, from the leadership team to the good folks in the meetings and events who help make this meeting happen every day. Let's give them a round of applause too. And finally, I'm talking about the board office team under the leadership of John Vasey. They have been incredible, particularly for these two years that we have had to go through. Let's give them a hand too. This still ongoing pandemic hasn't been easy on anybody, but under Pontius leadership, NSF has been delivering on the mission while adapting to change in circumstances. Ponch, on behalf of the board, thank you and your staff for preserving through what will become a moment in history. It is especially appropriate to recognize their resilience and your resilience and perseverance and dedication during the Public Service Recognition Week. I would also like to thank our chair, Ellen Ochoa, and executive officer to the National Science Board, John Basie, for guiding and supporting us through these last two rough years. The leadership has inspired us to find new ways to see it, to, that we can continue to fill our responsibilities regardless of the venue. And for John and Ellen, and Ellen, wherever you are, I hope you hear these applause. So let's go. I'm looking forward to a productive and energetic meeting. We do have a few members, like I said, who will be joining us via Zoom, Artie, Alan, Emilio, Heather, Suresh, Roger, and Steve. Just because we're back doesn't mean everything is the same. And of course, we all know that in our personal work experiences. And NSB will begin honing our skills at operating in a hybrid environment starting today. And probably, as many of you know, hybrid environments will probably be the way of the future and future meetings. Today's sessions are all open. We'll begin with the director's remarks, followed by a presentation spotlighting NSF-funded research and its impact by assistant directors from Alice Needler, Sylvia Butterfield, and Erin Giancandini. 
After that, I'll uh, share the chair's activity since our February meeting, then move into the NSB's panel presentation on the geography of federal funding, which will be moderated by Roger Beachy. During that session, we'll hear from four esteemed panelists that will shed light on the federal funding landscape across the nation, across individual states and institutional types. After the panel, we'll have a short coffee break. Those attending via Zoom, uh, please turn off your audio. Okay, that's okay. Steve keeps us in, in, in check. Those attending via Zoom may stay connected. Um, when we return from our break, we will be treated to an introduction to the 2022 NSF Waterman and NSF Public Service awardees. And by the way, there is coffee out in the hallway. And if at any time you need to take a rest stop, please go out there because the cameras will only be focused on those who are talking at the time. All right, so you will not be disrupting the meeting. Um, we'll have an opportunity to engage with the awardees for a short question and answer session. Once that session concludes, we'll break for lunch where members will lunch with awardees and the NXF executive leadership team. When we return from lunch, we'll be joined by Dr. Rick Spinrad, the Undersecretary of Commerce for Ocean and Atmospheres at the National Oceanatic and Atmospheric Administration. We'll have the opportunity to discuss NOAA's collaborations with NSF, priorities and approaches to broadening and nurturing talent. The afternoon will include a series of open committee report outs from the NSB Committee on Strategy, Oversight, External Engagement, and the Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy. Today we'll include with a report from our K through STEM Education Exploratory Working Group update. Uh, and then tomorrow will be mostly closed meetings, including the work on the budget and facilities issues and the election of the new NSB chair and vice chair. We will conclude with a review of what we've accomplished in the first two years of Vision 2030, and we'll recognize the NSB class of 2022 for their many contributions. I should also say, after we conclude today, you have about 45 minutes of free time. You may go up to the 19th floor. You may go back to your hotel. Today is Cinco de Mayo, so if you have time, you can go over next door and get a margarita. Uh, but please be back here because activities will start at 5.30. So with that, I would like to turn the meeting over to NSF Director Seth Rahman Pachanathan for his remarks. Thank you, Chair McCready. Thank you so much. And um, it's truly a delight to see everybody face to face after two years, having taken this role during the pandemic, it's truly a pleasure, uh, a doubly a pleasure to meet all the colleagues in person. And for those who are still joining virtually, hopefully we'll meet all of you in person very soon. So I just want to start with my remarks. Thank you so much. And a good morning to all of you. Um, I hope all of you are doing well. Feel free to mask as the, the chair indicated, as, uh, as you feel comfortable uh, to mask or not mask. Um, I would like to welcome all of the um, public who are also joining us virtually. Uh, one positive outcome of the last two years, I would say, is our enhanced ability to be able to organize and host virtual hybrid meetings. This is a much higher quality hybrid meeting than we had in the past when I was on the board. So that's something that we can celebrate, is this moment has taught us how to organize virtual meetings better. So it truly expands our reach and capabilities, and which includes absolutely everybody, no matter location, or circumstances. So let me start by giving you my quick remarks. So the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, clearly about the context of strengthening at speed and scale. Um, as the chair pointed out, we should take this moment to acknowledge the Public Service Recognition Week and all the public servants. And I want to thank every one of them and the board members, all of you. You are public servants as well as the staff members, public servants, each of you for the time and the service that you provide for the nation. Without this, we will not be where we are today as a, as, as a foundation and as a board. So you are the engine that makes everything possible at NSF. And I want to acknowledge your contributions. And I will do that for the uh, outgoing members and reappointed members also in a few moments. But clearly all of you, every one of you is a, a huge contributor to NSF success. So the Biden-Harris administration submitted to Congress their budget for FY23. I'm sure all of you have uh, noticed that, which includes a $10.5 billion for NSF. This is the largest increase that we have had, and I'm so thrilled and grateful to the administration and the president for this fantastic budget for NSF. 
And I look forward to working with Congress and with the tremendous bipartisan support that we have in Congress for NSF. I'm sure we will do very well. And I look forward to that. So clearly this request reflects the confidence that our nation's leaders have in our agency and the critical role that NSF plays to keep our country at the forefront of science, engineering, and education research and innovation. Let me share with you, as I always do, to excite all of us so that we can wake up from, you know, not only just the coffee, but the excitement of looking at this video. So let me start with a short video highlighting the importance of NSF's mission and these continued investments. So uh, let me see, how do I start the video? Yes. Yeah, this one? Yes. Yeah, good. Let's see if that works. What would happen if the science and engineering research of the last 71 years had never occurred? If things like cell phones, Doppler radar, the internet, and genetic testing were to just suddenly disappear, the world would be a very different place indeed. Since its creation in 1950, the U.S. National Science Foundation has fueled discoveries and innovations which have improved lives and kept the U.S. on the leading edge of science and engineering. By funding of both curiosity-driven research and solutions-oriented work, NSF enables researchers to make great leaps forward in discovery and innovation. NSF, ensuring U.S. global leadership through investments that expand the frontiers of knowledge and technology and support an increase in the STEM workforce in critical fields such as artificial intelligence, supercomputers, and the environment. The National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin. As you can see, we need more discoveries to make sure the audio works well. Um, so that thanks for the investments to continue to do work on those things too. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to sort of talk about is this anchoring point of what NSF's major priorities are. Every time that we get together, I want to make sure that the alignment of the vision that we talk about every time, this is about the priorities, the three major priorities of NSF. Strengthening the established NSF, inspiring missing millions, and accelerating technology and innovation. And so we are focused on these and more as we think about the advances that we make. Now, as we talk about making those tremendous advances, we all know that this would not be possible without the fantastic work. And I've seen this firsthand in the last two years since coming to NSF firsthand, the fantastic hard work and dedication of the NSF employees. So I'm so incredibly impressed and proud the way NSF has come together during these unprecedented times with COVID. Through dedication, resilience, and creativity, our employees have overcome difficult circumstances and new challenges time and time again. Now, over the two years after embracing a full transition to a telework environment, we are thrilled to be welcoming employees back to the building as we officially started our workforce reentry process on April 4th. Karen and I were down in the lobby greeting everybody as they were coming in. So it was a very, you know, very uh, proud moment for us. So throughout the week, as many of the employees entered the building, some for the first time, Dr. Maranjal and I were so excited to greet them. Of course, this is a gradual process, and we are still learning. With many of our employees still working remotely, we are having ongoing conversations about how we can best support the NSF workforce and adapt internal processes, technology, and workspace to create an effective hybrid work environment. We have some ex exciting new technologies that we are deploying, and you'll be happy to see some of that in action when you get a chance to walk around the building. As we begin, to fill our building and embrace new and exciting means of collaboration, we are also looking ahead and planning what is next for the agency. On March 28, we were excited to announce the release of our new strategic plan for fiscal years 2022 through 2026. I want to, at the outset, say this plan would not have been possible without the amazing collaboration between the foundation and the National Science Board. So thank you all so much for your partnership to get this, uh, this this strategic plan in a really exciting place, to a, to a really, really exciting place. Developed as a cross-agency collaboration, the strategic plan builds on over seven decades of success at NSF and defines the path forward for the future of discovery and innovation. Our four new strategic goals, empower, 
discover, impact, and excel will serve as the foundation for ensuring that NSF continues to achieve our vision of a nation that leads the world in science and engineering research and innovation to the benefit of all without barriers to participation. Now, when we talk about doing amazing work and setting the stage for doing amazing work with the vision, how can we not celebrate the fantastic work of these three outstanding exemplars who represent the best of the best of the best? The bold future we have planned for NSF, as I said, is built upon seven decades of investments in researchers, in infrastructure, and programs that have expanded the frontiers of knowledge and technology. Enabling these fundamental breakthroughs continues to be the heart at the heart of what we do. One of the greatest ways to continue to honor and support the advancement of basic research across all fields of science is through our Alan T. Waterman Award. As you know, this is the highest honor that NSF bestows on earlier, early career scientists and engineers who demonstrate exceptional individual achievements in research in NSF supported fields. And I'm so proud to say this. And for the first time ever, we have the great pleasure of honoring three outstanding scientists. Dr. Jessica Tierney from the University of Arizona, Dr. Laura Thompson from the University of the District of Columbia, Dr. Daniel Lattimore from the University of Colorado Boulder. Fantastic institutions, fantastic uh, researchers and scientists. We truly are honored to be able to talk about their work today as well as you know, honor them today. Dr. Lattimore is being recognized for his work using the tools of computational epidemiology to address urgent questions and countermeasures used during the COVID-19 pandemic. In his research, Dr. Lattimore combined mathematics and computation with real world data to create new models that provide answers to globally important questions about how to best administer a scarce vaccine to minimize deaths and infections and what role rapid testing could play in mitigating viral transmission. This work has enormous impacts on how we understand pandemics now and in the future. So mark it on the pandemics, which is the challenge of today and the enormous contribution from the first amazing researcher. Dr. Tierney is being recognized this evening for her outstanding advances in the reconstruction of past climate change to further our understanding of future climate change. By using novel modeling techniques combined with paleoclimate data assimilation, she has generated groundbreaking maps of past climate conditions and the system dynamics that produced those conditions. Her research has redefined the understanding of global temperature changes in the geologic past and developed a new quantitative understanding of temperature and climate sensitivity to past levels of carbon dioxide. Point number two, a global grand challenge and a fantastic researcher making tremendous headway in that regard being honored also. Finally, Dr. Thompson is being recognized for her innovations in rehabilitation engineering and for translating her research on vestibular disorders in primates into engineering-based interventions to improve the lives of individuals with balance, gait, and postural impairments. Her research uses assistive technologies, robotics, and other methodologies with the aim of improving balance in elderly individuals and survivors of stroke. Her research examines how such technologies can increase balance confidence and reduce the risk of falling for these groups of individuals. I'm also proud to mention that Dr. Thompson is the first ever Waterman Award recipient from a historically black college and university to win this award. We can all feel really proud of this fantastic third point that I want to make, the human machine symbiosis, which is the future. How do humans and machines work together for high performance you know, and, and augmented performance? And this is truly an exciting time for NSF, celebrating these three individuals representing you know, not only the diversity of institutions, diversity of areas that is of tremendous impact for our nation at this moment in time and in the future. These three phenomenal scientists have each clearly demonstrated a superb record of scientific achievement and their use of creative and innovative approaches to research are pushing the frontiers of discovery in each of their respective fields. I am looking forward with all of you this evening to honor and congratulate each of them 
at the Alan T. Waterman Award Ceremony. And as I always do, I always want to make sure that we keep our eye on the ball. What does NSF investment do in different areas? We've been sharing this over the many presentations that we have been making. And this time, we're going to talk about advanced materials, the investment impact in the area of advanced materials. The fundamental breakthroughs these scientists are making are critical component of NSF's ability to power use-inspired technology and innovation. Like always, I want to give you a few examples of how these discoveries continue to make tangible and lasting impacts on the lives of the millions of people around the world. We all know that fiber optic cables are vital for delivering the fast and reliable communications we depend on worldwide. However, another important use of these cables in the medical world, where they are used to illuminate body cavities. Seeing an opportunity to innovate an existing technology, NSF scientists at the MIT Materials Research Science and Engineering Center developed a revolutionary optical fiber capable of delivering light in a highly precise manner, leading to the development of the first fiber optic surgical light scalpel ever. The team of researchers behind the invention went on to found OmniGuide Incorporation, a medical device company for minimally invasive surgical tools. NSF's investments in material research have led to tremendous advancements in other areas of medical science as well. The primary intervention for heart attack or coronary heart disease involves placing a tiny stent in an artery to keep it open. However, early on, it was found that the stents were causing inflammation and more blockage. So in 1981, NSF began investing in polymer research conducted by Dr. Joe Kennedy at the University of Akron. In 1986, with the support of NSF, Dr. Kennedy developed a new rare polymer called SIBS, SIBS. SIBS was found to be non-inflammatory, sterilizable, and expandable. But most importantly, it could release anti-inflammatory drugs in a controlled and timed way. We call them drug eluting stents, if you've heard of them, DES. In 2004, the FDA approved SBIS as a drug delivery coating for coronary stents, and Boston Scientific Company began manufacturing stents with SIBS coatings. Today, they are the most widely used stents in the world. But let's talk about another type of technology that you're all very familiar with. How many of you have a smartphone or tablet with you today? I don't have to ask the question. I should ask the question, how many do you have? <laughs> Not just whether you have. So probably all of us, many devices. These devices, as well as the electric cars, toys, power tools, and many other devices require lithium ion batteries to operate. Our lifestyle today would be unimaginable without this battery technology. Beginning in the 1970s, NSF began funding John Goodenough and M. Stanley Whittingham in their search for potential energy storing materials. It was in this search, funded by NSF over decades, that led to the development of the first lithium ion batteries, which were commercialized in 1991. In all, NSF has supported Goodenough and Whittingham's work over the span of 30 years and their life-changing discovery earned their Nobel Prize in 2019 in chemistry. Other NSF investments in material science and engineering are helping create the next generation of STEM leaders across the nation. For example, in 2014, Dr. Jason Benedict decided to use this fascination with crystals to educate children about STEM. As part of his NSF career award from the Solid State and Materials Chemistry Program in our Division of Materials Research, he was able to bring the excitement of crystallography into K-12 classrooms, an important end of our initiative that we should all be focused on to do more and scale more and happen everywhere. Jason established a nationwide crystal growing competition with hands-on experiments and curriculum development for teachers and students. When started with less than 40 registered participants from only eight states, which has now grown to include over 260 teams and nearly 3,600 students from 53 states and territories. Finally, I have said this many times before, but when we talk about the DNA of NSF, it is so important to point out, fundamental research does not always lead directly to use-inspired solutions. Sometimes it goes in the other direction, and more often it bounces between the two simultaneously. For example, in 2008, NSF-funded researcher, Dr. Mass Subramanian, was working to identify, synthesize, and characterize mixed valent metal oxides 
with the aim of advancing developments in magnetic storage technology and sensing systems for the next generation high-speed computers. However, during his research, he and his students serendipitously discovered the first new inorganic blue pigment in over 200 years. Not only is this a historic discovery, but the pigment is a huge advancement in non-toxicity, stability, and vividness. This pigment, which is incredibly durable and reflects infrared light, sunlight, is now used in a wide range of coatings and plastics. And has inspired the most important thing for my granddaughter, a new Crayola crayon color. <laughs> Since their historic discovery, Subramanian and his team have successfully designed other durable colors. And in 2020, they received an NSF Eager grant to pursue the holy grail of color research, an inorganic red pigment that's vivid, safe, and durable. The next thing that I want to talk about is enabling collaboration to expand opportunity. This should be a significant focus and is of NSF and will be more into the future. Of course, these types of breakthroughs and innovations in material science and engineering do not happen on their own. They are fueled by millions of talented scientists and engineers spread across our country. In August, I highlighted the newest round of Partnership for Research and Education in Materials, or PREM Awards. Our MPS director does a fabulous job with this program. And uh, AD Sean Jones is here today. A lot of credit goes to him and his team. Today, I want to highlight how a PREM partnership between the Navajo Technical University and Harvard's NSF-funded Materials Research Science and Engineering Center is helping students develop a STEM-based solution to a real-world problem in New Mexico. The Navajo Nation is severely affected by mining activities. Heavy metals leaching from more than 500 abandoned mines are, containing, are contaminating soil and water, impacting the health of the Navajo people. A Navajo Tech Harvard Prem team is working together to develop low-cost electrochemical sensors for the detection of heavy metals. The successful implementation of these easy-to-use sensors has the potential to greatly expand the Navajo Nation's capacity for monitoring the safety of their soils, water, and the abandoned mines. The secret to truly unleashing the power of all STEM talent across the nation is identifying the approaches that have the greatest impact and scaling that success across the board. The PREM program is now inspiring similar programs across NSF's Directorate of Mathematical and Physical Sciences. So they said they don't want to be left out. The Division of Physics has established Partnership for Research and Education in Physics, PREP program. The Division of Chemistry is now funding Partnership for Research and Education in Chemistry called the PREC program, P-R-E-C. The Division of Astronomical Sciences has launched their Partnership in Astronomy and Astrophysics Research and Education programs called PAIR. This is an incredible example of how we can build upon the established successes of NSF and broaden participation in STEM at speed and scale. You're wondering what this is. It is always great to hear directly from researchers. After all, I'm a spokesperson. Let me share with you a short video from the NSF researcher in Hawaii, who with the support of NSF is helping push the frontiers of discovery and inspiring the next generation of STEM leaders. My research is focused on how we can redesign computer systems, especially the small smart devices, so that they don't have to have batteries and can operate completely from energy harvested from their environment with sources like the sun, motion, thermal, or radio waves. My name is Josiah Hester, and I'm an assistant professor of computer engineering at Northwestern University. We have projects that were funded by the NSF to support really long-term health monitoring, especially through a face mask, by reporting on their mask fit quality as well as their biometrics. We've also been able to explore how students can learn to code sustainable computers, train future scientists, undergraduate and graduate students, and to be able to really guide what the future could be like in 20, 30, 40 years, and take part in building a sustainable, inclusive, and accessible internet of things. Without NSF, this research would just not be possible. I hope you all enjoyed that video. At NSF, we are also working hard to spread our vision and find new partners across the country. In March, NSF attended the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas. Throughout the week, 
we staffed a fantastic booth to raise the awareness for the agency, its mission, and the incredible science and technology we enable. Well, we could not go to Antarctica, but that shouldn't stop Dario from celebrating with the Antarctic clothes. He said, I mean, I think he saw the pictures that were shared in the last meeting, and he said, how can I be left out? And so he decided to take a picture himself. So that's what this is about. I want to take a moment to thank the NSF's Office of Legislative and Public Affairs, OLPA, for organizing and operating the highly attended booth throughout the festival. I was there and I watched the number of people who stopped by the booth and they were so excited to see signs in action and talk to our people. As you can see, we had many visitors to the booth, including NSB's own very Dario Gill, as I said. While there, I had the pleasure of joining Dario, Yolanda Gill, no relationship to Dario Gill, and NSF's Irvin Gian Chandani for a fantastic panel discussion regarding the future of AI and technology. And on March 16th, during a featured session presentation, I had the distinct honor of publicly announcing the launch of the NSF's Directorate for Technology, Innovation and Partnerships, or TIP, NSF's first new directorate in over 30 years. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of you. This would not have been possible without all of you. This is a, a tremendous convergence of the National Science Board 2030 vision and NSF's vision and the president's vision, the administration's vision, all coming together, as well as the Hill and, uh, and, 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 and the, and the uh, legislation that are in front of Congress, USICA and competes, all talking about this importance of this moment. So this is truly a tremendous and important moment for our agency that has been a long time in the making. I know all of you have heard me talk about the new horizontal for the agency since I became director nearly two years ago. And it's wonderful to take the initial steps to make this vision a reality with all our partnership and support. TIP is an exciting new direction for our agency. It's about strengthening and scaling use-inspired solutions-oriented research that NSF has long supported and accelerating the translation of research results to the market and society. Anytime you go in a new direction, you must carefully plan and execute. Indeed, the launch of the TIP Directorate has required many new and creative approaches to every aspect of our work. The saying, it takes a village, really is the case here. NSF staff from across the agency have worked incredibly hard to make TIP a reality, and I'm very grateful for their perseverance and dedication. I'm also grateful to all of you for your perspectives, as I said, and inputs as we have honed our vision for TIP. They have been immensely valuable, and I hope you have seen that we are listening and constantly refining to all your thoughts, ideas, suggestions. We are incredibly grateful to have Irvin Gian Chandani. We decided to display him right there as the inaugural director of the assistant, as assistant director for technology innovation partnerships. <laughs> Irvin, it was truly an honor working with you. And Irvin's wealth of experience in research, innovation, and partnership programs truly is going to make TIP a very successful program into the future. You will hear from him in just a bit, but I have no doubt that under his leadership, the directorate will achieve phenomenal things. One of the first bold steps that TIP is taking is the establishment of the NSF Regional Innovations Engines Program, a program of unprecedented scale and scope to support research, innovation, and education that has impact in every part of our country. Though these innovation engines will focus on advancements in use-inspired research, innovation, entrepreneurship, and workforce development to nurture and accelerate regional industries. Just as the Bell Labs of 1980s and 90s paved the way for seminal breakthroughs in entirely new industries, we hope to bring together academia, industry, government, civil societies, and communities of practice in profoundly new ways. And we hope to usher in a transformational revolution that gives rise to new businesses, new jobs, new ways of life, and enhances the US economy and competitiveness for decades to come. The regional innovation engines will strengthen bottom up, brittle out growth in industries and communities across America. This program has been many months in the making and we're excited to be releasing our first solicitation. We just released it, I think two days ago. So the regional innovation engines will expand the geographic diversity of our work and unleash the talent embedding, embedded in every community. Over the last few weeks, I have been traveling with our nation's leaders in government and academia, and it's abundantly clear, good ideas are everywhere. As I say, innovation can be anywhere and opportunities should be everywhere because good ideas are everywhere. 
In early April, I traveled to Scranton, Pennsylvania to join Chairman Matt Cartwright, Chairman of the Commerce, Justice, Science, Appropriations Committee on the Penn State Scranton campus. There we met with the representatives from Short Glass, North America, and regional stakeholders to discuss the statewide impact of NSF's projects, facilities, and industry partnership with universities, as well as, in future, as, well as the future possibilities. I then went on to the University of Rochester in New York to join majority leader Chuck Schumer, Representative Joseph Morrell, and University President Sarah Mangelstorf. We had the pleasure of meeting with researchers and students and touring several of the university's facilities, including the laboratory for laser energetics. You could see things in action. It's always exciting to meet with faculty and students. Finally, I had the pleasure of visiting the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where I was joined by Senator Dick Durbin. While there, we announced two new awards to the university, met with the leadership and faculty, and visited the university's research park. Again, a very exciting set of visits that, um, that really you know, puts the NSF in place in terms of what we do all across the country. In terms of engagement highlights, other than the visits with the congressional folks, we have been busy over the last few months meeting with many other groups throughout the STEM community, both in person and virtually, to share NSF's mission and strengthen our partnerships. In March, I joined our chair, Elena Chowa, and vice chair of the Committee on Strategy, Heather Wilson, for a fantastic roundtable discussion with leaders from throughout the University of Texas system. Thank you, Heather, for organizing this great event. Later in March, I hosted the Swedish ambassador, Karen Olof's daughter, and a delegation from the Swedish Foundation for International Cooperation in Research and Higher Education for a discussion about the future of international collaboration and NSF Swedish partnerships. I just want to say these are samples. We had many other delegations from across the globe visiting us. This is just an example of one of those. On April 6th, I spoke to the leaders at the International Year of Glass, National Day of Glass event, where I shared the NSF's vision and many unique glass-related NSF investments to impacts. I was taken by one of the things that they mentioned, that this device that we all carry, you know, has many, many glass components, we all know that. So, and the, in the companies that were, including short glass that were making that, we're very proud to talk about NSF's engagement from early years that made those things possible today. Later in the month, I joined the head of OSTP, Dr. Alondra Nelson, at the American Education Research Association Conference for a discussion on the future of STEM education across the country. Earlier this week, just a couple of days ago, I joined Dario, Dario Gill, uh, NSB member, at the IBM Research Headquarters in New York for the 2022 Hudson Forum. I shared NSF's priorities and vision for the future and joined a discussion with Dario, Marilyn Simons, and Martin Schmidt about the future of science and technology. But what was exciting is to stand in front of the quantum computer and take a picture with Dario. That was truly exciting. I've never seen one. So it was truly a, a momentous occasion. And on Tuesday, just two days ago, uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and I testified before the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies. We met to discuss President Biden's FY23 budget request and the importance of continued support for NSF's mission and our ability to unleash transformational discoveries and technology. These engagements are always one of the most thrilling and fun parts of my job. I'm always so excited to see firsthand the incredible work NSF makes possible and to share our vision with communities across the country. But even more important, to get you more closer to the action, to tell you more about the incredible signs NSF is enabling, if I have not convinced you already. I would like to invite Dr. Alicia Needler, Dr. Sylvia Butterfield, and Dr. Irvin Gyan Chandani to share some of the amazing breakthroughs and contributions that their directorates are making. I promised cool signs. We'll see how cool it gets. So why don't we get started? And um, let me start with um, Dr. Alicia Needler, who is going to kick us off. Alicia, over to you. Good morning, and thank you. For nearly 25 years, NSF's Office of Integrative Activities has had a role in launching, managing, and stewarding many of NSF's cross-cutting programs. We have the unique opportunity to broadly support all disciplines. In collaboration with colleagues from across the agency, for this cool science presentation, however, we chose to go deep. We are featuring one of NSF's science and technology centers, which provides significant long-term investments to establish new scientific disciplines and develop transformative technologies that have the potential for broad impacts on science and society. 
The global ocean comprises the Earth's largest biome. Researchers in NSF's STC Center for Dark Energy Biosphere Investigations, or CDEBI for short, have provided compelling evidence suggesting that microbial abundance in the subseafloor sediments equals that in the overlying ocean. CW researchers have also demonstrated that the microbial cell counts in marine sediments vary by many orders of magnitude from the ocean margins to the ocean gyres, from the sediment floor, sediment water interface to the deep subsurface. When CW started in 2010, they had just discovered that bacteria existed in these deep levels of sediment in the ocean, and it was re a real challenge to collect and process the samples analyze them and discern the ways in which the bacteria had energy available to keep them alive. Before we turn to one of their amazing recent discoveries, I wanted to describe how NSF's infrastructure investments make this exceptional research possible. In exploring and searching for microbes in subseafloor sediment, CW researchers rely heavily on several pieces of key research infrastructure. They have access to shared research facilities for their experimental, analytical, and sequencing work across their networks of research labs at USC, Woods Hole, the University of Rhode Island, UC Santa Cruz, and the University of Alaska Fairbanks. They rely heavily on research vessels such as the Neil Armstrong and the Joides Resolution and NSF-funded research exped expeditions to obtain deep, sed deep sediment core samples under the ocean floor. These research vessels obtained sample cores from around the world's oceans to support many different types of research into the geology, chemistry, and biology of the ocean. Sediment cores tell us not only what is going on now, but what happened in the past. Collecting sediment cores requires significant infrastructure investment, but once collected, the cores are stored in special facilities that become the source material for communities of researchers. And as researchers develop new analysis techniques, they can go back to old cores to gain new insights. CW research has shown that life is more tenacious than we thought before. Very recently, investigators discovered cells within 100 million year old sediment at the bottom of the central South Pacific Ocean. They focus their research in this area because of the sediment accumulates very slowly, a few centimeters per million years, and they wanted to study microbes that had the lowest access to energy anywhere in the ocean with very little organic matter for tens of millions of years. Remarkably, a community of microbes continues to exist despite being isolated for so long. And rather than being fossilized, these microbes are still living, as demonstrated by C. Debbie researchers who were able to incubate them in the lab. Once they were provided with the nutrients, microbes began to multiply as they would have before they were isolated. Yet how did they stay alive for so long in a place that seems to provide insufficient nutrients for them to sustain themselves? These microbes seem to be sustained by naturally occurring radioactivity. Naturally occurring, occurring radiation slowly splits apart seawater molecules, a process called radiolysis. The products of radiolysis can be used by bacteria as an energy source. The products of radiologists, uh, by irradiating samples of the subseafloor sediment, CW researchers discovered that the material in sediments appears to catalyze radiolysis, providing hydrolytic hydrogen at a rate that is much higher than in seawater alone. By comparing rates of radiolytic H2 consumption to the rate of the oxida oxidation of organic material, the researchers deduce that water radiolysis is the principal source of biologically accessible energy for microbial communities in marine sediment older than a few million years. Perhaps one of the most tantalizing notions of these results is that they raise the possibility that where water permeates catalytic material on other worlds in our solar system, life could be sustained by water radiolysis when other sources of energy are not available. By understanding just how remarkably living organisms behave in extreme environments, we demonstrate our understanding of fundamental biological mechanisms and how organisms can adapt in the face of future environmental change. Thank you for your time. And now I will turn things over to my EHR colleague, Dr. Sylvia Butterfield. Thank you, Alicia, and good morning. I'm Sylvia Butterfield, the Acting Assistant Director for Education and Human Resources 
Today, I will share with you how education researchers and emerging learning technologies are redefining what a laboratory experience can be for teachers and students. Projects in the NSF portfolio explore and advance our understanding of how simulations can transform and improve STEM teaching and learning. Next, please. On March 6, 2020, the University of Washington announced it was shifting to remote learning. Within weeks, higher education institutions and K-12 school districts around the country made similar decisions. How has STEM learning and teaching been supported through this massive shift? Next, please. Since 1983, NSF investments have laid the groundwork for hands-on STEM learning experiences in remote and hybrid educational environments. While lab activities offer essential inquiry-based learning opportunities, virtual reality, reality technologies increase student engagement in STEM and deepen their understanding of concepts. Traditional labs present challenges where activities are expensive, difficult, time-consuming, and occasionally dangerous. To address these barriers, remote labs use the internet, allowing educators and students to conduct experiments and use sophisticated scientific apparatus. This is often at low cost with, it, with increased safety and convenience when compared to traditional labs. Interactive virtual reality and related technologies are being adopted by future workplaces, training venues, and educational institutes. By using virtual technologies, they augment and extend human cognition and make the invisible visible, make the inaccessible accessible, and bring the remote within reach. Next, please. A critical comp component of remote learning is enhancing the virtual learning environment. NSF has been at the forefront of funding projects that tackle the core research questions that advance the foundational and translational use-inspired knowledge base of virtual reality technologies for use in a remote learning environment. Three important questions are, how can we foster collaborative learning within virtual settings? Can virtual learning experiences increase student engagement in informal settings? And how can we use virtual technologies to help students perceive or conceptualize what the human eye cannot see? Answering these questions will enable education researchers to improve students' experiences and learning capabilities in hybrid environments across all STEM and education pathways. Next, please. Virtual computer labs provide on-demand access to specialized software and hardware. However, the virtual workspaces in which students are assigned often lack support for sharing, causing the collaborative aspect of learning to be lost. Georgia State University has devalu developed and evaluated collaborative learning in cloud-based computer labs through shared remote collaboration, virtual study rooms, and a virtual tutoring center. This research was timely as it began before and continued throughout the COVID pandemic. It also allowed Georgia State to provide tutoring and collaborative virtual lab experiences to all of its computer science students. Next, please. In-person learning facilitates uh, a personal and immediate feedback loop to the student. That feedback can be simulated and delivered in virtual environments as well, including museums and science centers. Carnegie Mellon University has developed a new genre of intelligent interactive science exhibits. Researchers combine proven intelligent tutoring systems with camera-based vision sensing, which enhance hands-on museum exhibits. This intelligent layer provides personalized interactive feedback to visitors while they experiment with physical objects in the real world. Children learn significantly more from the AI enhanced intelligent science exhibit than, than the traditional exhibit. Not only did they understand the underlying science concepts better, but they also developed better building and engineering skills and engage with the exhibit four times as long. Next, please. A third research topic is how to appropriately visualize the abstract or what is invisible to the naked eye. Investigating augmented reality or AR or mobile devices has opened new frontiers in K-12 and higher education. 
For example, imagine visualizing dynamic reactions while pouring chemicals from a pipette. Next. Or imagine seeing the 3D magnetic fields of real objects in a mixed reality context where the physical world must be congruent with what a viewer usually perceives. The student must be able to make sense of and learn from what is being perceived. The American Modeling Teachers Association has developed an augmented reality framework work and mobile augmented reality visualization technology that will allow these tools to be distributed freely to schools. They're also available in app stores. Next, please. NSF is pushing the edge of what can be done to improve STEM learning. Because of NSF investments, we fostered an interdisciplinary community of researchers, developers, and designers in the learning sciences who are prepared to carry out this work across educational environments. These investments have shown that hybrid learning can support deep conceptual understanding. Moreover, NSF-funded education research fosters evidence-based solutions in varied settings across the nation to enable students of all ages and abilities to seamlessly interact across and with physical and virtual technological environments as they work, learn, and live. Next, please. Lastly, the COVID pandemic exposed and exacerbated inequities in education and reminded us of the continuous hard work we must do to ensure that there's diversity in STEM. Virtual reality technologies can help to remove barriers that underserved communities typically experience. Looking forward, we strive to support research on both learning tools and learning environments that are accessible and equitable for researchers, educators, and students of all ages. Thank you. The final school science presentation will be made by Erwin John Chandani, Assistant Director for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships, or TIP. Over to you, Erwin. Thanks very much, Sylvia, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to present to you a science highlight from TIP. Over the last 20 months, the director and I have talked about the double helix of DNA that comprises NSF, how exploratory research drives translational work, and how that translational work in turn feeds further exploratory research. I hope you'll see evidence of that in this story, which pulls from a research endeavor that spans the size directorate and also programs that are now in TIP. I'm pleased to tell you the story of diligent robotics and the science that led to it. This woman-owned startup was founded in 2017 to build robots with mobile manipulation, human-guided learning capabilities, and social intelligence. Moxie, as it's called, is Diligent's first robot teammate in the field, working in hospitals alongside clinical staff to help them with non-patient-facing tasks so that they have more time for patient care. Moxie has been featured in the popular press, including in this Wired article last month. What most folks don't know about Moxie is that she has her roots at NSF, not just in our translational programs like the Small Business Innovation Research or SBIR program, but all the way back to fundamental research. Indeed, NSF's double helix DNA commingling exploratory and translational research is very much the story of Moxie. Diligence co-founder, Dr. Andrea Tomas, seen here on the right, has been a robotics professor at Georgia Tech and the University of Texas at Austin. Her research has focused on social, social robots that can learn tasks from human teachers. She mentored a PhD candidate on the left here, Vivian Chu, who earned her doctorate from Georgia Tech and was the other co-founder for Diligent. Today, she is the company's chief technology officer. Dr. Tomas's first NSF award was in 2008 through a longstanding size program called Robust Intelligence. The hypothesis of this grant and really her research over the next seven years was that successfully incorporating self and social learning in a single socially guided machine learning framework would enable a robot learner to more effectively interact with its surroundings and execute its roles. Their first experiment compared a robot learning about objects by itself to the situation where it learns with a human partner. 
So in other words, in one case, the robot took in its surroundings and attempted to learn on its own, whereas in the other, the robot would ask its human partner questions like, can I lift this object or can I lift that object, and would learn from the answers. A key contribution from this work was how we as humans learn. We start with simple examples. We group those examples into coherent chunks with the amount of data that are provided being proportional to the complexity of what's being described. And we focus especially on rare events. The research team found that socially collected data sets and non-socially collected data sets produce classifiers with different performance levels and that the social data sets do much better at predicting especially rare events and effects. Building upon this work and through an NSF career award, the research team sought to successfully incorporate self and social learning, enabling a robot learner to dynamically adjust to varying levels of human involvement in the learning process. That is, let the robot learn on its own through its surroundings, but combine that learning with human cues and feedback. In a project funded by the National Robotics Initiative, which involves multiple NSF directorates and partnerships with other agencies, including the Department of Defense, the research team extended their work, developing innovative remote teleoperation interfaces for complex robotic systems. That is, the user's ability to quickly and effectively control a robot manipulator is key to learning from a remote user. Their interface is now being validated for use by NASA to control the free-flying Astro-B robot on the International Space Station. Through this work, Dr. Tomas and her student, now Dr. Chu, believed there, there was a commercial opportunity for deploying service robots with adaptable behavior into human environments. To begin that journey uh, toward commercialization, the pair applied for a grant through the NSF Innovation Corps i -Corps program in 2015. The goal of the i project was to conduct customer discovery to identify a market segment that would find value in using mobile manipulators in human environments to perform repetitive manual tasks that are otherwise undesirable to humans. Through the i experience, they were able to identify healthcare establishments as a potential entry point into the market. Having identified that target market opportunity, the team applied for and received SBIR phase one funding to prototype and pilot their concept. Over six months, they sought to establish the technical and commercial feasibility of their approach by deploying their robot, their prototype mobile service robot in a partner hospital for a month. They found that service robots can successfully operate in and adapt to such an environment. As part of the follow-on SBIR phase two award, the team worked closely with the partner hospital to establish a specific process map and understand where service robots could have the greatest impact in the hospital's workflow. The team also focused on the seamless interaction of the social robot in dynamic human environments. Their goal was to develop a service robot that hospital staff would view as a competent and trustworthy member of the care team. In the years since that award, Diligent has raised nearly $50 million and grown to nearly 30 employees. That's 30 new jobs. And today, the company is bringing hospital service robots to the market. Moxie can be implemented in a new hospital in just a matter of weeks. She can complete as many as 75 different tasks in a shift. She charges herself automatically and can navigate elevators and security doors. And by freeing up hours of nursing time for valuable patient care, she has proven invaluable during the unprecedented nursing and staffing shortages of the last two years. And what's more, she is driving further exploratory research with fundamental questions around object manipulation and presence. And so for us, she illustrates the symbiosis that we hope to cultivate between TIP and our other directorates into the future as we look to advance technology and accelerate the societal and economic impacts of the research that we support. So thank you again for your time today, and I will now turn things back over to the director. Thank you very much, uh, Great job, team. So. Um, Mr. Chair, I know that we are running a little bit behind schedule, but I want to take this moment to acknowledge the, uh, the, uh, and celebrate the service of all of our um, NSB members. So I would like to take a moment to express my sincerest gratitude and thanks to the 2016 NSB appointees, 2016-2022 NSB serving members. While we'll be recognizing my esteemed colleagues tomorrow, I do want to take this opportunity to highlight among their many contributions, a highlight or two that we'll, we will most certainly remember them by. Let me start with Dr. Binan Stark. 
Dr. Uh, Beenan's talk led the effort to take a hard look at the federal requirements for research and its associated administrative burden on the research community. During the pandemic, federal agencies worked together to develop creative solutions and reducing administrative burden inspired by Dr. Beenan's talk's work. Thank you, Artie, for your amazing contributions to NSB and NSF. Dr. Leinberger brought, us, brought to us his keen insights and incredible experience in stewardship of research facilities. During his tenure, he led the Committee on Awards and Facilities, working with senior agency leaders to hone the strategy and provide advice on facilities management. Thank you, Carl, for your superb contributions to NSB and NSF. Dr. Anila Sargent has had multiple leadership and oversight roles where her scientific expertise and her unique ability to channel the scientific community has been invaluable to us. For example, Dr. Sargent's collaborative work with the Office of Integrative Activities on the Merit Review Digest has led to more transparent and improved analytics. Thank you, Anila, for your multifaceted contributions to NSB and NSF. These are three members who served two terms. I mean, I mean, it's an amazing, amazing service to the nation and NSF. Our next group of members, Dr. Fox, Moran, Phillips, McCready, and Ochawa, are completing their six-year terms. Dr. Fox has provided strong and sage advice on many of our long-term policy goals through engagement with our senior leaders. His rich perspectives through his strong academic leadership has been invaluable to addressing the needs of the communities that we serve. For example, his leadership of the awards and election subcommittees have indeed been extremely valuable. Thank you, Kent, for your numerous contributions to NSB and NSF. Dr. Moran consistently reflected the scientific community's perspectives to ensure the NSF strategy and programs were focused on solving grand challenge problems. For example, his keen scientific insights were invaluable to shaping large projects like NEON. Thank you, Emilio, for your excellent contributions to NSB and NSF. Dr. Phillips has always taken on challenging roles in the board. We'll all know that, including serving as chair of the SNE Policy Committee with oversight on the SNE Indicators Report. The contributions and impact of the SNE reports are truly a testament to do Julia's hard work and commitment to excellence. We are delighted that she will continue serving on the board. We are very thrilled to enrich both NSB and NSF. Thank you, Julia, for your leadership and contributions. Dr. McCready has always been a strong champion for expanding access to all talent and ideas to be successful. His work on the skilled technical workforce opened new vistas for the board and NSF. I'm grateful for his service as vice chair of the board and navigating through the many complexities, but also opportunities over the last two years. We are delighted by your reappointment, Vic, and look forward to working with you to help unleash talent and innovation everywhere. Many thanks, Vic, for your dedication and superb service. And last, but definitely not the least, it's truly an honor to have worked with an amazing leader like Dr. Elna Chowa, both in my roles as a fellow NSB member and as NSF director. Her intellect, her dedication, and numerous contributions has clearly left an indelible impact in both NSB and NSF. I can say with certainty that she has been a leader by example for many of us. Throughout the last two years, Dr. Ochawa has provided steady, timely, and important advice to advance the agency. I could not have asked for a better partner in Dr. Ochoa and Dr. McCrary. Many thanks, Ellen, for your outstanding contributions and lifetime of public service. Thank you so much to all of you. You know, we are very grateful to you at NSF and thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ponch, for both the updates, but also the kudos to our members who are both leaving the board and also those returning. I also want to thank Alicia. I want to thank you, Erwin. I want to thank you, Sylvia, for these presentations and for the examples of the excellent research being funded by NSF. And, and thank you for your tireless efforts and, and all the preparation that goes into this, because I know this is something that takes a lot of your time, but 
on behalf of myself and the board and Ellen, we really appreciate the effort that you put into these. So with that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the activities of the chair. Uh, at this time, I'm going to talk about Chair Ellen Ochoa's activities since our February meeting. In March, Ellen attended a roundtable discussion between leaders of the University of Texas system, the National Science Board, and the National Science Foundation. She attended along with Suresh Babu and Director Ponchanathan and Archie Holmes, the University of Texas Executive Vice Chancellor. Our fellow NSB member, Heather Wilson, thank you, Heather, very, very, very much, was instrumental in making this event possible. The aim of the roundtable was to advance the nation's science and engineering enterprise. Discussion was focused on opportunities and challenges to developing STEM talent and to deliver research benefits to American taxpayers. Changes at the NSF in the coming years and characteristics of successful partnerships, such as the two-year colleges and four-year universities that expand science and engineering. Ellen described the board's role and our Vision 2030 goals. On March 15th, um, in my role as the vice chair, I addressed the Department of Energy's National Director Leadership Council on the board's Vision 2030, and a discussion ensued on developing the missing millions through the strategic partnerships, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with minority serving institutions, as the demographics have shifted in greatly from regions where these DOV facilities are located and from where they draw their technical workforce. This resulted in a follow-up meeting with former board member Jerry Richmond on April 1st on developing new strategies in this area in alignment with the board's activities. Uh, on March 23rd, I gave a presentation to the Department of Defense, UARC directors, UARC for those who don't know, or University Affiliated Research Centers, sponsored by the National Academies on Vision 2030 and particularly on talent. How do we develop domestic STEM talent? And new expanding uh, efforts to creating a STEM workforce for their ongoing mission requirements. For both DOE and DOD, the issues are at hand is they have to hire citizens that are, they have to hire US citizens. So how do we expand that workforce in those areas? Suggestions included more IRAD funded grants to MSIs, early engagement of middle and high school uh, students aspiring in uh, STEM careers, and for DAD and its entities to reach out and recruit just like they recruit for the service side. On March 29th, I was a speaker on a panel with NSF's Erwin Giancandini um, at the UIDP mission in motion conference in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, UIDP stands for University Industry Developing Partnerships. It's a spinoff from the National Academies Government University Industry Research Roundtable or Greer Group that many of you have been part of. And it's worked over a decade to facilitate university industry partnerships. Uh, so it was quite timely to see Irwin there and talk about TIP. Um, the Mission in Motion Conference uh, was especially trying to reach out and expand. So this was to bring HBCUs and other MSIs together. Presence were people like Amazon, Microsoft, and also NSF Steve, uh, Susan Margellis also attended the conference. So those have been the activities as well over the past year. I've given somewhere on the order of 30 to 40 presentations on Vision 2030 to things, people like the American Chemical Society, to Columbia University, to APLU. So right now, between that and talking about Vision 2030 and TIP, I think we have some momentum that is going forward. So I wanna thank everybody who's played a role in that. Are there, are there any questions before we move on? Just a, a, a compliment to what you do. I mean, 30 to 40 meetings is incredible. I think your chosen re reach out to underserved institutions, minority-based institutions, has been a fundamental element of our two years together. And I just salute what you and Ellen have done in terms of that outreach. Thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate it. Um, because we're a little behind, if, uh, if there are no questions, what I'd like to be able to, what I'd like to go to right now is to our panel. So today, we're pleased to continue our panel discussions around Vision 2030 about, and it's the geography of innovation is the theme. The May panel on the geography of May federal, of federal funding will shed light on the federal funding landscape across the nation. 
You know, some of us are very familiar with the federal funding that comes out of NSF, but we may not be familiar about, for example, what does the Department of Commerce do? What does, for example, the Department of Education do? What does uh, EPA actually do in terms of economic development? So this funding across the nation, individual states, and across institutional types. So with that, I'm very happy to say that I'm going to turn this over to Roger Beachy, who's put a lot of effort to lead this on. Roger? Uh, thanks, Vic. And, and I'm pleased to, to uh, introduce a panel that will help us understand more about where we are in this uh, challenge of, of uh, distributing innovation education uh, across the nation. Welcome to our panel and on the geography of, uh, of federal R&D funding. Before we start, I'd like to remind you to, uh, as board members and others in attendance, to please uh, turn off your cameras and mute your microphones during the presentation so that we have fewer interference uh, opportunities. Today's speakers will continue our panel series about the geography of innovation and ensuring that every American has the opportunity to participate in the SE enterprise, which requires the access to STEM education, innovation hubs and research institutions, and the associated financial investments required to build that enterprise. I, I'm happen to be, I'm privileged to be part of a subcommittee at the OSTP on looking at, at opportunities and, and examples of the expansion of these of hubs around the nation that other agencies have developed and how their impacts of those in different parts of our innovation industry. That's why I was so pleased when our former national board chair, Jose Maria Griffiths, agreed to moderate today's panel. Good morning, Jose Maria. She's president at Dakota State University in Madison, South Dakota. She has played a key role in the federal S&D space, not just on the board, but also as, as a previous board member, but also as part of the US President's in Information Technology Advisory Committee and the US National Commission on Libraries and Information Science. As Dakota State University President, uh, Jose Maria has overseen growth of, of applied research and development, entered in partnerships with, uh, with corporate and non-for-profits, as well as with government agencies and organizations and has participated in the state, regional and national conversation around workforce and economic development. Her many experiences add much to our knowledge and, our, and, and uh, provides a background for this panel. She also hosted one of the board's listening sessions in on her campus three years ago when we were developing Vision 2030, when I had a chance to meet uh, uh, Dr. Griffiths. So Jose Marie, thank you for moderating today's panel. We are looking forward to the presentations and uh, a robust discussion that will indeed follow. So I'll, I'll turn this over to you, Jose Marie. Thank, thank you, you, Roger. As NSB highlighted in Vision 2030 and its recently released Keystone Policy Brief, Access for every American to the science and engineering enterprise is essential to enhance our national security, maintain our global standing in innovation and technological developments, and capture the full breadth of American diversity of thought. The topic of today's panel is also extremely timely. Expanding the science and engineering capacity across the US and within states is not only a priority of the board, but also a priority of Congress, the administration, and NSF. There are multiple views on how best to do that. And the goal of today's panel is to, to bring to light the complexities of an uneven geography of federal R&D funding and to frame the problem in ways beyond simple dichotomies. The data and insights from our panelists will show the variety of barriers and opportunities to building the science and engineering capacity, both across the country and within states. Today's panel builds on the last three panels. In August, you heard how community colleges are essential for talent development in their communities. In December, panelists shared data on the uneven geography of K through 12 STEM education in the United States. And this past February, you heard from experts about what is required to build successful innovation partnerships. Today's panelists will discuss the geography of federal R&D funding an essential component to building US R&D capacity. Each panelist will speak for five minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. Our first panelist is Marcy Gallo, 
Marcy is an analyst in science and technology policy at the Congressional Research Service in DC. She focuses on a broad range of science and technology issues, including federally funded research and development centers, federal prices, defense research and development, and technology development and innovation. And today, Marcy will open our panel with a data-rich review of the federal R&D landscape across the entire nation. Our second panelist, Roger Wakimoto, may be familiar to some of you as the former NSF Assistant Director for Geosciences. Roger is the strong advocate for R&D spending for a wide variety of institution types. He's currently the Vice Chancellor for Research and Creative Activities at the University of California, Los Angeles. Roger also chairs the Association of Public Land Grant Universities Council on Research. He will speak today on how R&D dollars are distributed within states. Our third panelist is Cecilia Orphan, Director of Partnerships at the Alliance for Research on Regional Colleges and an Associate Professor of Higher Education at the University of Denver. Her research looks at how regional public universities and rural serving institutions promote equity and community well-being, and she'll speak today about their role in closing geographic research deserts. Our final panelist is Anna Quidder. Anna is the Assistant Vice President for Federal Relations for Northern Illinois University. She's Vice Chair of the American Physical Society Forum on Physics and Society, past president of the Science Coalition, and has held numerous leadership roles within the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities Council on Government Affairs. Anna will be talking about emerging research institutions and the vital role they play in the US science and engineering enterprise. At the end of the presentation, we will invite board members to turn their cameras back on and start the Q&A. I'll now turn to Marcy to start her presentation. Marcy. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, uh, Congress has long been concerned about the distribution of federal science and engineering funding. Uh, some members are focused on ensuring that R&D funding is allocate, allocated across the country as a whole, while others are focused on its distribution to groups underrepresented in STEM. Next slide, please. To start off today's panel and our discussion, I'm going to show you a series of maps to provide a common understanding of the geography of federal research and development funding. This first map shows the distribution of federal R&D obligations from fiscal year 2011 through 2019. The darker the shading, the more funding the state received. 13 states from Washington up on that list to your right ranked within the top 10 at least once and 14 states from Nebraska down, ranked in the bottom 10 at least once. The top two states, California and Maryland, accounted for between 24% and 29% of federal R&D funding each year. The top 10 states accounted for between 55% and 64% of federal R&D obligations. And the bottom 10 states accounted for around 1% of federal R&D funding each year. One caveat to note is that there is a portion of federal R&D obligations each year that is not tied to a specific state or location. That is, the federal agency is not reporting the place where the R&D is performed. This undistributed amount varied between 1% and 15% of federal R&D obligations between 2011 and 2019. Next slide, please. Here, we're gonna focus in on fiscal year 2019. The top left map shows the distribution of federal R&D obligations overall. The rest of the map show the distribution of federal R&D obligations by R&D performer type. I've lumped R&D performed by federal scientists and FFRDCs together because the work is occurring in government owned facilities. Um, that's the map in the top middle. Next is the distribution of federal R&D obligations performed by industry then by universities and colleges, other nonprofits, and state and local governments. Most federal R&D is performed by federal scientists, industry, or university researchers. The rank of some states stays the same regardless of R&D performer, for example, California. However, the rank of other states vary by R&D performer. For example, if we look at New Mexico, we see that it ranks in the middle or at the bottom of all R&D performer types except the intramural FFRDC category, where it's in the top 10. This suggests that the national labs are the primary driver of federal research investments in the state. 
If we look at Connecticut and Florida, we see that these states only rank in the top 10 in federal R&D performed by industry. And in a final example, if we look at Georgia and Michigan, we see that these states only rank in the top 10 for R&D performed by universities and colleges. If the National Science Board intends to expand the geography of innovation, it may need a variety of policies and programs depending on the needs and relative strengths of a given state. Next slide, please. Now I wanna focus in on the distribution of federal science and, and engineering obligations by institution type. As expected, R1 institutions account for the largest share of the $34 billion to universities, colleges, and nonprofits in fiscal year 2019 at nearly 76%. High enrollment Hispanic institutions accounted for approximately 13%. Four-year institutions with a special focus on medicine or other technical areas accounted for about 10%. R2 institutions for 7%, minority serving institutions for 3%, and HBCUs for less than 1%. It's important to note that some institutions fall under more than one classification and as such, their data is included in multiple categories. For example, the University of New Mexico is an R1 institution, a high enrollment Hispanic institution and a minority serving institution. Additionally, um, Morehouse School of Medicine is a four year special focus institution an HBCU and a minority serving institution. Thank you very much. That concludes my remarks. And I'll hand things over to Roger. Thank you, Marcy, appreciate it. Um, now, um, now we'll turn to uh, Cecilia. Oh, next, I'm sorry, next we have Roger, I apologize. Uh, Roger, as soon as your presentation is up, please go ahead. Yeah, be, uh, thank you very much. Before I start, I just wanna salute both Artie, Carl and Anila, people that I really worked closely together during my time at the National Science Foundation. So with that, I, I'm gonna be talking about federal R&D landscape states and focusing in on California. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a map you've already seen before. This is uh, from NCSCS of so federal R&D funding by state. Uh, pretty easy to understand. Darker green means more funding in that state. The progressively lighter green means less funding. So next slide. So what I've done here though is simply superimpose the locations of the R1 universities. Magenta circles represent public, uh, yellow triangles represent private. And although it's not perfect, there's a, there is a relationship between states that are darker green and the number of R1 universities in those states. Next slide. So starting to focus in on California, some of this information I didn't even know. We have 35 public institutions that receive federal R&D. Uh, we have 35 private institutions that receive uh, support. Uh, we have 10 AAU members, Association of American Universities, the so-called elite universities. Uh, there are 65 members in AAU. We have 16 APLU members, Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, 246 members of APLU. Now, if you start uh, looking at what has been defined as an emerging research institution, an ERI, and there are a couple definitions I've chosen, $35 million of R&D support or less, it turns out California has an amazing number of 52. I didn't even know this was that large. 21 are public institutions and 31 are private institutions. So uh, please click, move forward. Uh, let's see, federal funding across the nation. Public institutions receive about $54.8 billion, private institution, and this is in 2019, 28.9, about a two to one ratio between publics and privates. California largely mimics that, not exactly. Uh, public institutions bring in $7.4 billion of R&D. Private institutions bring in 3.1. And of course, the University of California is a massive system. We bring in 8% of the total R&D funding nationwide. And if you just look at California, we bring in nearly two thirds of the total funding. So please click. Uh, this is uh, diversity. I'm going to talk about this um, on this slide and also my last slide. I know Ponch refers to the missing million. Turns out five of the 10 UCs are Hispanic serving institutions. And UC Davis is literally on the doorstep and UCLA isn't too far behind. Uh, 
How about the California State Universities, a massive system in California? Nearly all of them are HSIs, 21 out of 23. And one final note, uh, we do have one historically black uh, graduate institution. It's, uh, for those who don't know, it's Charles Drew uh, University. So next slide. So I'm gonna end on some issues, hopefully to stimulate some discussion. Please click. Uh, how do we ensure that all emerging research institutes, e ERIs across the nation have the potential to in increase R&D support? Really the call for the need of geographic uh, diversity. And I wanna remind you all something I think you do know, and that is many underrepresented groups attend ERIs. So please click ahead. And how can R1s effectively partner with ERIs in order to strengthen their research programs, including infrastructure? I wanted to share a recent APL U survey uh, from the Council on Research, surveying all senior research officers or SROs. Turned out number five in priority was improved partnerships between R1s and R2s with ERIs. Please click. And then again, my last bullet here is on diversity. Uh, HSI designation, Hispanic serving designation. Uh, seven of the 65 AAU members are HSI. I think I counted one of the seventh as Davis since they're literally at the doorstep. Uh, just a reminder that some HSRs are major R1 universities. I'll point you to an article by Stephanie Smith last year seeking to serve or serve with a dollar sign, questioning whether some seek HSI status to uh, tap into federal funding. I want to applaud uh, Barbara Snyder at AAU. She has prioritized at a very high, high level research partnerships with HBCUs, and I strongly support her in doing that. And lastly, I want to comment very briefly about some legislative proposals, just two bullets. One is this one for NSF to pilot partnership programs. In other words, multi-institutional awards that are greater than $1 million must partner with an ERI. And I'll end with use-inspired research versus technology-driven research. I wanna just note that uh, in some uh, groups of underrepresented uh, minorities, like, like for example, Native Americans and tribal colleges, they're much more attracted to use-inspired research because I know they feel very strongly that the research must be brought back to the community to benefit those people uh, in that community. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, we'll now turn to Cecilia. Um, regional public universities grant 50% of all bachelor's degrees given by four-year publics and educate 49% of students of color attending all four-year publics. RPUs enroll large shares of first-generation college students, veterans, adults, immigrants, and low-income students, and are often their state's most affordable bachelor's degree. This slide shows Colorado's seven RPUs. You can spot RPUs because their name tells you which communities they serve. University of Northern Colorado, MSU Denver, Western Colorado. In California, they are the 23 CSU campuses. In New York, they're the SUNY and the CUNY schools. RPUs draw students from less than 100 miles away and are geographically distributed to ensure local post-secondary access. They contribute millions of dollars each year to local economies and train business leaders, researchers, teachers, public health professionals, and government officials who remain in the region after graduation. Because RPUs maintain accessible admissions practices, they foster greater upward mobility than any other post-secondary sector. RPUs also serve their communities by conducting applied research. The Alliance for Research on Regional Colleges, or ARC, has found that RPUs are particularly important to rural communities and host small business incubation centers and address employment shortages in those areas. <clears throat> this is a diverse sector. So RPUs span seven Carnegie classifications. Most are classified as master's degree granting institutions. Most four-year public MSIs were founded as regional public universities, and many RPUs are the emerging research universities that were just discussed that have gained reputations for applied research. RPUs are diverse because they have evolved to serve the unique needs of their students and communities, and no stu two student bodies and regions need the same things. Please change to the next slide. The next slide, please. 
Despite these important contributions, RPUs are underfunded relative to other institutional types. In Colorado, RPUs receive 36 cents to every dollar of public funding that goes to our state's land grant, flagship, and research universities, CU Boulder, CSU Fort Collins, and the School of Mines. This is why the simplest way to answer the question, what is an RPU, is to say that an RPU is whatever its region and students need it to be within the confines created by funding inequities. This graph shows some of the funding disparities. The blue lines are Colorado's R1s and the green lines are RPUs. The lines represent combined fun public funding across six sources, including federal R&D listed on the slide. RPUs receive on average $9,000 less in public funding per full-time enrollment across these sources. This creates a number of challenges. First, many R1s generate institutional revenue through indirect costs but RPUs aren't able to do so because they often receive fewer and smaller grants. Because of this, RPUs have underdeveloped research infrastructures. Second, RPUs are teaching focused and often unable to free up faculty time to pursue large grants. Graduate programs are often smaller and in professional fields, which means fewer graduate students to support research. Third, and probably most importantly, federal grants often entail complicated applications, which are difficult for RPUs to complete given staff shortages due to funding inequities and limited faculty time. While some RPUs successfully compete for NSF grants to develop diverse STEM talent, their potential as anchor institutions to support broad regional R&D has been unrealized. Next slide, please. What I want to state emphatically is that there is enormous untapped potential among RPUs to support the National Science Board's goal for the U.S. to remain a leader in innovation. RPUs are poised to deliver the benefits of research to their regions, many of which are rural. RPUs are not ivory towers. They are wholly immersed in their communities. RPUs have regional partnerships that could be better leveraged to produce R&D, but this is currently difficult to realize. Second, RPUs are important leverage points for developing diverse STEM talent. When RPU faculty do research, they often involve undergraduate students who are racially diverse and low income. And with improved funding, RPUs could better support these students in developing in-demand R&D skills. RPUs also train STEM K-12 teachers and conduct applied research to improve K-12 curricula. This is why investing in RPUs translates into significant investments in STEM talent development across the P-20 pipeline. Finally, RPUs exist to serve their regions. When we talk about expanding the geography of innovation, there's simply no better way to do so than to leverage the promise of RPUs to partner with regional industries, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations. So how can we do that? For the potential of RPUs to be realized, the barriers to pursuing federal R&D funding must be reduced. Planning and development grants could allow RPUs to develop research infrastructure, federal agency staff could support RPUs in applying for grants, and federal grants could be tailored to the regional service missions of RPUs. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, we now go over to Anna. Anna, our final panelist. Thank you. Today I will discuss emerging research institutions and minority serving institutions, which are two ways to define subsets of higher education institutions based on their research portfolio or student enrollment. Increasing geographic breadth of federal research investments is a consequence of utilizing these definitions. First, I'm gonna introduce my home institution for context. Northern Illinois University, known as NIU, is a public regional research university enrolling over 16,500 students in fall of 2020. NIU serves a diverse student body where 79% of undergraduate students are either students of color, Pell Grant recipients, or first generation college students. NIU's 2020 research portfolio is $25 million um, in annual research expenditures, including 8 million in federal funding, of which 2.1 million was from the National Science Foundation. NIU is one of 12 public universities located across Illinois, including nine regional public universities. Next slide, please. Emerging Research Institution, or ERI, is a new definition that encompasses NIU. 
While the exact definition is still working its way through legislation, the two key components are an institution must have an upper limit in the range of 35 million to 50 million for its annual federal research expenditures, and an institution must enroll undergraduate students. ERIs are in every state. Thanks to my colleagues at the American Physical Society for the graphs that I will walk through. These graphs depict an analysis of the 637 institutions that reported federal science and engineering research expenditures in fiscal year 2018. This analysis is helpful for understanding whether federal research investments are reaching a broad cross-section of institutions spanning the United States. Next slide. As shown in graph one, 139 institutions received 90% of federal research funding and nearly 500 ERIs collectively received only 10% of federal research funding. Next. Despite receiving nearly all of the nation's research funding um, that went to higher ed institutions, these top research institutions enroll less than half of all students. Next and only about one third of underrepresented minority students who attend one of these 637 research active institutions. Comparing graphs two and three reveals that ERIs enroll proportionately more underrepresented minority students compared to the top research institutions. Next. Nearly, and a nearly identical trend plays out for federal Pell Grant recipients who are the nation's most financially disadvantaged students. The story these graphs tell is that two thirds of our nation's underrepresented minority students or Pell Grant recipients attend research active institutions that see only about 10% of federal research dollars on their campuses. Fewer federal research dollars on campus means fewer campus-based research opportunities for students, many of whom are place bound and cannot leave their community to pursue research opportunities. Participation in research is considered a high impact practice for student retention and graduation and workforce preparation. The concentration of federal research support in a small number of the nation's higher education institutions prevent, presents a structural impediment to geographic diversification of the STEM talent pipeline. Next. The minority serving institution or MSI designation refers to the higher education institutions that meet the eligibility criteria for a suite of programs at the US Department of Education. Over the course of decades, new categories of MSIs were created to direct resources to institutions serving specific types of minority students who attend low cost institutions with high enrollment or financially needy students. Um, intentionality and care are essential when utilizing MSI definitions outside of their original context. As is the case with all definitions, there are limitations to the MSI designation, as I'll explain. Shown here are the minimum enrollment thresholds for various race ethnicities which correspond to MSI programs. For example, eligibility for the Hispanic Serving Institution Program requires a minimum undergraduate enrollment of 25% Hispanic students, and eligibility for the Predominantly Black Institution Program requires a minimum undergraduate enrollment of 40% Black students. Next slide. The most recent student enrollment data shows that there are institutions where over 50% of undergraduates are students of color, yet they are not MSI eligible. This includes 199 institutions that don't meet the minimum race ethnicity enrollment thresholds and 159 institutions that meet the race and ethnicity thresholds, but don't meet the cost or needy student criteria. Most of these excluded institutions are ERIs. Next slide. Presented here are the undergraduate enrollment data for Northern Illinois University and UNC Greensboro, two ERIs, which are not MSI eligible, despite being minority majority institutions. The Department of Education offers a waiver program for institutions that do not meet the needy student criteria or the cost of attendance criteria, but there is no process for securing a waiver for, the in, for an institution that serves a high percentage of students of color, yet does not meet the minimum threshold of enrollment for a specific race or ethnicity group. A number of current or proposed programs by the NSF other federal agencies and the administration that seek to expand race, ethnicity, diversity in STEM gives preference to or are only open to federally designated MSIs. Yet the MSI designation is not capturing the full spectrum of institutions that serve a high percentage of students of color, including NIU. Thank you for your time today and back to you, Dr. Griffiths.
Jose, Jose Marie, you, you're uh, still muted. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, thank our exceptional panelists for sharing their data and insights with us this morning. Thanking our panelists for sharing their data and insights. Their slides will be available on the NSB's website, as will a video of this panel session. So let's start the q and I'd like to ask the board members to please turn on their videos and then raise your virtual hand when you have a question. Anyone have a question? Mel, um, please, I think you're the first to uh, put your hand up. For me, I guess. Do you have any data indicating distribution of fields here? Physics, chemistry, agriculture? So the NSF does, the NC, NCSCS does have some data by fields. I don't believe it's broken down by state though. Um, so if you're looking um, for that geography, uh, I don't recall that they break the science, the field data also down by, by, by location. Okay, um, next I have Suresh B. So thank you very much. I don't know any one of the panelists can answer this question because one of the things indicated was the FFRDCs also get majority of the funding and how do they get distributed to other universities once they arrive in these national labs? Is there any uh, granularity of the data available so that we can see how the FFRDCs are playing a role in working with the HBCUs here and MSIs and other universities too? So I can I uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Roger. I was going to say I was former director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research, so that's an FFRDC. I that data is available because it, it is run by a university consortium, but uh, we don't have access to it right now. But that could be easily gotten because they keep very very detailed statistics about how the money is distributed and serving the university community. Thank you. Marcy, did you want to comment on that? Say from I was just going to say from sort of the broader perspective about you know agencies reporting you know money going to FFRDCs, you know it's it, the granularity may or may not be there depending on the federal agency, and so sort of the ability for the board to get some insight into sort of money that flows through FFRDCs and then back out, I think it's really going to depend on um, on the agency. Um, and, and so that could be a challenge. Thank you very much. I noticed um, during the uh, presentations that we had an active uh, comment session. Um, Dan, you put up an interesting comment about um, um, metrics. Would you like to uh, address that? Sure, the, the comment that I made was about, um, there was a large federal project several years ago that some of you may remember called uh, Star Metrics, and it was driven by trying to answer a question that uh, former um, um, OSTP director Jack Marburger asked, which was, I think, a really important science policy question, which is what fraction of GDP should an industrialized country invest in, in advanced R&D? Uh, it generated a bit of a political firestorm at the time when the question was asked, but it's a good scientific policy question. That project failed around, flailed around a good bit. Uh, and uh, uh, Suresh Karamella and I were both part of this when we were both VPRs uh, in the Big Ten. The Big Ten started a project uh, to pool all of their research expenditure data, not awards, but actual expenditures. So you can see actually where the data was spent, not where it was uh, awarded based on, on uh, headquarters location. Uh, and down even to the level of uh, counties, if you want to go down to that point. Uh, that project's now a nonprofit at the University of Michigan called IRIS. 
Uh, and the project's been opened up basically to any institution that wants to join. Uh, and there's some really interesting data there. It's since been expanded to fuse with uh, census data, and part of the idea there was to understand not just what the direct expenditure uh, impact was, but what the collateral effects were in terms of, of job creation uh, because of the investment in basic research. So it's an interesting project. It's incomplete because it only uh, it's only as good as the data from the member institutions, but it is an interesting place to look at a snapshot uh, that, that provides some insight into the impact of basic research. Thanks, Dan. Dan, that would give a, a, a different uh, a different view on on what's going on at a different level. Um, Suresh G, you're next with a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the data are amazing, and uh, I'm glad they'll be the slides will be posted. Um, I, I guess I have a philosophical question, perhaps, and I don't know if there's a direct answer, but we've been talking in the board about the geography of innovation, and I think this panel is titled "Geography of." Uh, federal funding. I was wondering if anyone wanted to comment on the correspondence between those two. Is, does the geography of innovation correspond to the geography of federal funding? And which is the chicken and which is the egg? Or at least what comes first? Thank you. I'd like to take a go at that. Well, I'll just state for, for California, I think there's a very close relationship between federal R&D and innovation. And, and I do believe the funding comes first, although there's a synergistic relationship that develops after that. But there's no question that without the federal R&D, we wouldn't be the innovation hub that we are. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just comment as well. So and if you look at US federal research investments broadly, the private sector is actually investing most of this, these resources. And so, you know, looking at the distribution of, you know, industry investment in R and D could, you know, potentially also shed some light onto, you know, sort of innovation broadly because they are innovating, they are contributing, they are active participants in the innovation ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Any other other panelists, Anna? Yes, I'd like to I'd like to comment on that as well. You know, I think that I, I was tuned into the meeting um, before our portion of it, and um, Ponch had said that um, that innovative ideas are everywhere, but opportunity should be everywhere, but isn't. And I think that you really hit on it where you asked about the chicken and the egg piece of it. Um, and I think that um, at Northern Illinois University, um, there's certainly uh, many innovative ideas and there's a lot of capacity for innovation, but it's hard to realize that, uh, that potential without funding to do so. And the federal government is uh, such an important partner and player in um, helping to convert innovative ideas into actual research projects and et cetera. So I think that it is, um, I would say that the innovation, in my opinion, is spread broadly, but it's a question of how do you have the infrastructure and the mechanics um, and you know the, the ability to harness getting resources um, to turn your innovative ideas into actual research. That, that's really, I think, where there's kind of that, that there can be a disconnect. And I would just add to what Anna just shared that many regional public universities are, they know very well what are the issues facing their local communities, where are the areas of strength and potential innovation. But again, because of the funding disparities that they face, um, it's very hard to realize that. So in, I can't remember who showed the slide of um, federal R&D funding by Carnegie classification, just 1.4% goes to master's degree granting institutions. And as I said, that captures most of the regional public universities. So even if you have a sense of the broader landscape surrounding your campus of potential innovation that could happen, and you don't have that kind of investment to help you be that anchor institution, it makes it very difficult to, to be a leverage point for innovation regionally. Okay, thanks, Cecilia. I have Victor, you're next. Yes, thank you, Jose Marie. Um, and this is probably to a question to both Marcy um, and some of your other panelists, particularly when you talked about the RPUs. So when you look at the map and you look at the investments and you see where they're going, if you believe that talent is distributed equally everywhere, but maybe access is not, how do you also lay on that looking at, like say technology commercialization? 
you know, and how do you do that? Some people look at it in terms of number of patents that have come out. Some people look at in terms of intellectual property disclosures. And to your point with the Northern Illinois, um, there's a lot of people who have a lot of great ideas there. But, for example, their sponsored program offices are understaffed. Uh, they don't have any technology commercialization. I just did a technology commercialization study for DOD, for MSIs. Um, can, can you also, with your map that you had, Marcy, also overlay numbers of patents and other things that are attributes to innovation and then be able to show where the gaps are? Because I think that would be compelling to some of the federal agencies who have large amounts of money, not only the federal R&D, but now what are the outputs that we're seeing from that? Yeah, you absolutely could take some of those outputs, um, patents, intellectual property, disclosures, things like that, and, and, and map those, um, you know, if the data is there and it's rich enough and, 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 and that could give you a sense. Uh, I'm sure someone at NCSES might be willing to do that kind of analysis for you. Um, um, it, it could show some insight in, into those sorts of things, um, but I'll let Anna talk about um, ERIs. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that that's a, that's a really great question. And um, so I know that there have been some recent efforts to try and understand the efficiency of innovation. So that's looking at how federal funding gets turned into or, or research funding um, in general. I don't know that it's just federal gets to, you know, how you translate that into how efficiently you can convert to things like patents and things like that. Um, I can send you a link to that study or I can follow up with the, with the board staff and make sure that gets to you. I will say that um, Northern Illinois University was rated um, of a mid-sized research institution. We were rated one of the most efficient, innovation efficient institutions in the nation um, for our ability to convert um, our funding portfolio into um, outputs of innovation. But I will send you, I will send you that link. So, uh, I'll just, I'll just, ahead, yeah, I just will add one other thing, although uh, Victor has raised a great, great point, and I do believe one metric is IP and tech transfer. I, I also want to uh, stress there's other metrics like the economic impact of the, the IP and tech transfer and the public good, for example, if you develop a, a, a drug. So I, I wouldn't focus just on those, although they are very important. There are other metrics that are equally important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, economic development, job development, and things like that will come into, into play. Um, I have Roger Beachy next. And just to let you know, I am paying attention to the hands going up. After you, Roger, I have Art, and then I have Panch. Thanks, Jose Marie. Uh, the, uh, this has really been a fascinating um, panel, and, and I appreciate all the comments. I, I, I'm especially struck by the RDUs and the, and the uh, em emergings and, and others, and wonder the role that, that an NSF can play in, for example, the new RFP that was just released on, uh, that, that, uh, that Ponce mentioned earlier today. What are the role, what's the role that, that what leadership role can institutions like commerce or like, um, like the NSF or DOE, how can we make this work? We've seen it really most efficiently to engage because we have this chicken and egg problem that was mentioned by several of us, um, several of you, and, on, on the discussion, and, and yet we want to see this happen, as, as Pond said, with speed and scale. Uh, but we're limited in, in, uh, in how, do we, how we do that because of the R1s and how they happen, and the, and the restriction of innovation going to the economic activity because of the lack of infrastructure of funding, for example, at a local R, uh, area where there's an RPU. And, and so how an, how an agency writes an RFP, a research a call for proposals for hubs, for example, is, is really critical uh, in, to, in, to uh, request an engagement. We, we have the challenge of not being a peanut butter institution, not to just spread spreads money around everywhere, but spreads it around in the right way to make the most impact. And uh, I think, we we have we've learned a lot today, but we have so many more questions that NCSES can help us add or, uh, answer and and your comments can. But my original my my first question here is or final question, I guess the only question is how can agencies make this work better? 
So I, you answered, I think, or gave some of the answer I would give in your, in your um, preamble to your question, but this for many RPUs, it boils down to infrastructure. They have one person, maybe one person, half time. That's their office of grants and sponsored research. So when we think about completing a complicated government agency R and D application for funding, it's just completely impossible. So that's where I wonder, and I think there are some agencies that do this, but are there developmental or planning grants that can be given so that they can build out that infrastructure that then they would be positioned better to go after funding. And then I am intrigued by the idea of R1s partnering with emerging research universities. I would say a lot of RPUs, there's um, there's um, cross-pollination there um, between those two sectors. Probably a lot of RPUs are also ERIs. So how can larger research institutions, particularly the public ones in the States, particularly ones like Colorado State University, um, one of our RPUs is part of that system. How can they partner and lend some of the, um, the research infrastructure that they have to support their RPU? Um, and that could happen in many systems across the country. So then how can government agencies incentivize those kind of partnerships? Um, that would be another way I could see that infrastructure being improved. I'd be curious to hear what Anna has to say as well, and Roger, given that they're steeped in the ERI work. Sure, do you, do you wanna well, go first, Roger? Go ahead, you wait, go first. Okay, uh, what, I'll just speak personally. I am so strongly supportive of trying to partner with ERIs to help them with their e infrastructure, but one must do so cautiously because for example, I, I'm happy uh, if I could just uh, snap my fingers and process research awards at UCLA for ERIs. But what is what, what I've been cautioned about is you take on that liability too. You take on the liability for that institution. So that's been the major thing that I've been trying to process in my brain. How do I get over that so that I can reach out and partner very effectively with, um, with ERIs? So just to let you know, these are real-time thoughts in my mind, but certainly the will is there. I, I, would love to partner with as many ERIs as possible. Yeah, and I would just say, um, you know, the data that I presented and that other panelists presented today show you that, um, you know, Roger, Roger Beachy, you had mentioned kind of a peanut butter model. I mean, to me, it seems like the United States is a piece of toast and there's, it's a very globby peanut butter model, right? You know, it's not evenly spread. Um, when you have 139 institutions that receive literally 90% of federal research funding um, against thousands of higher education institutions in the country, or even 500, you know, 640 that received any NSF funding reported in the HERD survey for FY 2018. So we're, we're not in a situation where I think we need to be worried about approaching a peanut butter model, right? It will take a lot of time and concerted effort to redirect even 10% of resources, um, you know, toward institutions that, that are emerging research institutions right now. Um, so this is definitely a marathon, not a sprint. And I think that on the partnership front, this is why um, myself and Roger and others have been, have been advocating for uh, partnerships because you, you can't just um, take an institution that, that isn't, you know, that's receiving, you know, like NIU, we're receiving $2 million a year um, in FY, the most recent HERD survey, we, where our NSF portfolio is $2 million a year. You couldn't just give us a $25 million grant you know, and expect overnight that that would be administered. I see uh, Dr. Griffiths, you know, nodding her head too. Um, don't, for my institution listening, of course, we would love to have a $25 million grant. I need to say that, but, um, but it, you know, there are some practical mechanics that have to be done to ramp up to shifting uh, the way that our research, our research resources are distributed across the nation. Um, and so the way that I've been talking about this um, is meaningful partnerships, because we also, you, you know, you're really right on uh, Roger Beachy with saying we have to be very thoughtful in how an agency incentivizes partnerships. You don't want to get into a situation where um, a partnership is required, so you end up with um, uh, a large institution coming to an ERI and saying, you know, we need a partner, so we've already baked the cake 
just sign here and, and we'll give you some money so that you're our partner. Um, you don't want to create that kind of uh, incentive structure. So I think that meaningful partnerships, and, and what does that look like? I think it could be, you know, commitments to uh, faculty exchanges to build capacity at the ERI. It could be commitment to student research opportunities, exchanges between the ERI and the, and the other, um, the R1 or the other lead institution. Um, I think it could be, um, you know, helping the ERI increase its capacity to, to do grants administration. Um, so I think there's a number of ways that a meaningful partnership could be structured. But I think that that's the key, that creating some expectations and meet around what a partnership is. And I would say, secondly, um, so we're, partnerships are great, but you have to find in other organizations, you have to find institutions to partner with. And so... How does um, how does a you know a UCLA learn about a Northern Illinois University or a University of Denver or a Dakota State? And so I think that the National Science Foundation could play a really important role and, and incredibly helpful role in facilitating connections among different types of institutions. You know, one of the wonderful things about the NSF portfolio is that it funds such a broad array of institutions. So finding a way to create almost like, a, like, I don't wanna say matchmaking, but finding a way to create a, um, a mechanism where you know, institutions that want to grow their partnerships can learn about the capacities of institutions that maybe aren't in their immediate, uh, immediate orbit or in their immediate geography. Um, and I think that that also, you know, I, I'm, I'm an astronomer by training and, you know, a lot of collaborations happen through your network. So that's another thing you see a lot of horizontal mixing in the research enterprise, but the vertical mixing of different types of institutions is um, not as prevalent. So that's another way that the NSF could really be helpful is facilitating kind of vertical mixing among the Carnegie classes of institutions, for example. Thanks, Anna. Can I one follow up? When you when you said there's two million dollars of NSF funding to you, are you including all the subcontracts or only the majors? One of the things that Marcy said is there's ten to fifteen percent unreported in the graphs that she showed because they're subcontracts or, or they're parts of bigger grants. Is that are the are the is that reflected in your two million dollars or only the award directly direct awards to uh, NIU? Um, so I'm reporting the publicly available data through the herd survey. Aha, uh -huh. um, um, it, it gets to the point that many of us have asked on the board before. How is the spread around? Who, who are the sub awardees? And we ha don't have that information yet. So I, I don't know how some of our policies can be made without knowing that information. So uh, thanks very much for confirmation. Yeah, thank you. Um, Artie, over to you. Uh, I'm going to say something controversial. <laughs> To, to support a research enterprise at a university, you need relatively low teaching loads. You need um, an office of, of uh, you know, sponsored contracts that can handle contracts effectively. You need an effective purchasing system, receiving system. It takes a great deal to do that. When I look at the discrepancy between the uh, RPU funding and the other funding, you can't help but suspect that that translates into higher teaching loads, into less infrastructure. Unless the states join us in this endeavor to uh, create a more homogeneous distribution, uh, the, the federal government can't handle the load on its own. Now, there's one thing where I'll back off from that, and that is, if you look at the institutions that are getting most of that money, either they're getting good state support or they have high endowments and high gifts. Part of the reason that, was high, that, that support is needed is that the federal government itself does not cover the cost of administering the grants that it provides, the cap on indirect cost rate. Now that tends to concentrate the research in those universities that can supplement the indirect cost income with gifts, uh, endowment or state support. Uh, the federal government should recognize that it's leading 
with its policies towards part of the problem and without our quit. I, I don't think it's controversial at all. You're stating facts. This is the reality that our pews exist in. And so it's kind of one of those things where wealth begets wealth when you're a wealthy institution with a large endowment. And I mean, Stanford University just got a $1.1 billion gift. Imagine if that had been spread across the 430 RPUs in the country, each would have received around 3 million. Um, and so it's these kind of compounding factors that create limitations on these institutions. So I absolutely agree. There's likely a role for federal state partnerships. Texas is a really interesting example. They had their emerging research university initiative that seems to be fairly successful. They devoted resources in combination with federal R&D funding to help support the, the creation of the research infrastructure in our RPUs across that state. So that's an interesting test case. Um, the other thing I would say is that a number of RPUs to try and address the teaching load issue that you raised, which is very real, um, have created research professor lines that have been trying to uh, mimic more of what an R1 research or professor's teaching load would look like. And there's been some success in that space because they've had more time and capacity to go after the large grants. Um, in those spaces, there have also been some additions to um, staff to support grants and sponsored research, but they're, you know, it's David and Goliath. <laughs> they're, they're just not able at this point, given these compounding funding inequities that come from private gifts, from state appropriations, from other types of federal funding, um, to make up that difference. And so, no, I don't think um, NSF can fix all of this, but I do think they have a role to play. I'm, can, I, can I jump in on I'm, that as well? Um, yeah. I just, um, Artie, I, I agree with what you've said and what Cecilia has said. And I think that that's, what, that's why one of the reasons that I showed the Pell recipient data for emerging research institutions. So two thirds of Pell recipients who attend a research active institution in the United States attend an emerging research institution. So you're starting from a student base that is um, you know, financially uh, behind many of the students that attend a non-emerging research institution. And so that has consequences for advancement and that type of thing. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that as well. Okay. Can Thank I you. just step in and say that in, in the, on a different issue, I have been strongly urging vast increases in the Pell Grant. Uh, it's just too low and should be returned to something like 70 to 90% of the cost of attending college. Thank you, we, we need that too. Um, uh, Panch, you're next. Thank you all, um, Jose Marie, Marcy, Roger, Cecilia, and Anna, great presentations. So I want to start with that first and great discussion, by the way. Um, I wanted to sort of turn this around a little bit. Um, you know, when Suresh asked the question about innovation, um, let's first start with innovators. Innovation happens because of innovators, okay? So which means that innovations, innovators need to be scaled, and that doesn't just happen only because of federal investments for research only. It goes through the entire spectrum. I was hoping to hear that uh, some of you weigh in on that too. It starts with a K-12 system, community college system. I mean, there are so many pathways for innovators. I mean, in my travels, I have found, for example, in Kansas the other day with um, Johnson's Community College, I was just amazed by the innovators that were there in the community college. So let's not forget that, which means that the education department, state and gov state government investments in education in K-12 Pell Grants, of course, was mentioned, and a whole host of others need to come together. So I just want to make that point first. The, uh, the agony that um, Cecilia and Anna started about not having the research infrastructure, I cannot agree with you more. And having seen that firsthand, what, how, what, it, what difference it, is, it makes. Since coming in, I'm happy to share with you that we are now launching a program called Granted, Growing Research Access for Nationally Transformative Equity and Diversity. It's a clever acronym. And uh, one of our um, fantastic ADs, uh, you know, Alicia Needler, who leads our Office of Integrative Activities, came up with the acronym, and Alicia has also got on the ground personal experience in this area. So I'm de delighted to report that this is targeted at providing a virtual research office for proposal development, pre-award, post-award kind of um, support that can be accessible for not only institutions that need it, but also individuals that need it. So I'm proud to say that we have launched it, and for the, in the FY23 budget request, 
we have asked for $50 million. And so all of you should um, you know, be mindful of uh, the fact that we are working towards that. The third thing that I want to talk about is partnerships. And I'm glad you mentioned the word partnerships and partnership with commerce, um, partnership between institutions. In fact, I have often in my comments said that it is not um, just enough an R1 institution leads. We have many programs at NSF, which essentially um, motivates and, uh, and encourages partnership from R2 and other MSI institutions, many programs, but we need to do more. But also what we need to happen, which I'm uh, you know, emphasizing, is that yes, R1 leads, R2 and ERIs can be partners, but it should flip and ERIs should lead and R1 should be partners. We need to get to that. And how do we get to that? Again, granted program and other mechanisms need to be at the level of intensity that can make possible leading happening from those kinds of institutions. And so that's about research partnerships and infrastructures that was talked about. And I would strongly encourage you to check out the Build and Broaden program by our fantastic Social Behavioral Economic Sciences Directorate. You know, uh, Kelly, uh, is, uh, Kelly is here. Uh, she reminded me about that. And thank you, Kelly, for all the work that you all do in SBE. And I think that's a great program. And I will leave with the last comment. Um, the BAA that was issued uh, two days ago, which I talked about on technology innovation partnerships, um, you know, Irvin will tell you that it is about equity for R1 and ERIs. And so I want you all to take note of that. So NSF is working hard at ensuring that innovators everywhere are inspired and enabled so that innovation can happen anywhere. Thank you, Panch. Congratulations on the granted. I'm sure we'll all be looking at that. We're running up against time. Vic, you had your hand up. You have a quick question, and then perhaps we'll have one answer before we finish. Well, actually, what I was going to do, talk to is uh, Cecilia, but I think Director Panch and Nathan has beat me to the punch in the sense that maybe while that is coming along, what many of the other organizations are doing, particularly like the HBCUs, there is a circle of VPRs, are working together because why should you go out in your RPUs and hire a technology commercialization expert for each one? That's particularly for your size. That's just too much redundancy. Can you think about organizing together to put together to do technology commercialization as well as people that can help you with post-award research administration? So I am so glad to hear that Director Punch Nathan has already beat me to the punch on that. Um, but I would say the next thing to do is now work with other agencies who are also doing that. So. NIH has a program called SPAD. Uh, even though I'm here for NSB, I'm gonna promote them because you all can get that and they will fund people in your sponsor program offices uh, and trying to promote biomedical research. And then the next thing I would ask you to do, because not only can NSF facilitate, but you can help facilitate us by bringing those people together for us and bringing them in the room. And with that, I want to say thank you, Jose Marie Griffiths, and to all the panelists for your timely expertise. I, this will surely inform the board as we move forward in our efforts to expand the geography of innovation. Roger, you have done it again. Thank you very much. The NSBO I, staff, I, Alex. Yeah, that's, I, wanted, I wanted to highlight the NSBO staff. And the NSBO staff, doing. Alexandra, Nadine, for coordinating and arranging this session. Um, this has been really fantastic. And we've gotten right back on time. We will take a coffee break for 10 minutes. We have, by the way, our award winners are out in the hallways. So if you have a chance, please meet them, talk to them. Let's get back here at 1255 because now we have some exciting presentations that are gonna be given in awardees. Mr. So, Chair, people asked about NSF pins. We have them here. Please take them. Coffee break. <laughs> We're making it happen. Trying to get out of here. Hey, look, I don't care. If any of the members who are on the Zoom remotely would like to go to the coffee room, uh, to the virtual coffee room, kind of let me know. This is really Yes, exactly. This is good pins. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. 
We are now going to turn to a very, very special panel with this year's Waterman and NSB Honorary Award winners. And let me just say on behalf of the entire board and on behalf of the NSB Chair, Ellen Ochoa, who can't be here today, congratulations to you all. NSB's Honorary Awards Committee Chair, Maureen Conduct, will moderate this session. So with that, Maureen, will you please take it away? Absolutely, thank you so much for listening. My microphone on. So it's my tremendous pleasure to, to meet with all of you today uh, and to moderate this session where we're, as, as the board, are gonna get a chance to learn a little bit more about you and about your exciting research and all of your achievements and accomplishments. Um, I'll begin with a very brief introduction, um, and then I'll invite each of you to, to just take a few minutes to tell us a little bit more about yourselves, what you do, and I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for questions um, from the board members. So I'll start with, as I said, very brief introductions. Our first Waterman Award winner is uh, Daniel Laramore from the University of Colorado Boulder, who combines mathematics and computation with real world data to create new models that provide answers to globally important questions about how best to administer a scarce vaccine, for example, and what role rapid testing might play in mitigating viral transmissions. Our second Waterman Award winner is Laura Thompson from the University of the District of Columbia, who uses assistive technologies, robotics, and other methodologies aimed at improving balance in elderly individuals and survivors of stroke. Her research examines how such technologies can increase balance confidence and reduce the risk of falling in these groups of individuals who are at high risk for, for significant injury should, should, should they fall. Our third Waterman Award winner is Jessica Tierney uh, from the University of Arizona, who has generated groundbreaking maps of past climate conditions and the system dynamics that produce to those conditions. So her research has redefined our understanding of global temperature, changes in the geologic past, and has developed new quantitative understandings of temperature and climate sensitivity to past levels of carbon dioxide. The NSB's Public Service Award winner is Betty Lees Anderson. She's an electrical and computer engineering professor at The Ohio State University. Since 2008, she has led a program that has reached 35,000 students at more than 100 schools, libraries, and after-school programs, and scout troops. <laughs> this program, which is free to the participants, delivers hands-on engineering activities to K-12 students throughout Central Ohio and beyond. Uh, NSP is also giving a public service award to the National Organization for Professional Advancement of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers, otherwise known as Nobuchi. Nobuchi's president, Rena Robinson, is with us here today representing her organization. Since its inception 50 years ago, Nobuchi has helped Black, African American, uh, and other minority students and professionals to fulfill their potential in academic, professional, philanthropic, and entrepreneurial endeavors across many different STEM fields. So it's a stellar panel, and I think we're all very, very honored to have you here and to learn more about uh, your, your work and yourselves. So I'd like to ask each of you just to take a few minutes, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. And I think, Daniel, let's start with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the microphone. Sir. Great. Uh, thank you so much, and thanks for, for having me here today. Um, as a point of background, um, I always liked science, um, but I came to academic research, I think, far later than many of my peers. Um, I worked in industry after an undergraduate in chemi at Washington University in St. Louis and really only discovered the joys of academic research during a professional master's program and immediately jumped into a PhD. Um, but by the time I realized that I love not just science, but research itself, I was far too late for the fellowships and scholarships, for instance, like the NSF GRFP, um, and found my way TAing um, throughout graduate school. Um, so this shapes the way that I recruit students currently. Um, there are many, many students who love science, but weren't brought into the world of research as sophomores in college. 
And so when I recruit students, I really think about that. Um, I think that we absolutely need on-ramps for these folks too, particularly if we hope to make good on our promises to broaden participation. Um, what we do at CU Boulder um, in the Computer Science Department and in the BioFrontiers Institute in my lab um, is work in three areas. Um, first, much of our work focuses on epidemiology um, for infectious diseases. And before the pandemic, we were working on the genomic epi of malaria. Um, but during the pandemic, we developed a privacy-preserving method to track crowding in campus buildings via Wi-Fi. We showed that a COVID test sensitivity was secondary to its frequency and the speed of results. Um, and we did the modeling to show that vaccines should be prioritized to the most vulnerable first, rather than going for a herd immunity first type approach. The best part of this work was to see its impact in practice. For instance, at my wedding last fall, we screened, we screened with, with rapid tests. And in fact, four of the guests um, got refunds on their flights and, and didn't come because they screened positive. And while we missed them at the event, it was wonderful to see that the science actually works and the predictions that, that we made were holding true in practice. The second big area for my lab is computational social science, answering social science questions at a large scale using data and computation. And much of this work may be of interest to folks in the room. It's in the science of science, where we try and understand the scientific ecosystem itself by studying its processes. For instance, a big focus is faculty hiring networks the flows between departments as they hire each other's doctoral graduates as faculty. And the characteristics of this market, um, its prestige hierarchies and its network structure are fascinating. We're also working toward analysis of how peer review works or doesn't, um, focused on the journal science and science advances. And this work has shown that in general, prestige shapes nearly everything in academia with clear effects on hiring, faculty representation, productivity, and the spread of ideas. The other computational social science work is a lot of fun. We look at the structure and dynamics of online dating platforms, as well as the role of specialization in dominance hierarchies um, within hockey fighters. Um, the only way that we can work on these diverse topics is the fact that everybody in the lab is bilingual. People speak mathematics, computation, and physics, and they speak biology or social science. And this creates a lot of very interesting conversations, and we set a culture of nobody ever knowing exactly um, their entire field in its entirety. But we make space for not knowing and then discovering and teaching each other. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity in the next few years to make continued progress in infectious disease. I think there's a lot of opportunity. That was the remix. Um, anyway, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up, but yeah. Um, in any case, I think there are a lot of great opportunities in the future study of infectious diseases, which have become incredibly relevant. Um, and we're also at the crossroads in the study of the scientific ecosystem itself with great new sources of data and, and computational tools. I think that's my cue to wrap things up, uh, Maureen. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for, for letting me be here, and um, I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Well, thank you, Daniel. That was fascinating, and what an amazing example of sort of cross-collaboration and cross-fertilization among, as you term it, bilingual, <laughs> bilingual scientists working on a, on a socially relevant uh, project. So we're going to turn to Lara, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your research. Sure. Um, so how did I first get interested in science and engineering? Well, from an early age, I enjoyed being creative, uh, problem solving, and always being outdoors. As a young kid, I was always outdoors doing things, building forts, riding bicycles. Um, and I also enjoyed tinkering, like building model airplanes, model cars. Uh, and most of that was encouraged by my parents. Both my parents are very hands-on. My dad in particular, with my siblings and I would have us build things around the house, fix things, but later that translated into engineering. Um, so I had a lot of extracurricular activities as well, which helped sculpt my character. Uh, but ultimately, I wanted to problem solve to do things that would help people. So that helped guide my academic um, I think it's the, the speak button on the, the mic down at the end. I think that's why it's doing that. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, maybe it's not. Uh, 
So as I grew and continued on my academic journey, I really wanted to use engineering to solve problems in human health, to ultimately help people. So what do I do and why? Uh, so at the University of the District of Columbia, I'm the founding director of the Biomedical Engineering Program. We're the uh, first and only ABET accredited Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering Program at an HBCU. Um, as the founding program director, I've created and taught multiple new courses and also was responsible for seeking out resources, for example, through grants and obtaining grants. And also as part of this, we created a new research laboratory, the Center for Biomechanical and Rehabilitation and Engineering. So in terms of research, I focus on human mobility and balance. So in particular, people with vestibular loss, so some of my previous research had to do with looking at the effects of different levels of vestibular impairment, including the effects of a vestibular prosthesis on non-human primate postural control and balance, and how we can improve that. And this impacts the over 8 million American adults with chronic balance impairment issues derived from vestibular dysfunction. Uh, I also am interested in working in, and currently working in aging individuals, uh, as you know, the aging population is rapidly growing, not just you know within the US, but also worldwide. So falls and imbalance in this particular population is something that's very relevant. And many of us have had a family member, parent, grandparent that has suffered a fall. Um, so I also look at survivors of stroke and their balance. And so there's, those are some of the populations that you know I work with in terms of research. Um, what do I want to do in the future? So the Alan C. Waterman Award will impact my capacity to do research in a broader range of populations. So for example, amputees and veterans that are in need of prosthetics. Um, another kind of side item that I'm working on is developing a new research facility at the university. Um, it's going to consist of multi, multiple laboratories focused on biomechanical and rehabilitation engineering. So the key areas or the core areas that we'll focus on are gait and balance, assistive robotics for rehabilitation, virtual reality rehabilitation, as well as biomechanics. Wonderful. Thank you for the, that fascinating summary. And, and speaking as someone who has had family members impacted by falling, I think it's an incredibly meaningful um, outreach, not just to those communities, but uh, to, to young researchers who are coming up in, in a a context where where they'll be highly motivated to, to make contributions. Thank you so much. So let's turn to Jessica. Um, again, in just a few minutes, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you're what you're working on? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm Jess Tierney. I'm from the University of Arizona, and I am an earth scientist, geoscientist, a climate scientist. You know, how did I get into earth science? Um, you know, like a lot of high school students, I had no exposure to earth science because it's still really unusual to have earth science taught in high school. So I didn't know that there was such a thing as that until I got to college. And um, I was interested in science, but didn't really want to choose between math or physics or, or anything like that. Um, so earth science is perfect because it's a little bit of everything. So we do math, we do physics, we do programming. Um, and, and even biology. And so it's an integrative science that really drew me in. Um, in particular, what I do is I'm a, I'm a paleoclimatologist, and that's a fancy word for someone who studies ancient climates. And the reason that um, I'm interested in studying ancient climates is because of climate change today. So I was first drawn into that because I have always been interested in history of people, and what I do is more like the history of Earth, and that seemed like a perfect sort of synergy for all of my interests academically. So how do we go back in time and reconstruct ancient climate change? It's, it's, it's pretty difficult. And so we have to use a lot of different kinds of tools to do that in my lab group. We do chemistry. So day to day, I'm an organic geochemist, and I actually do organic chemistry um, and we extract ancient uh, fossil fats, actually, from sediments that are up to millions of years old. And we can use those fats, believe it or not, to quantitatively reconstruct ancient temperatures, um, as well as changes in the water cycle. So a lot of my research has been focused on developing those methods and applying them um, on various different timescales from the last few thousand years back to 
100 million years ago. In addition, uh, we need to use climate models to understand ancient climates just like we use them for the future. The same models that we rely on to simulate end of century climate change can be asked to go back in time and simulate an ancient climate period. And those models will tell us more about the physics and the climate dynamics of ancient climate changes. Uh, we also need to use a lot of statistics to piece together the past because the evidence we have is sort of just in fits and starts. We don't have sediments everywhere recording climate changes everywhere we want to be. So a lot of our work has been developing statistical methods to take this sort of fragmentary evidence and then put it all together into these sort of full map view pictures of what climate looked like 20,000 years ago or, or 50 million years ago. So, um, and then, you know, more recently and kind of where our, our work is going in the future is how do we directly connect the record of ancient climate change to our future? I served as a lead author on the IPCC uh, AR6 Working Group 1 report in the water cycle chapter. And that experience really, uh, you know, got me thinking about how my work could connect to predicting climate in the next few decades. And while it might seem strange to think about how could a climate a million years ago inform where we're headed, in fact, we've had some really interesting findings along those lines. For example, we've discovered that climate models are essentially overtuned to the instrumental period. So when you ask them to simulate climates at high CO2, they all do sort of different things. That's a problem because we need to know what happens when we get to high CO2 levels. Uh, hopefully we won't get at super high CO2 levels, but we need to know. So by asking, actually benchmarking those models back in time through ancient warm climates, we can suddenly discover which models are more reliable than others. And that technique is just now sort of coming online and will likely inform the next round of climate assessment. So I anticipate that the, the Allen Waterman Ward will really allow us to start to make these more concrete connections between ancient climate and future climate change and hopefully inform um, our predictions for the end of the century. Thank you. So again, a fabulous example of a very integrated field that, that pulls in so many different relevant aspects to an incredibly important question that affects all of us. So um, brilliant work and, and a well-deserved award. So I'm going to turn now to um, to Betty Lees uh, to tell us more about yourself a little bit and about your, your um, incredible outreach. Sure. <clears throat> but first, Jessica, thank you for saving the world. Hurry up. <laughs> So my name is Betty Lisa Anderson. I'm an electrical engineering professor at The Ohio State University. Um, I got interested in engineering because my dad told me to. Uh, he was an electrical engineer and I grew up with science and all that stuff. And another thing that happened to me along the way was my dad worked at the university, so we lived near there. And the guy who lived next door to us was a professor in education. And he saw me playing with the younger kids in the neighborhood. And he says, I want you to be a teacher at my school. So while it was an experimental school. So while I was in high school, I actually went to high school in the mornings and then I was a teacher in the afternoons and that was a great experience for a couple of years. Well, fast forward to Ohio State. So uh, I got um, pegged to do outreach. The department chair said, hey, enrollments are down. And so I started an outreach program and I found out very quickly that schools did not want me to just come and talk to their kids. They wanted hands-on experience. And I realized that that was a lot of work because kids and stuff and you have to make it work and they can't fail and it has to be inexpensive and all these things. And so uh, so what I decided to do was I ran a capstone design class because I was teaching it anyway. So I said, OK, you kids, your team's job is to come up with a really cool engineering project it has to be engineering, not just science. And I'm going to assign you to the school and you're going to work with the teacher and that teacher is going to give you feedback during the semester. And the feedback was always, whatever time you think it's going to take, it's going to take three times that much. Mm -hmm. And then they would prepare their materials and develop the presentation and the, all that stuff. And then they would go back to the school and lead their projects with the kids at that school and, and get feedback and stuff. Well, that was a huge success because it turned out that our students loved doing that. They were all over it. And uh, so, uh, we, and we started with high schools because enrollments were down. We want to recruit people. Uh, that, that didn't work. Um, 
But the high school teachers started talking to the middle school teachers. And so then the middle school teacher said, hey, can you come and do something with us? Were there a, yeah, we can probably extend this to middle school. And then the middle school teachers talked to their friends in the elementary schools. And you can see where this is headed. All of a sudden, preschools are saying, what can you come and do for an engineering experiment with our kids? And, ah. So <clears throat> what we did, we eventually developed all these projects. And ironically, we do this for anybody who asks. So all you got to do is email me and we'll set a date and pick a project you tell me how many kids we bring all the stuff it's paid for by alumni donations and by our department who gets it and uh, we just take all the stuff out there we get volunteer students and we go and we lead the projects and uh, we develop new ones and so forth and it's interesting the the people who ask we're learning a lot we're going to a lot of schools that are very different from the schools that i went to you know I'm a suburban white kid and uh, we're going to schools where if the there's a student sleeping on the floor and a teacher says, just don't worry about it, leave it be. Then I know they have a reason and that kid needs to be sleeping because who knows? N none of my business, but these teachers are facing a lot of things. Sometimes we get invited to schools like we got invited to, oh, we get invited to schools that um, are for students with learning disabilities. And some of those kids, maybe not so good in a traditional classroom, but you give them stuff and they are all over building it and making it go and it's a really profound experience for them. Sometimes we get invited to schools where not everybody speaks English. I remember one class in particular was all immigrants and no two kids in the class spoke the same language. That was, that was amazing. We did everything by pantomime and drawings and going, running around and showing people how to do it. I don't know if they got anything out of it or not, but those people are going to join the workforce sooner or later, so they have to know this stuff. And so the program has expanded. The students who do this uh, think it's so great that when they graduate, they say, can I stay on your volunteer list? Can you send me the materials? And I'll do this in my community in Dayton or what have you. And uh, so we have a lot of alumni who help. And then the uh, engineers in Columbus who are working in industry near there, they get wind of it and they volunteer. So the, it just keeps growing. That's how we reach 35,000 students is because everybody is helping them. That's the Reader's Digest condensed version. <laughs> that was a great Reader's Digest condensed version. And it's also just so inspirational to hear how this has grown just because of the love of teaching and, and you know, people who really wanted to bring people into the joy of science and engineering. That is just such a phenomenal accomplishment. Last but certainly not least, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna turn to Rena. Again, just a few minutes about your organization, about Nobushe, and a little bit about yourself um, as its current president. Thank you, um, and thank you for taking the time to recognize not only the importance of science research, but the importance of supporting the science through people. Um, so I'm Renee Robinson. I'm an associate professor of chemistry and neurology at Vanderbilt University. And I was first introduced to science through programs that occurred during the summer when I was in elementary, middle, and high school. <laughs> and so I was always exposed to math and science. Um, I was in environments where math and science were pushed and we were always um, driven to accelerate to the next level of math and science in the year preceding where we should be. So in middle school, I was already thinking about calculus. And what was special about the programs that I was in is that they were specific for underrepresented students. And so I was um, in programs where I was around other African-American black students. I was around Hispanic and Latino students and Native American students. And so I've always seen that there are opportunities um, and that there is this tremendous talent in people that look like me um, in those spaces. But it wasn't until I continued to navigate my career and go through undergraduate and graduate school that I didn't see as many individuals that look like myself. And I especially did not see that in the representation in terms of who was teaching um, the science, the chemistry, the math, and all those sorts of things that I was learning. That necessarily didn't bother me at that time, though, because graduate school and undergraduate research all have enough problems of their own and enough rigor, and so I just continue to press forward with science. Um, as I navigated my career, uh, just like one of the other panelists, I really wanted to work on uh, problems that help people, and so I have research um, that focuses on Alzheimer's disease and health disparities therein. But what I really um, found value in, in terms of pursuing a career in academia, was the opportunity to serve and to try to provide 
provide opportunities for students that look like me who didn't get to see um, diverse representation. bothered me so much so um, that I decided to uh, be a part of different organizations like Nobuche. Uh, as a grad, I see um, just a tremendous number of underrepresented professionals and scientists all in the same space. And that did my soul <laughs> well. Um, not only was I inspired and encouraged by seeing other individuals that looked like me that were doing tremendous science, um, I also found community. I also found a sense of belonging, and I felt like I could continue to pursue my academic endeavors. And so I charted chapters in um, graduate school at Indiana University. I charted chapters at the University of Kentucky when I became a postdoc. When I started at the University of Pittsburgh, I charted a chapter, um, served as an advisor. I do that at Vanderbilt. Um, and what's critical about what we do as an organization is that from our local chapters in Nobuche to the national work that we do, we really have built this strong sense of community and family for underrepresented students. Um, we have chapters such as chapters at The Ohio State University who are tremendous at grabbing students before they even get to campus when they decide that they want to go to The Ohio State University and major in chemistry or pursue their graduate program. There are groups of students who are there waiting to receive them to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks through these graduate programs. We have chapters who give back at the K through 12 level. And so one of the wonderful things that I've been able to do is to do outreach where you do have to figure out how to make things work and you have to be uh, entertaining. But the joy that you get from seeing students uh, make slime or whatever it is that you expose them to is just tremendous. Um, as a national organization, we uh, have opportunities to pour into middle and high school students and to nurture them. And and so we uh, conduct a STEM Bowl that occurs annually each year where we have students who compete from all over the country. And these students know more than I do as a scientist. Not only do they know the great scientists and inventors across STEM, but they can tell you all about climate change and chemical reactions and you name it. So we have programming that we do at the K through 12 level. We support our undergraduate students. So we have um, chapters and work that's done to make sure that there's community um, that takes place on campuses across the country, that there's professional development opportunities. Um, and as our you know, scientists continue to navigate their career, what's really important is making sure that not only do they have opportunities, but that they also have access to know what some of the unwritten rules of science and academia in these organizations are. And so we create spaces for our membership to be able to know what those unwritten rules are and to be successful in what they do. And so I'm happy to share more about all the kinds of things that we do at Nobuche, but I think um, what's been really important for me in my growth is just being able to have an opportunity to serve in this capacity capacity. And what we're really thinking about right now and as an organization it is how to um, fully scale the impact that we have from K through 12 to our professional sciences. Um, how do we sustain the work that we're doing locally as well as nationally? And what does that look like? As well as how do we just continue to support and build a community that allows us to have diverse talent in all of the spaces that all of us sit um, in terms of science? Wow, <laughs> that is such a such a great story and such a great summary for an organization that does so many different things to support people at so many different levels. So I want to thank all of you for um, these these really compelling um, short snapshots of yourself and the important work that you do. This evening at the awards ceremony, we will debut um, a series of short videos. Uh, about each of you, um, so be prepared to be embarrassed. <laughs> um, the videos will also soon be available online, so that will expand to national embarrassment, but um, well-deserved. Uh, I'd like to now open um, open this panel up for questions um, from, from the board, and I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative by asking the first question um, of, of uh, Betty Lisa. Uh, you, your work speaks so strongly to something that's so dear to my heart, which is trying to recruit diverse individuals to, to science. And you work with such a large population of people from children from all over, many different kinds of backgrounds. Um, do you have any, any messages you can give us, any, any general observations about things that really works to get kids excited about science and engineering? I can say, <clears throat> that what gets kids excited about science and engineering, I think, based on my experience, is they build something and it works and they get to keep it. I think that's the huge thing. Does it 
bring them into the engineering profession, I have no way to know. I can't measure that because most of them I only see once. But, you know, I can see it in their faces. I built this. It works. Hey, listen, my speaker is playing. That's, even, if, even if they don't say, hey, now I'm going to be an engineer or scientist, maybe they say, hey, I can do stuff. Yeah, that that ability to to bring something into reality is is such a powerful, compelling thing for people, and I think particularly for children. I mean, kids often feel unempowered. Uh, adults tell them what to do. Television tells them what to do. Their peers tell them what to do. So being able to actually produce something um, and manifest power in reality is is a really great hook. So I'm going to open it up to the to the board. Questions? There are hands raised. Okay, there are hands raised. So. Um, Julia. Thank you. Um, so, yes, a wonderful set of um, little snapshots, and um, I could talk to you all for hours. Um, I'm addressing my question primarily to the three Waterman Award winners um, because it was really striking to me how each of you is crossing traditional disciplinary boundaries. And um, while we've had incredibly impressive Waterman winners before. Well, we've never had three, but I don't think we've ever had all of them that have so obviously crossed the boundaries. And so I'm just w wondering, you know, first the question about, you know, how does one approach becoming bilingual or trilingual, depending on, on what you're going after, and, and what you see as sort of the future of science and engineering going forward uh, and the structure in academia. I, I just think that's a really interesting topic. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I think one of the keys is to whichever languages you want to go on to to learn, um, learn one really well first, and then step into the second or step into the third. Um, I think for for folks who go too broad too early, it's difficult to really gain traction and understand the roots of the kinds of problems that you're trying to solve. Um, you know, particularly in, in a field like computer science or in applied mathematics, where there's just such a deep bench of history there, problems that have come up many, many times in the past under different names, um, in different contexts, to know that history is really important to then go to try to transpose those ideas into social science or into infectious diseases or into paleoclimatology. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that that, that uh, depth is really important first and then to bridge. So I have a really broad engineering background. I think my core is in mechanical engineering. So I have a degree in mechanical engineering, but also I went on to pursue aeronautical engineering and then my PhD in biomedical. But you bring all those tools together when you're solving problems, like for example, tied to human health. So you bring all those skills, all that knowledge to solve and address a problem. So biomedical engineering itself is very multidisciplinary and there's many different areas, but I think that's kind of where the future is headed because we're trying to solve these problems. We're gonna need all the tools and skill sets that we can get to, you know, to solve them. So um, yeah, for me, I actually credit a liberal arts education. So um, I think that what helped me see problems outside disciplinary boundaries is actually having a really also having taken many classes in actual in in non-science fields, in history, in politics, in sociology, uh, and that just happened to be how my college years panned out. So it was just sort of by accident. But I do see teaching a lot of students these days, and my students um, who just go through college with only taking science classes um, sometimes don't aren't able to connect to the social dimension. So. Um, I mean, I agree with Daniel that at some level you have to go deep and maybe in your graduate stu studies especially go deep on one thing. I actually um, like to encourage my students to think broadly from the start and um, both because it starts to reveal connections that you might not see if you're only thinking about I'm only going to work in geoscience or organic chemistry or something like that. Um, I think also I spent 
you know, a number of years working in the soft money area. And I think just you, you kind of are forced to broaden out to see like, well, what can I do with my talents and like, who can I work with to think of sort of creative ideas outside of my comfort zone? Um, and that also sort of opened these possibilities about, you know, hopping across disciplinary boundaries. Wow, from three very different areas, um, a lot of wisdom. Um, Suresh Babu. We can't hear you, Suresh. <laughs> but he's very excited. Oh, dear. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, mail Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Could you? Oh, well, no. Go ahead, Suresh. Oh, no. <laughs> now you're lost again. <laughs> Could you give me a more specific I, example of the connection you made, Jessica, between liberal arts and sciences? Um, sure. Um, I think um, when you think about the concept, well, there's several things. So one is the concept of, of geology and stratigraphy in of itself is actually kind of a philosophical concept. So you have a archive of history that is written in mud and in sediments and is incomplete. And you only have snapshots of certain things. And so you don't ever see the full story. It's a bit like Plato's cave, yeah? Um, and so you never see the whole thing. You only see parts of it and pieces of the puzzle. And on top of that, there are certain biases in how that record is represented in geological space. So it's not unlike how we understand our own, you know, per, our history as humans, what we know about our past, what's written down. What's written down is biased in terms of who were the writers, who's represented in the historical record. Not everybody. There are actors who don't appear, who are, who are less represented. And so we actually have the same kinds of problems that we have um, in geology that we have in philosophy, for example. Um, so that would be one example. And... You know, I think ultimately, um, on a totally different tack, you know, teaching climate change to students, to to young, you know, the next generation who's, they're, they're basically panicked about it, and um, they want to understand, but they're also afraid. And there's this very, like, visceral, you know, it's a difficult thing to teach and, and not end up, you know, I try and do my best not to, to be a doomsday about it. Like, you know, this isn't over. This story isn't over. But I feel like I have to really rely on, you know, what my colleagues think about, you know, cognition and cognitive ability and, and, and philosophy and teaching when I teach students about climate change. Suresh, are you back now? Yeah, I can. Uh, I hope I can uh, communicate right now. You can hear me. Now. Okay. Yes, so we have, can hear you. Thank you. Uh, question for Dan. So one of the things which caught my attention, Dan went from uh, being an academic go to went to the industry and came back. How much that influences the, his ability to uh, get other people involved in cross-disciplinary science and education uh, interaction with the industries also? Can you comment on that, please? Um, I think that we're in a time where there's a lot of focus on filter bubbles. And, and being in your own bubble. And to cut right to it, I think that if one has worked in industry where you have a very interesting idea, and I'm sorry, but we release software every six months and your great idea won't make it into the next software release, you know, try again in six months, um, when there are these kinds of brass tax decisions, um, you realize that there are different ways of decision making, different ways of uh, looking at priorities, different ways of slicing problems. And so I, I feel that um, those students who spend some time in industry just get a different and, and broader perspective on, on science. They're, they're less focused on um, sort of the academic take on science and more thinking about what can science do and how do we actually reach people? How do we build products that work, um, that people can use? Um, so I, that's, what, that's what comes to mind. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, I actually had a question for, for Renam. Um, 
you know, we we as a board have recently articulated the vision 2030, um, our views of what we'd like to see happen in science and engineering. And I'd really love your perspective on, on are there any specific things or goals or targets that you would like to see um, nationally for us to accomplish or for your organization to accomplish um, in the next, you know, eight to 10 years? <laughs> Absolutely. I think, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversation over the last couple of decades about how to increase the talent pipeline, how to have more diversity, how to have more equity inclusion. But I think we really need to move towards normalizing diversity, equity and inclusion. And that looks a little bit different in terms of how we support diverse scientists instead of being an add on and a supplement. Uh, that should just be kind of a primary thing. <laughs> um, so that's a tangible, simple thing. Um, in terms of how we build community, um, I think that needs to be a focus in all the different environments that diverse scientists sit from, you know, the schools that they're in um, as student elementary school, middle school students to where they are at in their professions. Um, I also think that we have to look at really leveraging different types of partnerships to make sure that we're reaching uh, students. And so as we speak across industry and academia and government, we all have similar goals of wanting to have a diverse talent pipeline towards the ultimate goal of what we're doing with science um, and how it impacts us. And so we need to have more of those types of conversations and partnerships that go across these different sectors of the scientific enterprise. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do as an organization is to take the concerns and the motivations of different types of partners, whether they come from biotechnology companies or they come from academic universities or national labs who, who ultimately all are trying to achieve the same thing, <laughs> which is a part of the 2030 vision. Um, but really, how do we do this together? And how do we not only develop effective programs, but how do we make sure that the, the pipeline is going to be sustained? And so I really think thinking outside of our individual sectors and boxes is going to be necessary for us to all see what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Well, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Are there other other questions from the board? Well, if if not, um, I want to thank all of our panelists for a really, really compelling presentation today and for making yourselves available to us for uh, learning more about what you do and um, for doing uh, for answering all of our all of our many questions, <laughs> which I'm sure we will continue to to approach you. Um, thank you so much. And could we give could we give our panelists a round of applause? Well, thank you all. And I want to tell you, at this point, we're going to take a 60-minute lunch break, during which we have a real nice program, because not only has NSB and NSF provided us a good lunch, but you're going to meet with some of these folks at your table and get a chance to talk with them. So you're going to meet with the awardees and the executive leadership team. We'll reconvene this open session at 2.40 p.m. Eastern Time. Please join us then for a discussion with Dr. Rick Spinrad, who's the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmospheres at NOAA. And after that, we will see reports from the NSB committees and working groups, which will take us through the end of the day. So with that, lunch is served. Get to know these people. They've got some great ideas. And I will see everybody back here at 2.40. Members who are remote, I'm happy to put you. Welcome back, everyone, and I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. As I mentioned before the lunch break, this next opening session will include a presentation and discussion from Dr. Rick Spinrad. Dr. Spinrad is the Undersecretary of Com Commerce for Oceans and Applet atmospheres at, and the NOAA administrator and is responsible for the strategic direction and oversight of the agency. And it's over 12,000 employees, including developing NOAA's portfolio of products and services and creating a more inclusive workforce. His bio is included in the board book for your reference. Ellen and Director Ponthus Nation extended a joint invitation to Dr. Spinrad, given NSF's emphasis on ensuring that basic research 
we fund benefits to taxpayers who support it, including through partnerships with mission agencies. We thought that NSB would benefit from a better understanding of NOAA's current priorities and collaborations between NSF and NOAA. We're also, as a board, interested in learning about NOAA's strategies and approaches to broadening participation and advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility within NOAA's workforce and how we can work together to nurture talent throughout science and the engineering ecosystem. On behalf of NSB, we are pleased that he was able to join with us today and we're looking forward to our discussion. And now I will turn it over to Director Punch Nathan for his introduction. Thank you, uh, Dr. McCready. I'm delighted to introduce a, a friend and an outstanding leader, Dr. Rick Spindrad, the Undersecretary for Oceans and Atmosphere at the Department of Commerce and the 11th Administrator of the National Oceanograph Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration, NOAA. Dr. Spindrad's career spans both the federal government, the private sector, and the academy, exemplifying the importance of all these pathways to enhance cross-sector partnership. In addition to his current appointment, Dr. Spindrad had previously served in leadership positions at the Office of Naval Research, where his focus was on meteorological research and operations and developing priorities for U.S. Navy investment of oceanographic products for fleet operations. His work also extends to the private sector, where he was the president of SeaTech Inc. More, re more recently, he was the vice president of research at Oregon State University, where we are also colleagues, fellow colleagues uh, as vice VPRs. NOAA and NSF remain close in many ways, and I'm particularly excited about the MOU that NSF and NOAA signed in February of this year. Through this collaboration, we will be able to coordinate on the development and support of research activities and facilities. In the near term, our priority will be climate science with a focus on accelerating the transition from research outcomes to operations, from operations back to research. As we seek to improve the management and preservation of natural resources, it is important that the research process plays a role in decision-making or research to operations R2O and that operational needs are built into research agendas or operations to research O2R. Dr. Spindrad, myself, and senior scientists from both of our agencies will be accelerating this process for meteorological services and science through the Interagency Council for Advancing Meteorological Services, or ICAMS, which spans 25 plus agencies. Dr. Spindrad and I meet quarterly on our shared priorities, including STEM education pathways, collaboration with NSF AI institutes, and building a better understanding on how to increase resilience in the phases, phase of increasing wildfire, drought, flooding, extreme heat, and coastal weather-based events. In the context of NSB's 2030 vision and NSF's increased emphasis on linking curiosity-driven and user-inspired research, we are looking forward to an expanded and synergistic partnership with NOAA well into the future. We are very much looking forward to hearing today about NOAA's strategic R&D priorities. Rick, on behalf of the National Science Board and NSF, I'm delighted to welcome you, my friend, to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ponch. It really is my honor. And uh, thank you to the membership of the NSB and Dr. Ochoa uh, for this inv invitation to come speak today. I can assure you it's been a long time since the NOAA administrator uh, has shared some time with the NSB because we have not had a confirmed NOAA administrator for at least five years. Uh, my confirmation last June uh, represented an interesting uh, approach for, for NOAA. If you look at my background, you'll see I am uh, the first NOAA administrator who actually served as a career scientist at NOAA in previous stints. And so uh, part of my argument to Secretary Raimondo when I was initially discussing coming back into the government was that I felt I could hit the ground running. Uh, and for me at NOAA, this meant uh, not just the internal workings of the agency, but also understanding the dynamics of working with our partners uh, like NSF. And so I was particularly delighted to uh, really start uh, very quickly in what is turning out to be a uh, budding relationship with Ponch and with all of NSF. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of the perspectives. Uh, as you just heard from Ponch, we do have an MOA that we signed uh, just a couple of months ago. I'll say a little bit uh, more uh, in a moment on that, but it's a particularly exciting development. And the way we've crafted it, it's uh, a very broad agreement and is going to allow us to be nimble, I think, adaptable, and uh, work any number of issues. So the the other aspect of this is that this kind of dialogue comes at a particularly special time when I would say the senior levels in the Biden administration really want to push uh, the science agenda from a number of different directions. You all have seen evidence of that in legislative activity, certainly in what's happening at NSF. And I hope that in the few minutes I've got to share with you, I can give you some sense of how that's manifesting 
uh, within NOAA. A couple of the things that I'm trying to do at a very high level within NOAA are uh, build a much stronger culture of innovation uh, and also uh, change our uh, culture, if you will, with respect to risk tolerance uh, in terms of what we will invest in to translate to the operational domain. So this really is a very exciting time for us at NOAA. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking to you again at a strategic level about the priorities that I have expressed that are now manifesting in things like our FY23 budget, which has landed it on the Hill uh, a few weeks back. I have identified three key areas and the fundamental difference from what you might have seen with NOAA in the past is that traditionally we would talk about, and I hate to even use these terms now, the wet side and the dry side. We would talk about what's happening in fisheries separately from what's happening in the weather service, separately from what's happening in the National Ocean Service. I have made a very strong push around the earth system, earth system science, earth system stewardship, earth system service. And let me start first by saying, as you've heard a lot from the Biden-Harris administration, there's an equity element to what we're doing that is going to fundamentally reorient a lot of our work. So we are looking at equity in, in, in a sense as, as if it were a lens. And the lens can be pointed externally, where we will be not just providing products and services in a more equitable manner, but also co-developing those products and services. So that takes a variety of flavors. We've been conducting uh, climate inequity roundtables around the country, not just geographically diverse, but also focused on different issues. So in the Southwest, it was focused on drought. In the upper Mississippi River Basin, it was focused on flooding, et cetera, throughout the country. And have used these to try to identify where there are needs that we are currently not serving, where there are products and services we need to be developing a little bit more aggressively. And as I said, it's about co-development. So you'll hear a lot of discussion about the use of indigenous knowledge. Uh, we have in fact uh, hired and built into our senior level uh, team, uh, tribal engagement specialist who happens to be a PhD in fisheries biology. And that's reflective of how we wanna start the dialogue early, especially with tribal entities to make sure that we're developing the products that are most needed um, and taking advantage of things like indigenous knowledge. But that same lens can be turned internally and it, it uh, takes the shape of really emphasizing uh, diversity, equity, inclusion in the workforce. The environmental sciences are historically behind the eight ball, if you will, with respect to addressing diversification. Uh, and so we're trying to find ways to make use of existing programs that we have uh, with the academic community to uh, accelerate bringing bright young people from much more diverse backgrounds into the workforce. I am very proud to say that I'm using uh, the flexibility that I have in building a political team at NOAA to demonstrate how we will do that. 80% uh, of the political team that I brought in is women, uh, over 50% is people of color. Uh, and I would say that I think our political team is, if not the best, one of the best NOAA has, has, has ever seen. Another prior priority we're building is to demonstrate, after all we sit in the Department of Commerce, that we can effectively uh, assure that we are the environmental stewards, many of us know us as, as well as encouraging a robust and aggressive economic development agenda. A lot of that is gonna take the form of what I call the new blue economy, which is that economic development built around data, information, and knowledge. The traditional blue economy is one that all too often is expressed in terms of extractable goods, fish, uh, oil and gas, sand and gravel from the ocean. And we will continue to work on building those and sustaining those. But at the same time, there's an economy that can be built out of the information that is now coming from the ocean, not dissimilar to what's happened in the commercial weather enterprise, for example, which over the last 40 or 50 years has evolved to about a $10 billion economic sector. It's our belief that if you look at economic development, not just in the new blue economy, but in the climate services sector, and I'll say a little bit more, more about the climate agenda, that is potentially a $100 billion industry. We believe uh, we are well positioned to foster that development. And oh, by the way, this is where our uh, embedding in the Department of Commerce comes in 
to be particularly useful because we're certainly going to leverage our sister bureaus like the Economic Development Administration. I had a wonderful discussion with the new head of the Patent and Trademark Office, Kathy Vidal, about how we might make sure that intellectual property associated with the development of these kinds of information-based products and services can be best managed. And, and then, of course, there's the traditional sort of internal partners like, like NIST. But this is where it gets exciting in terms of our discussions with NSF, for example, and all of the new developments associated with technology. More about that in a moment as well. And our traditional partners at NSF. So within GEO, the, the Coastlines and People Program, COPE, is a really good example of where I think this new blue economy and economic development writ large can be built out very effectively, where we can talk about what sorts of needs we see for products and services that will support the economic engine and work with Alex's team and the whole group in GEO to try to build out a strong research base for fostering that economic development. The last priority that I wanna talk about is probably uh, the largest, most impactful and most significant, and that is to establish NOAA as the federal authoritative source for operational climate products and services in support of a range of missions, mission agnostic, if you will. We do that already in weather, through the National Weather Service. We do that in fisheries. Uh, there's no question where one goes for the authoritative stock assessments to support the fisheries industry and the stewardship for sustaining that industry. We do it for navigational charts. The National Ocean Service is that authoritative source for navigational charts in the ocean. Uh, the other point is that we have uh, what I call the full life cycle responsibility, everything from collection of the fundamental data with our 16 satellites and our nine aircraft and our 15 ships to the uh, research activities, which we do in very close coordination with all of our partners at NSF at NASA and elsewhere, and then building the operational models for predictions, projections at a full spectrum of timescales from long uh, medium range say seven to ten days out to sub-seasonal to seasonal to interannual decadal etc for an extraordinary diversity of products and services we'll be coming out with our hurricane outlook here uh, on the 24th of may it's a classic example of a climate-based product that we de uh, deliver we know that the demand for our information products and services is increasing so trying to position ourselves to work with our agency partners, and we have great constructs. Poncho alluded to it, there are interagency groups associated with the various hazards of climate, drought, fire, uh, flood, et cetera. But still we know that there's gonna be a, an extraordinary demand for products and services here. Uh, in fact, just about an hour ago, I got a question about how many aircraft are we going to need to monitor hurricane development in the future, given that we're using two aircraft right now. Those kinds of questions merit a fuller discussion of what our nation's posture is with respect to development of climate products and services. We're framing our concept on climate around a principle we are calling climate ready nation in 2030, which is very similar to what you've heard uh, from other sectors. I would say that part of the difference in our characterization of climate ready nation is an emphasis on prosperity and positioning ourselves to be if you will, perhaps even in better shape uh, in 2030 and subsequent years, based on our understanding of climate and our ability to adapt to and be resilient to. There's an important message there, and that is that a lot of the emphasis that we have seen from this administration on climate has been around the mitigation agenda, decarbonizing renewable energy, which is fine, but I think we all know even if we were to get to net zero tomorrow, we would still be dealing with the consequences of sea level rise, uh, of ocean acidification, and many other manifestations of climate change. So we are pushing very hard to make sure that, especially the nature-based solutions part of a uh, adaptation and resilience agenda is appropriately attended to. And, and fortunately, we're getting a lot of help. We've, we've got about $3 billion in uh, infrastructure bill funds over the next five years, a large portion of which is tied to coastal resiliency, for example. The other part of what's happening at NOAA, and you're going to see a lot of 
outreach on our part to work with our colleagues at NSF extensively is the growth of our mission. So for example, uh, we just announced the expansion of uh, and hire of a new appointee for the Office of Space Commerce. Commercial utilization of space is exploding. Uh, and it's been a, an issue for some years now. Uh, but as we see from the SpaceX's and uh, the other commercial interests associated with the use of space, the federal government's responsibilities in space situational awareness, where are all the objects, space traffic management, commercial remote sensing licensing, as well as advocacy of the build out of the commercial sector is a responsibility we have at NOAA. Other partnerships we're building, I talked about the emerging climate services sector. Uh, I've had um, probably close to 50 meetings with many of these startups uh, in the commercial climate services space. Our uh, coordination, especially with NSF and working with the academic community is probably more critical now than it ever has been. As we see, for example, in the build out of the National Water Center at the University of Alabama. It's our first cooperative institute through the National Weather Service. But I've also been reaching out to a number of non-traditional, uh, seemingly uh, disparate, if you will, partners like the National Association of Realtors or the American Medical Association. Um, and these groups are recognizing that they have a need for climate products and services. So we're starting to develop particular relationships. And I'm trying to codify these relationships in whatever is the most appropriate manner. We've, with, our, with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, for example, another federal agency, we've just signed an MOU because we need to make sure that the federal government, the, the Biden-Harris administration's agenda for building 30 gigawatts of offshore power by 2030 is consistent with the Biden-Harris Harris administration's agenda of conserving 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. So if we're looking at marine protected areas off the coasts of the United States, let's make sure we're doing it in a way that's consistent with the leasing that BOEM is doing for offshore wind, for example. So I wanna come back, bring this back to the specifics of our uh, relationship with Ponch and with NSF. Like I said, we did uh, sign this agreement and the focus is on collaboration to support research operations, the transition of research into operations, and, and also education. And I would also argue the, tra the, the feedback, if you will, from the operational side to the research uh, uh, enterprise. And so there's a number of areas that we're looking into. You heard Poncho allude to some of those climate science and services, STEM education. Uh, we're very interested in, in how we can uh, work with NSF's AI institutes, as some of you know, uh, everything from weather forecasting to optimized operations for surveying the ocean are uh, ripe opportunities for looking at applications of AI ML. So we're eager to have that discussion. And I'll share with you that our own science advisory board met just last week, and I suggested that there may be an opportunity to look into uh, a little bit of commingling of our respective scientific advisory bodies. Uh, Ponchu and I haven't had this discussion yet, but uh, we've talked about doing a very similar thing to what you're asking me to do here with you, Ponch, coming to talk to our science advisory board. I might even go so far as to say there may be an opportunity for intersections of the respective advisory boards themselves, an, an interesting concept to discuss. First, we're gonna have the uh, joint meeting, the summit, if you will, between NSF, and NOAA, that'll be this uh, fall. Uh, I'm really excited about talking about any number of things from uh, working with COPE, as I talked about a minute ago, to uh, the new director for Te Technology Innovation and Partnership, and of course, our GEO partners. But I'm also interested in building out the opportunities for working, for example, with the SBE director, where I believe there's extraordinary opportunity to dealing with issues such as uh, managing under uncertain uh, under uncertainty behavioral sciences as they relate to how we build our products and services delivered to the American public. So the, the leadership of NSF and NOAA are, are framing this particular summit. It will be around social science and education and equity, climate and weather, oceans and the new blue economy, 
as well as some tools and the infrastructure that we both depend on. The, uh, the way forward, I think, is really going to be through the mechanism that Ponch described, where we are having these regular discussions, uh, bad on us if we're not bringing every penny's worth out of the potential between our two agencies. We're in a, a, an unusual place uh, for now. We've got um, an extraordinary increase in our budget request. We're up close to $7 billion. Um, it's about a 17% per request over the 22 allotment. So we're pretty excited. Uh, there's also a lot of excitement from my boss, Secretary Gina Raimondo, uh, for what we do at NOAA. Uh, she, of course, was the governor of Rhode Island, so she understands how government operates, and it's been a real pleasure uh, to have her support she has a lot of respect within the cabinet, within the administration, um, and she's afforded me the opportunity to represent the department on things like the National Climate Task Force, which Gina McCarthy, of course, chairs. Uh, and I've also enjoyed the opportunity to represent the United States on those most relevant international venues, whether it's the COP26 conference or the recent Our Ocean Conference. We've got a United Nations Ocean Conference coming up here in Lisbon at the end of June. Uh, and it's my intent not just to serve as the NOAA administrator, but actually to be something of an emissary, if you will, for all of the U.S. ocean activities, research operations, policy, strategy. And I think uh, the, the way I can do that best is if we have an even more robust relationship between our two respective agencies. So we're excited to move forward. I'm particularly delighted to uh, call Pancha good friend and colleague and look forward to uh, exploiting fully that relationship in the uh, the months and years to come. And with that, I'm happy uh, to take questions and comments as they may arise. Thank you, Ponch. All right. Thank you, Dr. Spinrad. Um, I'm going to open this up to questions from the board, but I have two right now that are just pressing that have just come up. Um, Dr. Spinrad, could you tell us a little bit about your approach, your agency's approach to, in light of what we discussed earlier this morning, geographic diversity? Many research universities are concentrated on the coast. Have you developed any best practices that you can share with us for connecting with people who live in other parts of the country? So I'd point out, first of all, that we are the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and our portfolio really is uh, applicable to all U.S. states, territories, and holdings. And, and ultimately, it boils down to the priorities of mission, the requirements, if you will. I came out of DOD where I learned early on as a program manager that uh, the, the primary message, the primary motivation for what we do has got to be predicated on a clear uh, set of requirements. And so it's really less about the geography. Um, however, very clearly, when you look at the economy, the fact that 40% of the population lives in coastal communities, uh, the fact that um, a lot of the, well, 95% of our um, products that come in through import come in through the coasts. Uh, we do spend a lot of time trying to make sure that we are managing uh, the coasts, managing fisheries appropriately. However, I, all you have to do is look at the weather today, the forecast, and understand what's happening in Arkansas and other parts of the Midwest and see we're putting a lot of resources there. I think the short answer to the question, though, is that we have 620 facilities around the country. We, uh, we have 122 weather forecast offices alone scattered throughout the country. And so it, if there's an implicit sense of overemphasis or overemphasis on coastal issues, I'd, I'd like to disabuse uh, the NSB of that, that we really do invest pretty broadly across the board. But if the priorities are driven by economic issues in Alaska, for example, we're apt to put more resource, resources there. We're very much operationally oriented to those priorities. Thank you very much. Uh, Alan, I see your hand raised. Thank you, Vic. Uh, Dr. Spinrad, thank you very much for this. Uh, hi. Thank you for this briefing, uh, wonderful background briefing. Thank you for sharing your vision. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, um, but I would like to recommend that you and Ponch have a conversation about how the NSB can help advance uh, this collaboration uh, between the NSF and NOAA. And if you have any thoughts on that, you can share with us now just off the top. I'd be very interested in hearing them. 
Well, one thing, it's a mechanical part of the answer is that I think we, and by we, I mean Poncho and me, are missing a bet if we don't exploit what I think would be a very dynamic dialogue between our science advisory board and the NSB. Now, how we do that, I don't know. But as I sat through our um, SAB uh, last week, I realized we are underexploiting that. When Kathy Sullivan was our administrator and I was her chief scientist, we worked very hard to have that be a very strategic organization. Uh, the NS I have always viewed the NSB as being that for the nation, uh, in, in addition for NSF. And so I think part of this might be identifying some key issues, like, for example, how do we build out a climate enterprise most effectively? What does the NSB and, and the SAB think are appropriate approaches there? I will tell you the other question I have in general is, especially with the new, de uh, new development of the technology um, directorate, how can we really make the transition of research to, and, and I don't, I don't say research to operations because for us, it's research to operations, applications, commercialization, and utilization. Some of our research goes into new regulatory applications. So how can, and so I call it R2X, how can we ensure the fantastic research and technological developments that are and will come out of NSF are best available for us at NOAA? And how can we at NOAA help the NSB identify in a very strategic manner priorities for research investments? That would be the, the general answer I would have. All right, thank you. Uh, Scott. Uh, also, thank you for that uh, very enthusiastic presentation. Uh, you had mentioned you reached out very extensively to the commercial space um, industry. I didn't even know there were 30 firms interested at this point. Uh, what are you looking for from them? Uh, are you, as a customer, um, specifying niches that they might provide. Uh, so, so first, so first the, my apologies if I commingled a couple of ideas. The the thirty or forty companies I've reached out to run the gamut from climate services to ocean services. They're they're not. Some of them are commercial space uh, entities, but regardless, there is an exploding number of commercial space entities. Um, these, are, you know, whether it's SpaceX, whether it's launch facilities, a lot of it is around telecommunications, but a lot of it is about providing an extraordinarily diverse set of geospatial products and services. Um, and then there are really somewhat unexpected developments. One of the companies with whom, there's actually two companies with whom we're starting to work, are companies that recognize that by using the GPS constellation, and uh, assessing the signals received from GPS and how they, how they undergo occultation, those signals, as the, the satellites effectively rise and fall through the atmosphere, we can instantly get thousands of vertical profiles of relative humidity and sometimes temperature from GPS radio occultation profiles. So here's a company who's not launching any satellites but has recognized the capability to utilize existing data coming from satellites for a very, very different kind of application. They own the IP, they own the, the access, if you will, to some of the, the satellite, uh, some of the data streams. So how do we build on that? How do we make sure that that sort of capability is uh, quality controlled? But probably more importantly, how do we ensure that those data are gonna be there? So we can't build products and services and then find out that the commercial sector that establishes really new great capability doesn't have a bottom line. So they've gone belly up and all of a sudden we're left with um, the inability to maintain that improved forecast capability. Um, and so right now to give you yet another indication, there are about 20,000 objects in space that need monitoring. Our estimates are that with the growth of the commercial sector, commercial segment, that number will be closer to 50,000 by 2030. Julia Phillips. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so this is not my field, but I've recently become aware of um, a dramatic decline in the health of the capability of fundamental research in geodesy, which clearly underpins many things that 
NOAA is responsible for, uh, also has huge national security implications and so forth. So it's a much broader in, uh, conversation than what we're having today. But I'm wondering a couple of things. One is, um, could you talk a little bit about uh, NOAA's support for long-term geodetic capabilities in support of you know, various aspects of climate change, symptoms of climate change and the like, uh, sea level rise, um, atmosphere, um, atmospheric probing and so forth. And also, um, since part of the issue or much of the issue is uh, seems to be around the long-term viability of this capability, fundamental capability in the U.S., what, uh, what NOAA and NSF might be able to do to get together in that area. So I, I'm uh, happy to talk about the operational implications of your question. Let me start with the latter half of your question, if I can, and say that um, I am concerned about the workforce development within the world of geodesy. I'm not at panic mode based on anything I have seen thus far. I do think it, I, I really appreciate your putting up an asterisk next to it, if you will, as something that we ought to probably take a look at. I, I don't know the health of that community in terms of supporting our activities. What I do know, however, is that our current operational activities uh, are in pretty good shape. So we obviously operate the National Geodetic Survey and, and you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's not just measuring the geoid, but looking at it in the context of things like isostatic rebound and what the consequences of the loss of sea, uh, loss of uh, 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 glacial ice are for uh, sea level rise. There are also some very interesting implications for hydrology. So we are building out the next generation of the national water model, which requires, not surprisingly, the most accurate and highly resolved characterization of the geoid in order to, I mean, it's, it's Physic 101, right? The water goes downhill. So if you don't know where downhill is, you're going to have a hard time building out that water model. Those are two of the bigger areas we're working. We do a lot of that work um, using our aircraft around the country. I am mostly concerned in terms of concerns around geodesy at NOAA. Uh, I am concerned with our ability to gather the abundance of data that we need because the tools really to get the high res data that we need, we're relying a lot on uh, uh, aircraft based observational systems. We have very limited aircraft. One of them is right here at JFK in New York today, doing a show and tell for school kids and others. And so I think part of the answer really is going to be about understanding what the capital resource requirements are to fulfill the data needs. I'm comfortable that we have a good statement of what the data requirements are for having the up-to-date GI to fill the hydrology models, to fill the sea level rise models and the and the associated products associated with understanding um, the geoid. So uh, the, the workforce is a good one. I don't have a good answer for you on that, but it, but I, it, my awareness is heightened by your question. I'd like to look at that a little bit more. I understand there is a proposal potentially to do a workshop on this through the academies. So you might want to keep an Great. eye on that. Thank you. Yes, I really appreciate that. Uh, Suresh Garamella. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Spindrad. Um, I have an exhortation and then a request for clarification. Um, and and the, the, the first is, uh, it picks up on what Alan Stern was saying. Um, we've, we've asked often, we've, we've talked about how the different agencies that are looking at science um, could benefit from working together well. I hope that you and Punch working together will serve as a model. I know there are I wouldn't say anemic efforts because the effort may not be anemic, but anemic outcomes at least of um, of these agencies trying to work together, and uh, or I, I mean even the DOE basic science and not just an agency per se. So I, I really think that um, if we could focus, and it all has to do with personalities and relationships sometimes. Um, so I, I I hope that what you both are trying to do can then expand to. Uh, you know, NIST, and we, you know, we, we've interacted with them and other th other uh, agencies as well. I know some of you work together in Antarctica, et cetera. So it would be great to see you all um, pool resources, folk, uh, sort of work together um, more closely. 
the the question or the clarification I was seeking, and it may be something I misheard you say, but you said something about nature based uh, approaches to mitigation or so. I I, I just I, I guess I wasn't sure what that meant, and if you could just uh, elaborate on that, thank you. Yeah, um, let me talk about the latter because I think that's a much more concrete uh, question, and then and then riff a little bit, if you will, on your former question. So my my discussion about nature based solutions was not so much on the on the mitigation side, but really on the adaptation side. Uh, so it 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 uh, plays out in terms of things like. Uh, are we adequately looking at the role of what we call blue carbon, uh, whether it's algae, whether it's mangroves, uh, that ocean-based carbon uh, as a potential way to uh, use marine protected areas, for example, not just to ensure that the ecosystems are healthy, but actually to help with drawdown of atmosphere of carbon. That, that's an example of a nature-based solution. Another example would be on the resiliency and adaptation side, uh, looking at how we harden our coasts uh, against what we now know is um, the uh, unquestioned sea level rise that we're going to see in places like Norfolk of 10 to 12 inches by 2050. So the, the, the idea here is that not everything is done with a, if you will, man-made solution of building out jetties. Uh, there may be some nature-based solutions. And most of it, most of the discussion we're involved with it, Noah, is around the adaptation and resiliency agenda rather than the mitigation agenda. I do want to come back to your um, comment on working together. I, I actually believe the relationship Ponch and I are building up is a really good example. And I know NSF is, is reaching out and doing similar with others. I'm trying to do the same thing. So uh, from the first day I came on board, I met with Bill Nelson, the NASA administrator, Pam Melroy, his deputy, uh, have done the same thing with USGS, with DOE, with I know the Navy and DOD side from having worked there. So try to build those relationships where we need to codify it with agreements. We're happy to do that. But as we all around the figurative table know, those agreements are only worth the paper they're printed on if you're not working on them in terms of establishing programs and establishing uh, uh, cooperative efforts. They're not really worth a lot. I will add one other thing, and it, um, it it's one I have to be a little, I, I will address gingerly because I had started uh, as I know, Ponch had and others a really interesting discussion with Eric Lander um, around the issue of what what is the new what is the Van Ever Bush equivalent for 2022, and how do we change the paradigm, and how do we rethink the sort of standards of operations um, and concepts of operations that we've been working under? And I was very encouraged that there was a thirst for that, and and it means. Things like how do we, for example, commingle resources more effectively? Commingling is illegal, as we all know, but it's a reality, especially as we see philanthropic investments in science growing as they are. Are there ways to build new structures to rethink the federal scientific enterprise? Um, Lander was dogged in trying to develop that. I do hope that Dr. Collins, Dr. Nelson over at OSTP, We'll carry that same dialogue because I assure you there are many of us in the leadership roles in the federal agencies, scientific agencies, who are eager to rethink that paradigm. And, and, and I'd be glad to dive a little bit deeper, but there are many, many aspects of how the federal government invests in research that I think could undergo major overhaul and reconsideration. Yeah, thank you for, for a very comprehensive engagement on that question. I think uh, if anyone can do it, two ex-VPRs can do it. I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fan of VPRs. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm a fan of VPRs, too, so thank you. So on that note, um, our last question, uh, Suresh Babu. Thank you, uh, Dr. Spinner. Um, one of the things which I'm interested in also, in addition to climate products and services, how can uh, NSF and NOAA can collaborate on STEM education with reference to climate too? Is there any thought process you have if you could see how we can expand on that too? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And when I think about uh, STEM and I think about climate products and services, we, we do need some fresh thinking um, with respect to um, any number of aspects, not just mechanically, what products do we need to build? So what do we need to improve our ability to address heat health challenges, especially in inner cities? 
um, it, it, drought, fire, the, the whole set of risks. The, it sounds a little odd, but the exciting thing about those terrible issues is that they are wonderful ways of engaging students. Uh, what I have seen as I've engaged with students is um, there's, there's a passion for service in young people now that I haven't seen in some time, uh, even to the extent I'll share with you that I've told my staff, I would like to establish a formal youth engagement position within the agency. Arguably that individual should be under 25, but I'm not sure we'll be able to do that. Um, and that, that role is to make sure we are tapping into not just the intellect of that age group, if you will, but also the passion for these issues. And, and I also feel like in STEM education, and especially if we talk about STEAM education, uh, that, that the younger communities are less constrained about thinking about a problem as inherently a physical problem or a biological problem, but really are looking to the solutions. So when we talk about things like ocean acidification, they're very interested in looking how to deal with this in an earth system holistic approach. If we can be sensitive to that um, and not go out and say simply, we need more meteorologists or we need more fisheries biologists, but understand that transdisciplinary, and I choose that word very carefully, uh, elements of what we do, which is why I have been passionate about basically telling my staff, if they say wet side or dry side, they have to put a dollar in a jar. It is the earth system. And I think that's how our younger generation is being educated uh, it, overall, but certainly in the STEM uh, field specifically. So I, I, I apologize, apologize for being a little bit too broad and, and hand-waving in my answer, but I am really passionate about lining up our needs with what I think is a very fundamentally cultural, a fundamentally different cult, cultural approach in the next generation of our workforce. Thanks, well, Jeff. you know, Dr. Yeah. Spinrad, I wanna thank you for a fantastic presentation. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. And I'll leave you with one idea, one thing we can do since you and, and my good friend across the aisle here, uh, Dr. Poncha Nathan, is going to try to make some good trouble, and that's what we do on this board, is maybe at, we could talk about an offsite where we can have some of your board members and our board members just throw up some of these challenge problems and just put them out there and, and think about them. So I want to thank you again for, that, for, for being here, for your presentation. And again, uh, we look forward to this uh, blooming and emerging partnership between NSF and NOAA. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Rick. That is awesome. Thank you. So as we continue through our open session items um, for the remainder of today's meeting will be about committee reports. So I'd like to turn to NSB committee to the reports. And we'll hear from the board's committee chairs about the activities they've undertaken since we've met in February and their ongoing work. So we'll hear from the committees on strategy, oversight, external engagement, and the committee on national science and engineering policy. So with that, we'll begin with the committee on strategy, Suresh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today I'm reporting on the committee on strategies, April 29th open meeting, Director Panchanathan, Chief uh, Operating Officer Karen Marangel and Budget Division Director Caitlin Fife gave us an update on NSF's FY23 budget request that was submitted to Congress at the end of March. By way of background, the FY23 budget request level was uh, or is 10.5 billion, um, a 24% increase over the FY21 enacted budget. It includes key investments in climate change and clean energy, racial equity in science and engineering, improving U.S. competitiveness, research facilities and instrumentation construction, and NSF's institutional needs. Punch reiterated that uh, these investments align with and advance NSB's uh, Vision 2030, uh, the administration's goals, and NSF's priorities and goals. The uh, team presented uh, the proposed allocations for the different directorates and the appropriations, including for new technology innovation and partnerships directorate, and the consolidation of funding for the Graduate Research Fellowship Program from the Office of Integrative Activities into the Education and Human Resources Directorate. And before you get used to that name, we also heard about uh, the proposed directorate name change from Directorate for Education and Human Resources, EHR, 
to the Directorate for STEM Education, EDU. Within EDU, the Division of Human Resources Development is to be renamed Division of Equity for Excellence in STEM. Um, these proposed name changes are meant to capture the Directorate's work more accurately. Punch informed us that um, he's had multiple uh, meetings uh, on, on uh, the Hill uh, on the budget request and said that it's being well received. He noted strong congressional support for TIP and interest in the new NSF granted program that you heard this morning about, which aims to build institutional capacity among uh, minority serving institutions and community colleges. Earlier this week, Punch testified before the Senate Appropriations Committee and next week will testify before the House Appropriations Committee. Punch shared the key messages of his testimonies on the Hill, including the need to unleash, he uses words like unleash, innovation and talent everywhere, uh, tip and how it can contribute to unleashing innovation, climate and, and clean energy and technologies of the future. We discussed how the NSB can help spread these messages and make the case for NSF. Finally, I'd like to inform the board that there are plans for the Committee on Strategy to meet with NSF in late May or early June to discuss board engagement in NSF's budget and performance management process. Please stay tuned for more details on that meeting. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Sir Resch. Next, we'll hear from Anilia Sargent, Chair of the Committee on Oversight. Anilia. Sorry. This has been standard for 12 years, okay. <laughs> um, and on April 4th, we heard a very clear presentation by Alicia Needler, head of the Office of Integrative Activities, regarding the broader impacts of the cutting edge science and engineering funded by NSF. This presentation provided a very useful history from OIA's perspective on NSF's approaches to broader impacts. In our second meeting on April 28th, the committee heard the results of an Office of the, of, an Office of the Inspector General's staff review into plagiarism connected to NSF-funded research. You can read the full report in the Committee on Oversight's Diligent book at tab 1.4.1.1. And commonly identified causes of plagiarism were associated with re researchers' lack of understanding of citations. And OIG suggests that uh, we foster a culture or that a culture be fostered in universities from the highest level down that emphasize the importance of integrity in, uh, the re in regard to citations um, to ensure that this uh, situation can be improved. We also heard um, from an, an, had an update from Teresa Grankovich, the Chief Financial Officer and Chief Performance Officer. NSF is on track to award all funds provided under the American Rescue Plan by its expiration at the end of September. And NSF continues a robust outreach plan to provide interested researchers with information on the grants process and other areas of interest. The committee looks forward, or at least the committee that will go forward, um, looks to the action plan due this spring relating to NSF's fiscal year 2022 to 23 agency priority goal, which is to increase representation in the scientific enterprise by increasing proposals from underrepresented and underdeserved individuals and institutions. And looking towards the future, as this is my last or was my last meeting of the committee, um, we considered the work and accomplishments over the last two years. And to get through it as quickly as possible, I've got a few slides, I li literally four or five. These are highlighted by what we actually did. So you can see we began with the 22 term with modernization and accessibility improvements to the merit review digest. And I think you all know ad nauseam possibly um, how what we did at that time. And But I will say that um, the results um, are more than I think that we could have expected and they're totally dependent 
dependent um, on our interactions with the OIA staff at the time, particularly Erica Risi, Steve Meacham, and Susie Iacono. They were critical to understanding agency policies and practices related to the merit review criteria, panel views, proposal submissions, and so on. And also in 2020, the committee developed a new element, a board approved overview, as you see, for the digest. And that has become a standard part of the digest. We also, on oversight, tried very hard to um, respond and align with the board's vision 2030 report particularly that would be yes we're there particularly with respect to delivering benefits from research for all Americans the CO has spent considerable time over the last two years evaluating how NSF's broader impacts criterion could better meet societal needs in this regard again our interactions with OIA staff were critical. And so um, let's move on. In February, of course, as a result of these um, considerations, um, the board actually approved, as you know, two resolutions and statements on training to improve merit review and on adding BI experts. And of course, we also looked um, to the Center um, of, for Advancing Research in Society, ARES, an NSF-funded community, to help us with many of these uh, considerations. And we appreciated uh, presentations from ARIS director Susan Reno, along with Susan Iacono um, at the December board meeting. I would say that engagement with external as well as internal broader impact experts and the larger BI community has been invaluable for CEO and the committee looks forward to strengthening this relationship. Um, access, sorry, um, accessibility, um, uh, my gosh, that was, um, sorry, I apologize. I have not used my um, screen for notes before and they're not moving as quickly as me. Um, we've also enjoyed a new relationship, as the board will recall, with uh, CIOS, the Committee on Equal Opportunities, and uh, I, sometimes, but mostly along with NSB Chair Alan Ochoa and Vice Chair Victor McCrary um, and Vision 2030 Task Force Chair Roger Beachy have interacted fruitfully um, with CIOS in discussions about diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility implement implementation at NSF funding institutions. We've also heard in this regard, of course, from AAASC Change Director uh, Shirley Malcolm. So you can see a wide net has been spread. And I would like to say that, in fact, CO throughout this has appreciated that the care that NSF as a whole has taken to share, that the director's office in particular, to share their DEIA strategy and activities with CO through the various DEIA related presentations, the Racial Equality Ta Equity Task Force, the agency's DEI strategic plan, and of course, we and look forward to a continuing good relationship there. We also took up more recently um, the board on expanding the geography of uh, innovation. Um, and uh, it has, we have turned our attention in this regard to EPSCAR, the established program to stimulate competitive research. And so again, there were meetings that were helpful to us as we came back to our other meetings. And finally, um, actually, I'd like to end um, with a, a, um, to reiterate uh, for the board a suggestion that I actually made at last week's CEO meeting. As we know, the merit review process is widely considered the gold standard for proposal evaluation. With intellectual merit and broader impacts, the two major criteria that NSF uses to make funding decisions. However, I note, I, mean, I think we could all note, that it's been over a decade since the board examined and set the merit review criteria. A lot has changed in those 11 years in the scientific enterprise, in the governing statute, at NSF, and really in the communities that we serve. And in particular, the many and diverse aspects of broader impacts that emerged during our work over the last two years, which is why I did a little bit of a run through, has given CO cause to wonder 
if it is time for the board to exercise its policy responsibilities and re-examine in the light of Vision 2030, the merit review criteria and how they are implemented. Most importantly, are they still optimal for assuring the foundation's ability to achieve its scientific and societal goals? And as my term as CO chair ends, I encourage my colleagues on the board to consider this rather foundational question for NSF. And finally, I want to thank the members of my committee, Steve Willard, Roger Beachy, Stephen Leith, Carl Leinberger, Scott Stanley, and of course, Jerry Richmond, has, who has moved on to a very different sphere from this, but we, they all played enormous roles and helped enormously as we discussed all these topics. And I also would like to thank, and I cannot say enough words about them, Anne Bushmiller, Portia Flowers, Phil M. Weiler and Veronica Shelley, who supported us throughout all this and put up with a great deal from me in the matter of editing anything. So I couldn't have managed without them and I'd like to thank them too. And so I think that concludes the Committee on Oversight report, you'll be glad to know. <laughs> thank An you. Ania, wonderful report. Thank you very, very, very much. Suresh Babu, the chair of the Committee on External Engagement will update us on the work that his committee has undertaken since our last meeting in February. Suresh. Thank you, Victor. The Committee on External Engagement met on April 28th to discuss results from the survey we sent out to the board members to get input on potential revisions to our NSB's honorary awards, goals, criteria, and process and also to talk through the discussion draft of recommendations to revise the honorary awards. And also we discussed recent upcoming and engagement activities. And also we talked about the priorities for the next iteration of the external engagement committee. The members all agreed that EE should continue the external panels, the committees spearheaded in the last few years and organize this because the panels are very impactful, as you noticed in the today also, providing information relevant to our advancing Vision 2030 goals. So the EE members also would like to see the next iteration of this committee help the board leverage its collective strength to engage with key entities as we develop more panels also. So that's our summary report to present the committee's recommendation for revisions to its honorary awards let me turn to Honorary Awards uh, Chair, Maureen Condi. Maureen, can you take it away from here? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Suresh. Um, and I want to also thank all of the members of uh, the EE Committee and other board members who have contributed to the development of these new recommendations. Many of you have, have uh, witnessed that we've faced trying to identify um, a sufficient number of high quality nominations for these awards. And yet, I think we all share a very real commitment to, to the importance of recognizing um, stellar scientific achievement and society service uh, through, through this mechanism of awards. So as you may recall, uh, NSP Chair Alan Ochoa charged the Committee on External Engagement to evaluate our National Science Board's two honorary awards, the Vannevar Bush Award and the Public Service Award, and to bring recommendations to the board, full board um, at this meeting. So the key impetus of, for this request um, is the, was the, and is the ongoing challenge of attracting strong and diverse nomination pools, particularly for the Vannevar Bush Award. So as you can see in your diligent board books, um, the committee is offering a set of recommendations for two ideas and two ideas for future consideration that would require more time to research and determine uh, what their feasibility really is. So to develop our recommendations, the committee took a fresh look at the goals, uh, the criteria, and the nomination process for NSB's honorary awards. We reviewed the feedback we got from board members uh, during closed session at the December board meeting. And we brainstormed about ideas during our February EE meeting. Uh, we developed and sent out a survey to all of the NSB 
members to get feedback about potential changes to the honorary awards. Uh, and during our EE meeting last week, we reviewed and discussed the survey results. A little more than half of the board responded, and you can see the results of that survey in your board book. Committee members also talked through uh, a discussion of draft recommendations, and I'm not going to go through them in great detail, uh, but they are in your board book and you can review them at your leisure. Uh, but I would like to take a few minutes to highlight uh, some of the things and then open up, uh, open up these recommendations for discussion. So there was a consensus that the overall goals of the Vannevar Bush and Public Service Award are sound, but that they we need to better distinguish um, their mutual reference to public service. Uh, in the case of Vannevar Bush, the intent is to recognize public service for the nation. So our recommendation is to change the wording to make um, that distinction clear. In the case of the Public Service Award, the intent is to recognize fostering public understanding of science and, and engineering. So our recommendation is to change the name of that award to better convey its intent. There's also, there was also a strong consensus uh, both uh, on the EE committee and as the results of the survey that we should update the awards to better reflect the goals of Vision 2030. TIP and the congressional priority of delivering societal benefits. So there were varying views on um, how best to accomplish that that um, reflection. <laughs> um, and our recommendation is to add societal benefits as one of three criteria, one of the three core elements of the Vannevar Bush Award. We would recommend that the requirement be that a nominee meets at least two out of those three core core elements, with them being intellectual merits, so scientific achievement broadly, broadly understood, public service to the nation, and delivering of societal benefits. There was also a strong endorsement to make the nominations and review process much easier. Um, and you can see our specific recommendations to do that uh, summarized in the board book. On other points, there were I actually would like to go off script here a little bit and say that I very strongly feel that this is the most important recommendation we are making. The there's given that these awards are um, honorary, there's there's no financial incentive for people to apply for them. The the complexity of the initial application, I think, is really a strong disincentive for people to to uh, put forward their names. So I would really like to see a short one paragraph. Uh, pre-application that can either be a self-nomination or a nomination that's submitted by someone on your behalf that we then as a board can screen through rapidly and, and really um, highlight out or, or segregate out uh, individuals who we'd like to see a full application from. And at that point, they have at least the encouragement that they've passed that first hurdle. So so there's more incentive for them to, to work through a more complicated uh, nomination process at that point. So other points uh, on which there were varying uh, views, uh, in particular, the career capstone requirement of the Vannevar Bush Award. So the more, majority of members who responded to our survey endorsed retaining the Vannevar Bush as a career capstone award. Uh, and several EE members noted that many awards already exist to recognize younger scientists who are stellar and who have delivered benefits to society or have had significant scientific accomplishments. However, other members uh, favored expanding the Vannevar Bush Award so that stellar scientists at any career stage would be eligible. So you can see that our recommendation, however, uh, is to retain the career capstone requirement, although this is certainly open to debate. Let me stop there and open up our recommendations for discussion. Do other EE members um, have anything to add regarding our recommendations? Uh, and and also, I'd love to hear what other board members think. Please. Julia? Uh, yeah, just, just real quickly. Um, I, the recommendations, I think, make a lot of sense. The one thing that I would really like to emphasize is that we should be talking about nominations, not applications. Um, I mean, it may be more open to allow self-nominations, but it should be a nomination. It should not be applying for an award. 
Absolutely. And so we do have to watch our language a bit there. Yes, I apologize for misspeaking, and I 100% agree. These are nominations for an honorary award. Any other thoughts or? Dan? Yeah, I, I agree with trying to simplify the process. I mean, after all, if the identification of the person isn't sufficient for us to be with even modest diligence aware of their accomplishments, that might prima facie suggest they're not qualified for the award. And I don't mean to imply that we have to know who the people are, that uh, was ex is exclusionary, but that it should not be hard to identify the, the uh, highly visible accomplishments of someone that we want to recognize. I, I think that's an excellent point. Suresh? Yeah, Maureen, I agree. I think the a pre sort of small um, step, a step added um, makes sense, especially if you're um, expecting fairly elaborate applications or nominations, sorry. So um, that I'm good with. I, I think the, um, I, I think you summer uh, or you concluded saying the committee's recommendation was to keep the Venivar Bush Award as a sort of a career capstone, and I strongly uh, support that. I think that we have many awards at multiple levels. I mean, the Waterman Awards are supposed to be great for people under 40 or so. I think there's a age restriction, if I remember. So um, this one is unique. There's one award of this kind, and I don't think there's any reason to just expand it or or diluted and I dilute sounds terrible that I, I should probably find a better word for it but um, I think it's meant specifically for in my mind to be a capstone recognition so um, I would strongly support the committee's recommendation on that front as well thank you Maureen um, I don't know if you got any insight on the survey in terms of the marketing of the awards in terms of getting more nominations. But one thing I would put out is I, you know, I, one of my sayings is if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And how do we get and reach these other uh, groups and um, other factions to make and encourage people to put nominations in? You know, if you look at a spreadsheet of the Alan T. Waterman Award from present all the way back, and you look at the groups there, the diversity in those wars, and I'm not talking about racial, ethnic, but just geographical is very compelling, okay? Um, it says to me that maybe somehow also we need to, need to consider our strategies of how we get this out to, to a lot of different places to put people, to put nominations in. And, and one of them may be to start with what you're doing with NOAA, for example, because just in just the federal scientific communities, there are people that we could recognize, okay? Um, also in, in some of these universities that, that came up today and what Roger's uh, panel, um, because I'm surprised how many people tell me, well, I didn't know where you could put in a nomination. And I know we do it or something like that, but I'm just saying we might wanna also take the time to committee is how do we get that out there uh, to what Dan's point just recently is, I mean, you've got um, social media, we've got all of these different things that we could use. You know, how can we use this better so that we can get a broader pool of nominees and a higher selection of nominees that we can look at? You know, these are these are points we discussed in at great length in the committee, and I think <laughs> I think um, the the challenge is that. Uh, in some ways, the motivation to to nominate for this award is not comparable to the Waterman Awards because there's no financial incentive for people to do so. So one of the two recommendations we made for or talking points for further discussion and research would be the notion of potentially attaching some sort of monetary incentive. You know, and it wouldn't have to be uh, enormous, but I think I think people people tend to. You know, a few a few ten thousand dollars tends to get people's attention, even if even if it doesn't really amount to a significant award with respect to um, research or or uh, you know something on the order of the Nobel. So, are there any thoughts on on the notion of of potentially or, or is it worth considering a discussion of this, Suresh? 
<laughs> Sorry, Maureen. So I, I think that uh, re requesting a, a short uh, paragraph or so as a nomination will probably make, um, will address this, uh, go a long way in addressing this issue. Um, I, I will say that my own uh, hesitation in nominating people has been just, I think of the award as being so, such a big recognition that, um, you know, I feel like maybe it, it doesn't uh, sort of rise to that. And so perhaps if there was a short, uh, you know, paragraph we could submit, uh, then we can see whether, you know, where, where that goes and then add to it. So I suspect that will um, alleviate this quite a bit. My own sense, again, my just personal opinion is at that stage in their careers, I don't know that a financial um, reward makes a difference. I think we're talking now about presidents or very senior people rec putting in the recommendations and I think there it's more of a question of time and and uh, and the complexity of the application that matters more. A Waterman Award is a very different level of their uh, stage of their career. Uh, again, my opinion. Thank you. I'm sorry, Panch, you're next. No problem. Um, you know, uh, it almost uh, tells me that the the caliber of this award, and I agree that it should be the top of the top of the top. That's what we are trying to recognize here, and we should be very clear about that. And you know, some of these things are where we actually, I don't know whether as a, as, as a group really need to spend more time thinking about those outstanding people. There are not a whole lot of people like that, that you, you, ha you have to, we have to think through the kind of people that I think deserve this, who have not literally been nominated at all for any other things. One vehicle that seems to me that could be useful is talking to the National Academy Presidents of Engineering and Science, because we are talking about science and engineering, and many of these top, top people do come to the attention of academies sometimes. I'm not saying that's the only channel, I'm just saying that's a channel because that level of excellence is seen by the academies too. So we might want to rely on that and see if we can actively engage them. I know we send things to them and we want them to nominate. That uh, We send it to a lot of people, but I think there's more active engagement that is required, I think. I know it's a little bit of work, but if we really want to unearth the people who really don't want to put themselves there for the award, that's the kind of people that we are looking for. Uh, so uh, I don't know how, how, how you how, how you do that. So Julia may have better suggestions because she's involved in the National Academies yeah. more than I am. Uh, yeah, um, thank you. So uh, first of all, I don't think the financial thing is a big deal at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not going into Nobel territory mm -hmm. and, and um, given the people we're trying to recognize, I mean, for Waterman, it helps them pursue their research and so forth. These people, don't need the money. And it is a high level recognition and nobody's aware that I'm, that I know if, whether there's money associated with it, with it or not making it easy because, you know, plowing through some of those nominations, it's like, how on earth could I ever put something like that together? Um, I mean, that's the daunting thing. And, um, and, you know, the nominator doesn't get, get any money for it anyway. So, so, so the money part doesn't seem to work, make some, a lot of sense to me. I wonder about some active brainstorming by a group of people. And maybe we pull in the national academies, presidents, and a few members of the boards who board who have wide networks and are interested in this kind of thing. Because if you start brainstorming, and you see maybe who's been put in on the one page or you say, oh, and that reminds me, maybe we should be thinking about so-and-so. And so you could actually probably get quite a lot, quite a few more uh, names just as a result of having some live dialogue about who should be nominated for mm -hmm. this. Um, and I don't, I, I know the board office is way overloaded, but if there could be some assistance that was provided in putting a nomination together. I was behind the scenes on a public service nomination some years ago, actually one. It was somebody at the academies who actually did the legwork, hmm. to most of that together. So he was paid to do that. And if there is some kind of support we could provide for um, ones that look particularly interesting, that might be, um, might help us get over the hump as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, Emilio? Yeah, I'd like to support the idea of the academy. Uh, I think uh, not just going to the president of the academy, which certainly is, is beginning, but also to go to asking them to contact sections 
in the Academy of Engineering and in the Academy of Sciences to come up with things. I think the sections are more active. And so chairs of sections within the Academy uh, are make members aware and may be more willing to be helpful in this regard. Mm -hmm. Victor? Um, so once we get all of these great nominations in and everything, and we have this up, one of the things I'd like also maybe the committee to think about is what are the post-award activities? We saw five incredible individuals today. How do we now publicize these folks and get them around and play into, because this plays into Vision 2030. We've been talking about how do we get more of our um, younger generation involved in science. These people are role models. They represent many different institutions and backgrounds. Um, just a thought that maybe comes down the road, how do we have that road show? I know we have some videos that we'll see tonight, which we won't reveal here, but they're very well. But how do we get those out? How do we do also like some of our sister agencies do, like NASA, like DOD, because they're trying to also do workforce development as part of their award process. And so they use their awardees to go out to the schools and go out to other places. I just put that out there as something we also need to think about. Once we get all of these incredible people in here, how do we make this the Academy Awards of Science and get this out here and use it as a way for Vision 30 to increase that pipeline? Well, those are those are all really, really excellent suggestions. And I think I think if any of you have a, um, you know, revelation on the stairs leaving the building, please don't hesitate to send them to me <laughs> and um, we'll we'll try to incorporate them in as part of our th our thinking thought process and and try to improve this a couple of a couple of other things i'd like to highlight is we've we also are recommending that the full ee committee not a subcommittee um look at look at the nominations um to get to get more eyes on on the individuals and that we have um someone with sort of institutional memory uh, also review since twice since I've been on this committee we've we've entertained people who who ultimately when we brought them to the full board um, there were significant concerns regarding regarding people who had some experience with these individuals and felt very strongly that they would not want to see them as the nominee so um, you know we're always happy to go back to the drawing board but um, we're hoping that John or one of one of the other staff will be able to also review the applications earlier on. Um, Suresh? Yeah, not waiting till the stairwell, so I've had one more revelation, I think. Um, <laughs> to, to, I guess I will make a friendly amendment to, to Punch's suggestion, and that is, I think if we ask the uh, NAE and NAS, NAS directors, you know, to make nominations, um, that's, that's one step, but perhaps just brainstorming with them about, hey, give us names, and we'll figure out how to get them nominated. I think that's, uh, that's one thing. And to Vic's point, I think it was a very good point um, on two fronts, and I'll add a little bit to your idea as well. And that is, um, as you know, at one point when the State Department was very active in this space, there were science envoys that were named that went around the world uh, and, um, you know, spoke uh, about science, et cetera. So maybe there's a, there's a national uh, science envoy as in somebody who could be made available. Now, and I think uh, a, an addition to that is perhaps if there were four or five great nominations, but we only gave one award, um, they could the four or five folks could be science on voice. They didn't get the Vannevar Bush Award, but there's a very strong consolation prize, if you will. And they serve for a year or so as a science envoy and go around and something. So there's probably um, shades of sort of other colors to the ideas. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like I like all of those ideas. I think I think even something as trivial as trying to help uh, people for commencement addresses identify this is the awardee of of the Vannevar Bush Award, and you know you're a you're a science heavy or engineering heavy institution. You know, have have this person come and speak because it's incredibly inspirational to to see, and and that's reaching out to people who who are. You know, potentially in the pipeline already, but but could could profit from that kind of mentorship. So, we have another hand. 
Okay. Oh, Aaron. Oh, Aaron. I, yeah, I hesitated to say that to bring this up, but is there a process to remove somebody's award if they've uh, proven themselves to be unworthy in the future? And uh, I ask that because you know I'm a, at, at our university we give out honorary degrees and we do these things, and once a decade there's some something that comes up. You're like we shouldn't have done that. Um, well, thankfully, in my experience, we have never encountered that situation. So I'm pretty sure we do not have a procedure, but it's probably something worth worth considering. Yeah. John, did you did you have any input on that? Yeah, to support what Maureen was saying, I know a lot of people are like that now. Yeah, we have certain degrees that you can't Microphone, please. Microphone, please. So, so Anne was saying that uh, this came up maybe four or five years ago, and there was a considerable uh, two years. It was only two years ago. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, and we we discussed it at some length then, and uh, the conclusion was was not to adopt um, any formal process. But uh, it is an evergreen issue, and since it has been raised, uh, it may be time for deliberations again. All right. Well, with that, thank you, John. Thank you, Suresh. Thank. You. Thank you, Maureen. Um, next, we'll hear from you, Julia Phillips, Chair of the Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy. Julia. Uh, thank you so much, Victor. Uh, so the Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy met in open session on April 25th. Uh, we discussed the culmination of the Indicators 2022 cycle, including the congressionally mandated summary report that you all know so well by now, the State of US Science and Engineering. Um, we also reviewed a retrospective of the policy products that were produced by the committee during the current board cycle, so the last two years. Um, that in, um, We had uh, reviewed a one-pager from the Economic Impact of International Students and Workers Policy Team. So hold that thought. We'll be back to it in a minute. And we had an update from the group working on the Socioeconomic Status, or SES, working group. Um, so today, um, we're going to discuss the latest on indicators, um, the International STEM Talent One Pager, and we will vote on its release, and we will have an update on the SES Working Group's progress over the last couple of months. Um, on the topic of indicators, always a popular one for this committee, uh, it's been a very busy past few months. I could say it's been a very busy past two years. Um, but in the past few months, it's been around all about the rollout of 2022 indicators and the summary report in particular. Since we last met in February, we have briefed the National Institute of Standards and Technology and the Department of Energy. We also presented an indicators-themed webinar with the National Academy's Government University Industry Research Roundtable. And there I had the pleasure of being joined by former NSF director and former board member, Franz Cordova. Um, and um, also in terms of briefing on the summary report, I had the opportunity to do a briefing for the Space Week at the National Academies. Uh, it was an evening plenary session, uh, very well attended, as well as a smaller uh, briefing for the D um, Division of Engineering and Physical Sciences uh, Committee. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the board and NCSES co-hosted an informational webinar, webinar on the state indicators to spotlight the availability of tools and resources around state level data. Uh, yet another uh, indication of the value of webinars and other virtual uh, media for reaching a much broader audience than we historically have done. Um, SEP Vice Chair Maureen Kondik served as panelist for that webinar, and it attracted over 200 attendees from around the country. Many were at the local and state level, so audiences we do not typically reach or have not typically reached in the past, but I think we're identifying some really good um, best practices. While our rollout activities continue to be limited to the virtual realm, we are delighted to see a high level interest in indicators and continuing interest in indicators. And we plan to add virtual briefings to our rollouts in future cycles. And that's just going to be part of the way we do um, business going forward, independent of the external environment. So words I never thought I would read, wrapping up the 2022 indicators cycle. The SEP committee and the board, we have been very busy reviewing and releasing the remaining thematic reports. 
Since the February board meeting, we, uh, we have released both invention, knowledge transfer, and innovation, and the production and trade of knowledge and technology industri uh, intensive industries thematic reports um, to the public. And in March, the board voted to approve both the research and development U.S. trends and international comparisons, as well as the science and technology public perceptions, awareness, and information sources reports. Uh, and those were both recently re released to the public. I think one was ye just yesterday. These reports are particularly timely because they highlight the um, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on federal R&D funding and on Americans' confidence in, and scientists, respectively. And so I do encourage you to share these reports and their findings widely with your networks. So with that, I am delighted to share that as of yesterday, the 2022 Indicators public publication cycle has officially come to an end. I will say that the 2024 indicator cycle has also just begun, although we haven't <laughs> seen it yet. Um, as I've said before, this has been a Herculean effort, and I really have to acknowledge and thank uh, members of the team throughout NSF and the board who have joined the committee in leadership of this um, really phenomenal endeavor and very valuable endeavor. These include the program director for indicators in NCSES, Amy Burke, um, Melda Rivers, who is the NCSES director. Um, of course, our um, amazing board chair, Ellen Ochoa, and our and, um, the NSF director, um, Ponch. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to NCSES and our NCSES authors, external reviewers who came from all over within the government and externally, the Committee on External Engagement for their assistance, assistance with media engagement activities, which were extensive, board members and the SEP and NSBO staff for their tremendous work in getting us across the finish line. Truly, it is a, a team effort and it's an amazing team. It's just been phenomenal to be able to work with them for the last four years. The complex task of producing this suite of reports was made even more difficult, of course, by the pandemic but the dedication of all of you under challenging circumstances, your forbearance with the um, incessant emails on some occasions and hounding you to get your reviews and your approvals in, all of that was vital to our success and thank you all for your efforts. Uh, it's, I think that this is a set of products in wh which the board and the rest of the team can be extremely proud. The SEP committee has already begun discussions around the lessons that we learned from the 2022 cycle and identifying opportunities for even further improvements as we prepare for the 2024 uh, cycle in just a few short months. As I said, folks in NCSES are already starting to work on that, um, on that cycle. In the meantime, are there any comments from the committee or board members on this topic? Besides, hallelujah. <laughs> uh, how about congratulations on it? Oh, uh, well, for everybody. Okay, so that's indicators. Moving on to the other things that roll out of uh, this committee, and there have been a lot over the last two years. I'm turning now only to the most immediate ones. Um, first is a policy paper directly informed by the most recent indicators data on the subject of international students and workers. Uh, there's a one pager in your board books and, um, and that is the product of an SEP policy team on economic impact of these individuals composed of Suresh Garamella and myself. Uh, we've been working off and on in between thematic reports and other things um, to consider the critical rule, role of international students and workers uh, that they play in the U.S. STEM enterprise. As the board said in Vision 2030, foreign-born individuals are significant contributors to U.S. s &E, actually indispensable contributors to U.S. s &E, and developing STEM talent for America includes remaining a beacon for international STEM talent, which is getting more challenging for various reasons. The one-pager on international STEM talent for your consideration has been approved by the SEP committee, and it is in tab 7.2.4 7 in your board book. First, a major entry point for STEM talent is at risk. International enrollment at the undergraduate and graduate levels has dropped 
You see that in indicators. Uh, the most pronounced decrease in the data in indicators is, was in 2020, likely due in large part to the COVID pandemic. However, the enrollment has actually been declining since 2016, so it's not just the pandemic. These data are a leading indicator of an erosion of America's ability to attract talent, and that's talent we desperately need at this point. Given the high stay rates for students, as well as, entry, as serving as entry points for workers, it's not surprising that the proportion of U.S. s and workforce that is foreign-born is substantial and has continued to increase in recent decades, making up 45% of the U.S. s and workforce and a majority of those in computer science, math, and engineering fields. So international students and workers are crucial for science and engineering overall and the economic well-being of this country. But when we think about those key industries of the future and the underlying critical and emerging technologies identified by others, including PCAST and OSTP, what role do international students and workers play there? In fact, they play an even larger role than in s and &E writ large. International students disproportionately earn doctoral degrees in fields underlying critical and emerging technologies. It's gratifying to see Dario shaking his head. I think I'm on the right track when I see that. These include engineering, computer science, and mathematics. The U.S. currently awards more doctoral degrees in these fields to temporary visa holders than to citizens and permanent residents thanks to both the excellence of U.S.-based doctoral programs and the lack of sufficient U.S. students to fill the slots available in these programs. So we're dealing both with a shortfall in domestic talent as well as um, a need to continue to attract the international talent um, indefinitely into the future. When we look at the workforce, naturalized citizens and non-citizens make up a large fraction of the knowledge and technology intensive industries using and developing critical and emerging technologies in the academic sector over half of full-time faculty in engineering and computer and information sciences are foreign born it's clear that international talent is an essential component of the u.s science and engineering so this policy one pager recommends two actions first that the U.S. must place renewed emphasis on characteristics that have made our s and &E engine so powerful in the first place if we are, continue, con, are to continue to have an attractive environment for both international and domestic talent, and particularly in this context if we are going to continue to be a beacon for international talent to come to this country. Second, we must reduce deterrence to studying or working in the U.S. for those who want to do so. An obvious place to start on that is an expanded and streamlined visa system. Are there any comments on this one pager or what I've just said um, before we proceed to a vote? I don't see anything. Okay, do you wanna call for? Uh, uh, can I yeah. ask you, can I have a question Bye. please? Go ahead, Roger. Um, has the response that you've had so far been at any way uh, contrary to the recommendations? I, not that I mean, not that it influenced me, but I'm I'm curious about who has seen this and and whether or not we've pushed back from certain sectors of of the U.S. I've heard no pushback. Um, we d um, without getting into much detail, we um, a small group of us did um, meet with a um, congressperson. Um, and this was not the topic of the conversation, but it came up at the end from that person's uh, level of interest in this. And so there is actually a pull for it. That's great. Thanks. The Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy has referred one item for a board vote. The vote is for your approval for the publication of the policy paper entitled International STEM talent for a robust U.S. economy. Do I hear a motion to approve for publication the policy paper? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say aye. Resign. <laughs> All right, thank you. The motion passes and the International STEM Talent for Robust U.S. Economy is approved 
for publication. Thank you so much. And thank you very much to the board office staff for helping whip this into shape um, in, in af after a long gestation period, pretty much record time. So thank you for that. Okay, finally, I would like to turn to the ways in which SEP has been grappling with financial barriers to participation in STEM. This theme has been a major one for the committee really throughout the, the two year, the last two year cycle, including the development of our Keystone policy document, the work done by our nurturing talent policy team to address financial barriers for post-secondary students in STEM, and a broader call to address issues related to socioeconomic status directly. During the February board meeting, we called for volunteers to help lead an exploratory effort to explore, to consider this topic further, since it was a topic that was, um, that hit a resonance with many board members um, as we were going through uh, the indicators and uh, keystone um, document approval process. Since then, the Socioeconomic Status Working Group, which is led by Maureen Kondik and Dan Reed, was formed. Suresh Babu, Artie Bienenstock, Steve Willard, and I are also members of the working group, and we've made substantial progress over the last few months. At this point, I'd like to turn to Dan and Maureen for an additional summary of kind of where you are and um, overview of where, where we are going. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to lead in with just a very brief summary. Um, we've we've actively considered what measure of socioeconomic status um, is most appropriate, um, and I think uh, in addition to to low income, other things can be barriers to success in STEM, including growing up in a household where neither parent went to college, or uh, growing up in a rural or otherwise disadvantaged neighborhood, um, marital status, numbers of children, other other elements that may not be strictly linked to income. So I think the most important thing for us is that we need to be able to have some measure of outcomes associated with whatever measure of socioeconomic status we adopt. So we have charged NCSES to to look into this and to help us know what is the best data, what is the what is uh, what are the measures upon which we have the best um, longitudinal data for success and outcome. Uh, we also really want to, we've really considered what aspect of the STEM enterprise should our group be focusing on, higher education, uh, both uh, graduate or and undergraduate or predominantly graduate education, since that's the area in which we as the board perhaps have the greatest influence. But the working group um, feels that we can have a particularly strong impact on graduate education, which is why we've, at least to a first pass, decided to focus there. Um, and yet we do see undergraduate uh, recruitment and persistence as, as a very big component of, of this uh, question. So we've uh, identified research needs, met with NCSCS uh, to, to discuss and other subject matter experts in order to figure out where we're standing uh, and how to holistically measure representation. Um, and we've begun brainstorming and outlining potential policy pieces that, that um, would be in line with N uh, the NSB's Vision 2030 uh, to address the notion of nurturing STEM talent across, across all socioeconomic categories. Dan, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, I'd like to echo thanks to the uh, NSB staff and uh, NCSES folks uh, because we flailed about a bit in the dark on quantitative data and thanks to them for uh, um, the process. Uh, and we did try to crisp some questions up. I want to echo something that Maureen said. If you think about our role and uh, as the board, you know, we have both an oversight responsibility, but as uh, our colleague Kelvin Drogemeyer is fond of reminding us, we also have an advisory and advocacy role. Uh, and we tried to frame the conversation in, in that context. Um, so there are, maybe to, to crisp that a bit, there are the things that the foundation itself could do. Uh, and that might speak to how we allocate funds or graduate fellowships as an example in the process for that. Uh, and then there are the things that the board might advocate uh, that the National Science and Engineering Enterprise itself writ large should do. Uh, and you heard Artie earlier talk about, you know, his advocacy for increasing Pell Grants uh, as a piece of that story. That is a potential instance of that broader uh, kind of, of advocacy notion. But 
Um, I think there's broad agreement across the committee, and if anyone disagrees with what I'm about to say, by all means, please speak up, that this is a real issue uh, and that we need to think thoughtfully about how best the foundation uh, responds to that. And so I don't know maybe the risk of while I have the floor prerogative, those of the rest of you on the on the working group, any any brief thoughts you'd like to offer on this topic and I'll stop stop talking and then we'll hand the floor back. Well, thank you very much, Dan and Maureen. Um, really appreciate your being willing to step up and lead this working group. Um, I'm delighted with the progress that has been made, um, which you've summarized very nicely. Um, and it's going to be very exciting to see where the group goes from here. And I look forward to seeing something that we can put in front of the committee soon and the board, hopefully not too much after that. So um, I'd like to open the floor for discussion, um, particularly those on the working group, group but anybody else who um, has comments on this. Julia, we can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, one thing that's been particularly rewarding about um, this committee, this cycle, is the number of policy issues that have come up that we have actually managed to tackle and do something about. And so this is continuing, continuing that step. And one of the other things to comment about is that some of these topics are much bigger than a single one pager. And so it's likely there will be a sequence of things that we could see coming out. I'd also like to, for the, on the behalf of this committee, claim partial credit for giving birth to ESKI, which we'll be hearing about in a few minutes, which has spun out into its own group, but that's the effort on the K-12 education, which also sprang directly from the indicators data. Briefly, Steve? Uh, yeah. briefly I think um, also we should assure the board um, we've approached this from a data-driven um, approach, which is typical of our work, yes. but a lot of our initial work has been working with experts to try to develop some of that data because it will drive the output that we provide to this board. That, uh, thank you for emphasizing that. I think that's one of the things that really differentiates board products from so many of the other products you see in this town is that they're, they have a wealth of data and, and gold standard data that is underneath them. So thank you all for a productive uh, discussion. Uh, before I close, um, I really need to acknowledge first the NSBO office staff who has been phenomenal in supporting this committee through everything. I've already talked in general terms about the support from NCSES, which is equally phenomenal, but I don't have all the report author names, so I can't go through that list. But um, so of the lead in the um, board office for most of this time has been Reba Bandabadai, um, who is now on assignment to OSTP. So we miss her terribly. However, Amanda Ver uh, Vernon is filling, is, has backfilled without missing a beat, which is why we have the international worker uh, one pager um, that is that you voted on today. And also two wonderful AAAS fellows, um, Daniel Elkert and Portia Flowers. So many thanks to them and the committee. This is a large committee, but then there's a lot of work. Um, Maureen Kondik has been the vice, pre vice chair. And then we have both Suresh's, Suresh Babu and Suresh Garamella, Artie Bienenstock, Aaron Dominguez, Kent Fox, Mel Huff, Steve Leith, Emilia Moran and Scott Stanley. So a great committee. It's been a pleasure to work with you all and thank you for all of your work over the last couple of years. That concludes my report, sir. Thank you, Julia, for a wonderful report and all of the work that has been done by you and your committee. Vic, may I just add a word of appreciation for Julia. She has been the chair of this committee for two cycles, an outstanding leader, um, phenomenal amount of effort, work, vision. She has seen the, the indicators roll to a completely new format that I think is so much more effective and has, has just been a relentless advocate for high quality data, clear presentation, uh, 
open communication to our constituents, and really, we could not have asked for a better leader on this committee. Thank you so much, Julia. <laughs> But if I didn't make the case before, it takes a village. <laughs> All right. Our last report of the day will come from Matt Malkin. He is, he is leading, <laughs> last but not least, he is leading the NSB's Explorations in STEM K-12 Education, or now the new name is ESKI, working group, which was established in December 2021. I'll turn it over to you, Matt, to bring us up to speed on the group's activities. Thank you, Victor. I, all right, probably too much levity over here. It, it's it's this and then drinks. Is that the schedule? Uh, all right. So you you heard the uh, acronym. We have the best acronyms here. Explorations in K twelve STEM education. The members of the working group are Suresh Babu, Bell Huff, Julia Phillips, Scott Stanley, and Steve Willard. And I thank them for their work and the passion that they bring to our meetings and listening sessions. Uh, ESKI emerged from the board's October 2021 retreat, which determined that the K-12 STEM education deserved focused attention. This was motivated by the NSB's publication, uh, quote, <laughs> it's called, the U.S. must improve K-12 STEM education for all earlier that year. And here's a direct quote from that very important report. Quote, to be a global s and &E powerhouse, the U.S. must do more to educate our domestic talent in STEM, including the missing millions. We need all hands on deck to modernize K-12 STEM education and to hold itself accountable with reliable, up-to-date data. The board's interest in K-12 STEM education didn't actually start last year. We've been learning about several initiatives over previous years uh, in, in this area. It's very interesting. When we started in January, we adopted a, a broad mission statement, which is shown on a slide. I didn't really have time to do this. Actually, you can find the mission statement under the ESKI tab in the diligent board. But I'll just call your attention to one phrase in there, which I think is very important. Quote, evaluate the levers that NSB has to make an impact. As you know, the K-12 STEM educational system is enormous and highly decentralized, and it falls short of where our nation needs to be in order to remain a global science and engineering leader. We've agreed as a board that in order to build and strengthen an S&E enterprise in which all Americans can participate, we must engage in this space. The question for the board, though, is who can make a difference at speed and scale, and how can we help? As I discussed at our February board meeting, ESKI started listening sessions with stakeholders, and we've continued them throughout the spring. I'm gonna mention some topics that we're working on, but we're trying to narrow down the list so that we can at least do a good job on some of these topics. Uh, many of the ESKI members are particularly interested in learning about initiatives, even if they might be outside the box, outside of the mainstream, but which have produced demonstrated measurable successes. We are also believe that uh, equity, the uh, principle of equity requires that students at all levels and backgrounds get the opportunity to advance at whatever level they're ready for as soon as they can. Uh, all right, so the, the first application here, many of us uh, teach our subjects at uh, college level and we see firsthand the preparation or lack thereof of recent high school graduates. But uh, these problems did not start in high school. The, the nation starts assessing STEM progress in the fourth grade where we're already lagging and the gaps widen substantially from there on. So we're also interested in what happens before high school, and I'll give you two arguments. Uh, one, if we ignore deficiencies in STEM education in junior high and even elementary schools, by the time we look at high school and college, we may have already fallen far enough behind that it may be very hard for many students to catch up. Second reason, as a practical matter, there are many policy players in STEM education at the high school level. Thus, it, there may be more room for NSB to have a larger, more original impact on what's happening before high school and even in elementary school. 
Right, so that that's some of our thoughts. Uh, on another related topic, uh, I think we're going to really get a very rapid start, uh, an early start on some of the most timely issues, in particular, the acute STEM teacher shortage. This is high profile. This is an urgent part uh, of our work. It's a common recurring theme we've been hearing about. And this is not only the inadequate supply, total supply of STEM teachers, but it's also their distribution around the country and the over-reliance on substitute teachers. Uh, many of the teachers may not have the STEM expertise they need to adequately teach the STEM subjects that, that they're supposed to teach. Uh, there were already problems before the pandemic, and now we're really reaching a crisis level. So. Uh, to take one example, uh, that we're going to look at a, more closely at the current certification processes um, and exploring how institutions such as community colleges might play a larger role in teacher education. Um, perhaps a two-year associate degree in a STEM field might be preparation for STEM teachers at elementary school? Question mark. Uh, also, could there be new pathways for potential teachers who already worked in STEM jobs and industry for years? Question mark. I'm sort of following those slides a little bit, but not, not perfectly. Uh, so um, all right, finally, another point, which I think is the, the third one there. Um, we're not just interested in lessons learned, but also in translating research to get it into the hands of teachers and schools. Uh, we appreciate the large amount of STEM pedagogical research that the EHR, soon to be EDU directorate at NSF funds, in addition to that funded by other agencies and organizations. We've heard that knowledge and ideas on how to improve STEM education are available, but there's a seeming disconnect between that body of research and teachers in the classroom. How can we do better? Uh, it's clear that no one size fits all. Uh, so we hope NSB may offer some recommendations that states, school boards can look at if, if they're interested, if we can get them interested. One challenge we have is getting better data for the entire educational process, starting in elementary school. What we have is a periodic snapshots of different students at different levels. But in general, a few exceptions, we lack a lot of longitudinal data where we can follow the same students from elementary school all the way through, uh, say, graduating from college. Question, could we consider collecting confidential and voluntary, what you might call education records on students, as, as has been done uh, for health records, uh, for example, when it's clear it's just for research purposes only. All right, that's a question mark there. Anyway, to drill down into these and, and additional areas, uh, ESKI is having a two full day uh, listening session slash retreat on June 1st and 2nd. Um, the agenda is still being nailed down, but we expect to meet with stakeholders inside and outside the government. Uh, for example, hmm, uh, national statistics organizations. Uh, we've got uh, former NSB member Peggy Carr at NCS, uh, the National Science Teachers Association, um, experts on the next gen STEM standards, and of course, K-12 experts at the Department of Education, among others. Uh, we're also gonna take advantage of this solid two days to engage with each other we need to discuss uh, our thoughts to get them organized so we can have some findings to present to the full board at the September retreat. Uh, we're also planning meetings with teachers and education leaders, not just limited to public schools. We also hope to interact with representatives of the NEA and AFT teachers unions uh, so we could try to work together with them as well. So that's it. I want again to ask board members, every everybody here, uh, for your inputs. Uh, if you have contacts uh, you think might add value to the ESKI explorations, please uh, send their information to me and our NSBO uh, ESKI staff lead, Faith Hickson. So I didn't give you much warning here, but I'd like to open it up for questions, comments, uh, what board members might think about what ESKI is doing or, sh or should be doing, what you'd like it to see happen. All right, good. Okay. Let's open this up. But I have a question. Yeah. Matt, let me put my mic on. Yeah, please. Is, um, I like the idea of longitudinal studies. 
that may take a lot of time to get up it's and going. Easy. But have you ever talked about retrospective studies? There are a number of individuals, you yeah. have some of them who were here today who are award winners, but others we can go who have been very successful in STEM careers who come from different backgrounds. There have been some studies here and there where people have done this and they say, okay, this is what got she or mm, he interested in STEM and going for it. And I think I love it. while longitudinal studies can give you a tighter data set, it's much hard to grab. But these retrospective studies, particularly where we start talking about both the international students and then domestic students coming in, uh, particularly students who may come from adverse situations but have succeeded and yeah. done well. How does that work? How does the role of mentors and sponsors play a role? How does the role of after-school programs shape yeah. that? Um, we had talked last night informally. Maybe we might want to put a panel together where you have somebody like from charter yeah. schools, from archdiocesan schools, from other types of different school systems to talk about what their approaches have been and to bring in their students, okay? And that's not to endorse any charter of Republic or archdiocesan type schools or private, but there are some lessons and some data that you can pull from there, okay? And with access to NCSES, as well as the overhaul that's happening in the Department of Education, where how they're trying to reach greater segments of the population, you might be able to pull not only just some anecdotes, but some real data. I, I, I like that very much. We haven't talked about retrospective studies, but we could get on that right now. We don't have to wait 10 or 12 years to get some answers. You got, you got, you got 23 people here. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, we are, we are also very interested in, in all looking at the different school systems. That, that's very important as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, and this may be uh, directed to Punch, if you could comment. So earlier this week um, at a conference that uh, actually Punch alluded to that we organized, um, Jim Simons was uh, discussing the national scale up of a program he has started in New York City called Math for America. Mm. And the central idea on that second column, right, on teachers was to, to be able to increase the, uh, the quality an attraction to the teacher profession, and by providing supplemental funds uh, to uh, the best teachers. And I think in the case of New York City, the first pilot that I started like 20 years ago, uh, pick a thousand students, half of them were in mathematics, half of them were in science, and I think he added like $15,000 a year uh, yeah. of additional salary for four this years that was renewable, right, uh, based on performance. Since then, they scaled it uh, across New York State, and I understand that there's very active dialogue that it could be imminent to scale it nationally. And there's been, you know, broad support spoken by uh, Speaker Pelosi, you know, and Senator Schumer that it could be included as far as in the coming months. I can't remember the name of it. Is it Sci National Science Corps or? Um, it, yeah, it's, it's called the National Science Corps. So he had done the math for America in the city of New York mm -hmm. in underserved. Um, kind of play, uh, locations. And uh, the success was then expanded with the governor to the so entire state of uh, New York. But this is about Science Corps. Uh, Science Corps meaning all STEM teachers. The, uh, he's, he's thinking about it from 100,000 teachers all across the nation, mm -hmm. having the ability to have training as well as the supplements. Yeah. Whether it gets to that scale or not, we don't know. But there is a aspiration for that. But mm -hmm. some, at least some portion of that is what uh, they are talking about as uh, a starting point. So you're right. And so I was going to suggest that maybe, you know, it might be well worth definitely talking to Jim and Marilyn are phenomenal people. They are doing some amazing things with Simon's Foundation. Absolutely. So it might be definitely worth talking to them also. So that could be um, an opportunity. We could extend an invitation to them, perhaps yes. with the board, to tell us about that and ways in which, you right. know, the board could accelerate that. But this is back to the philosophy also in the context of, of partnerships, of scaling things where there is momentum and, uh, and there's an appetite to get something done. Emilio. Okay, yeah, yeah, Emilio. Okay, uh, you have uh, Emilio? This is good. Though. Yes, I think uh, it would be useful to this uh, effort to contact uh, the SBE directorate because the, that director has funded for years national representative samples of the population of the U.S., including uh, there's a family study that follows families through time. I think 
education will be part of the information they will have. And they will know who the experts would be that would be helpful in that. Uh, I think Bob Groves, who used to be uh, in this uh, NSB until recently, he's an expert. He was the director of the census and familiar with all these longitudinal surveys that are out there in the social sciences. And I think uh, we shouldn't go forward without already tapping into that very yeah. rich information that's there. Boy, these are good Roger. Well, at the risk of, of being so far out in left field here with, with that with this suggestion, but I'm, I'm just wondering if it, if we've in, in the context of looking at at uh, broader impacts and geography of innovation, uh, do we how do we how can we assess how can we learn from those states that are doing poorly and those states that are doing well because we have so much impact that comes from the local, including the state education board, boards of education. And I wonder if we can learn anything by, by having the heads of education from a well-performing state and one that's a poor performing state. Looking beyond just the implementation of the science side, but the policy sites which affect state and local education. I, I find that we have, we've had over the last eight years of my tenure here, a lot of discussions about the, about the research around something or, or learning about what, what works and doesn't work. But the roots are, are beyond the educators in many cases. I, I wonder if there's any way to learn from, from those who are, are, who are seen as less competitive, less able, and those that are very able um, in, in, in their states. I, I sit here in the, right now as a visitor in the state of New Mexico, which has one of the lowest performing states in education amongst the 50 states. And they've, they've just recently increased the salaries by I think 10 to $20,000 annually because they're, in the, they're, they're, they're the bottom layers. Will that work? And, and, and so what are the, what's the history of those that have not succeeded and those that have? Uh, okay, so it's an out in left field, and it's not what we're talking about as yeah, as data gathering. What we're talking about, but I mean, it's it's not anyway. Just something that that I keep thinking about and wondering if there's anything the board can do or NSF can do at that level to learn. That is such a great question, but Maureen. Do you want to shoot? Go now? No, I, I'm not going to address Roger's question because I don't know the answer. But um, well, it must be proximity it. to Julia. But I'm channeling. Um, her oft-repeated uh, urging that we we can have many, many ideas, but the intractability of this problem over a very long time really indicates that great ideas are not the same thing as data about what works. And so as tedious as it is to try to achieve actual data about, you know, do we see a correlation with, with people advancing into STEM degrees um, based on the year at which they first had advanced mathematics or calculus. Yes. You know, do we see a correlation with advancing into STEM degrees with um, teacher salaries? <laughs> or is that just a great idea that doesn't necessarily produce results? So we need to we need to think critically about how do we get actual data on what works and what doesn't work. Uh, if it is okay with you, Mr. Chair, I would like Karen Marangela, our CEO, who was the AD of EHR, who has extensive experience in this arena to at least reflect on a few things that was talked about here. What was the chair's prerogative? I would yes. welcome Dr. Yes. Marin Joe. Yes. Yeah, this is very appropriate. Thank you, Director Panchanathan. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, this has been a great discussion. Um, yeah, I think to reflect on a few things. Um, and, and I think that you've all been alluding to this. Uh, there's not going to be a one kind of one magic bullet in addressing these issues. So teacher pay is certainly one issue. The, um, the stress of the workload on teachers and the environment in which they're working right now is both because of the pandemic and just because of, of, of other events that are happening in, in K-12 schools have put additional pressure on the already shortage of teachers in our nation's schools. Um, so I, I really, I, I applaud you for, um, 
you know, really pointing out the data sets in the SBE directorate, some of which we have used during the pandemic to understand the impact of virtual learning on students and families from their perspectives. Um, so we have some really nice results from that. Um, and then really thinking through the, you know, the, the additional data that, um, that is likely out there through our partners at the Department of Education that can inform our work. I will point out that, um, you know, a persistent um, statistic has been that 20% of, of students, um, all students of, of different demographics who are entering the university declare a major in STEM disciplines. That is, that's not bad. Um, I've talked to you all before about we lose a lot of those students through, as they move through the undergraduate STEM um, process. Uh, so in thinking about, you know, do we want to increase that number, that 20%, is that something that, you know, that is important to the board? Is that something that's important to us? Um, how do we do that working in concert with um, our colleagues in K-12, thinking also about the co-curricular activities that happen around schools um, and in those transition points? And then I think we cannot stop thinking simultaneously about what do we do within our institutions to make sure that we're keeping all 20 percent of, um, of students who, who arrive at our doorstep saying, I, I want a STEM degree, keeping them um, involved. Um, so I'm, as Matt knows, um, I'm always um, happy to talk uh, with him and the committee um, about the work that NSF does. And I think as somebody here pointed out, we do, we fund the research, we fund, you know, we, we plant the seeds um, but we need partnerships with localities, whether those are local school districts, school boards, state departments. Um, and, and frankly, the state departments are quite sophisticated and they are aware of our work and they are very data driven. I've been quite impressed with my interactions um, with state departments of ed over the last several years. Um, but we need to partner with them to, um, to, to really get that, um, the results of those studies implemented on a more wide scale. Thank you, Dr. Marin Jow. Appreciate those comments. Are there any more questions? Dan. Well, it's not really a question, it's an observation. I completely agree that we need to be data-driven, but to achieve change, it has to be politically executable. And so the right answer that goes nowhere is just information and it's useful to know, but it doesn't actually affect the change we want. So we got to look at the intersection of those two things. What are our uh, data-driven actions, but things that actually we can find a way to ensure they actually happen. Because otherwise we're, we're falling into the traditional academic fallacy of talking to ourselves. All right. With that comment, I want to say thank you, Matt, and thank you everybody. Um, we look forward to future updates from the ESCI uh, group at future meetings. Um, now I'm going to bang the gavel and that's going to be the end of day one, but I'm going to ask you to stay after I do that because we have another announcement to make. So this brings us to the end of day one and I want to thank everyone who's helped make day one go smoothly. I want to thank our IT people, our staff, our NSF colleagues. Tomorrow, NSFB will reconvene an open session here in this room at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. That ends day one.